Good morning, everyone. Let me uh, ask that the chamber is please quiet itself. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we are ready to begin our Tuesday morning, 9.30 a.m. meeting. And we begin with item number one, which is the roll call so that the clerk can establish the presence of a quorum. Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Supervisor Ellenberg. Here. Supervisor Wasserman. Here. Supervisor Cortese. Here. Vice President Chavez. Here. And President Simidian. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, that takes us to item number two, which is the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, today we'll be led in the pledge by Supervisor Susan Ellenberg. We'll ask all who can to please rise and join us in the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Thank you, colleagues. That takes us to uh, item number three, which is to announce adjournments in memory. And for those of you who are perhaps first time visitors to our chambers, this is the time in our agenda when we memorialize those who have passed. And uh, it's my particularly sad duty today to ask that we adjourn in honor and memory of both Scott Chan and Kendra Chan. And for those of you to whom the names are unfamiliar, I will simply indicate that it's hard to imagine anything more wholesome or smile-making than a father and a daughter going off to spend a weekend diving together. And it's hard to imagine anything more tragic than learning that in an instant their lives are gone. Scott and Kendra are the husband and daughter respectfully, res respectively of our county planning commissioner, Vicki Moore. And they are just that wholesome father and daughter who went off to spend a weekend together on a dive expedition and who were among 34 who lost their lives. So we honor their memory today by adjourning in honor and memory of Scott and Kendra Chan with recognition and sympathy for all who lost their lives in that same tragedy. We send our condolences and our sympathies and our best wishes to Vicki Moore. And colleagues, I thank you for the opportunity to adjourn in their memory today. Ms. Elmberg, I turn to you for the next adjourn in memory. Thank you, President Smidian. Today I'd like to adjourn our memory, our meeting in memory of Charles D. Seaver. I didn't know Charles personally, but I do know from his son and my chief of staff, Derek Seaver that he was a man who dedicated most of his life to service, touching the lives of many young people during their formative years. He was an educator, a highly engaged high school football coach, and a beloved member of his community. The impact of his service and passion was palpable during the day of, the cele of his celebration of life when thousands of people came out to pay their respects. Charles Chuck D. Seaver of Minster, Ohio, passed away peacefully on Thursday, August 15th, 2019, at his home in Winchester, Virginia. He was 72 years old. Chuck was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, to the late Warren T. and Helen Smith Seaver. He attended Taylor High School in North Bend, Ohio, and Moorhead State University in Moorhead, Kentucky. He's survived by his wife of 39 years, Kim Winner, whom he married in Minster, Ohio, on December 20th, 1980, as well as his daughter, Carrie A. and Steve Papiernik, sons, Derek C. Seaver and Michaela Hardesty, and Jared T. Seaver, grandchildren, Charlie Seaver, Bernaria Faulkner, Lila Papiernik, Ava Papiernik, sisters, Karen Dietrich, Karen Dietrich, Lynn and Tom Volkel, Deb and Terry Henschel, in-laws, Bud and Ann Winner, sisters-in-law Lisa and Dan Elson, Julie and Heath Hegemon. Chuck was a member of St. Augustine Catholic Church in Minster, Ohio. He loved teaching, but his greatest passion was coaching high school football and mentoring young players. He enjoyed having coffee with friends and never met a stranger. He was a Cincinnati Bengals fan who loved spending time with his family, his extended football family, and his dogs. Chuck especially loved spending time with his grandchildren. His friends describe him as larger than life, always with a smile and a positive word for everyone he met. 
and although Chuck never set foot in Santa Clara County, his service, passion, and impact live on right here with his son, Derek. Derek, I am so sorry for your loss and hope that your dad's memory will always be for a blessing. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, and again, our condolences and our sympathy, and we will adjourn in honor and memory of Chuck D. Seaver. Colleagues, that takes us to item number five, which is public comment. Public comment is that portion of our agenda set aside for comment by members of the public on non-agendized items that are properly within the jurisdiction of our board. And let me note for the record, we have apparently 16 requests to speak. If you would like to speak under public comment, there are our yellow cards at the back of the chambers. I'm gonna call folks up and ask you to line up if you can, please. Uh, so that we move right along. Uh, pursuant to the rules of our board as contained in our published agenda, when we have 15 or more people, we limit comments to one minute. So we're gonna ask you to be as crisp as you can this morning, please, thank you. Uh, and let me ask uh, that folks come up in this order if they can. Zeb Feldman, followed by me, Dwen, followed by Michael Cabano, followed by David Sullivan, followed by Jesse Castaneda, followed by Christina, I believe it's Egan, followed by Francis Chung, followed by Liberty de Guzman, and then Pamela Hamilton. And there are more, but if we can get those folks to step right up, and Mr. Feldman, I see you stepped right up, so welcome, thank you, good morning. Good morning, Zeb Feldman with SEMA. Uh, SEMA has worked well with the county in a productive, professional way, a relationship we hoped would yield a quick, square contract. Our chief priorities are pension parity, compaction, and a real increase in pay upon promotion. Behind me, you'll see SEMA members holding signs detailing the enormous pension contributions made during our contract, contributions that have not been shared. You will hear brief experiences of promotions taken only to lose take-home pay. You'll also hear how SEMA helped during the recent tragedy in Gilroy and how we've delivered critical services to families and children during a recent sick out. We're truly putting the community first. Labor relations is not adequately addressing our issues at the table, offering a small reduction in pension contribution in place of a salary increase. Please reduce our pension obligation to 8% and offer a salary increase in year one. SEMA cannot afford to replace contractual guarantees with future promises. Reward SEMA's service to the county and community through concrete contract language. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next speaker is Mi Dwen. Welcome. Good morning, County Supervisors and Dr. Smith. My name is Mayuin Touch. I have worked for the county for almost 19 years, and I'm proud to serve here. I support applications for a number of departments, including public safety and justice community. When ITCC placed me into a SEMA position, paying 3% more than my SEIU position, I lost nearly $400 each pay period for my take-home pay. This is a loss of $800 each month or nearly $10,000 each year. The county did not provide a promotion. Instead, they created a big financial shortage for me and my family. This loss in pay negatively impacted my son's education and extracurricular activities since I could not afford to cut the caregiving costs for my 90 years old parents. In mid-August, I had to leave my permanent position for a provisional position as a small increase in pay would help. Please direct the county to accept reasonable proposals from SEMA. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker, please, come on up. Uh, Michael Cabano is not here, um, so I am the next speaker, I believe, David Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Okay. Uh, Dr. Smith, members of the board, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm here just to mention the fact that SEMA members are first responders. Um, there's some folks in the back of the room wearing uniforms. Um, there's actually 12 people in my office that wear uniforms and are first responders, and at least nine of us are SEMA members. Um, on the day of the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting, we were at home with our families. Um, one of our SEMA members responded to the scene. We had another one respond to the EOC in the city of Gilroy. We also had another one respond to county communications. Okay, we were an integral part in the system. We are SEMA members, and we just want to remind uh, the board and everyone in the room um, of what we do. Um, finally, I would just like to push for pension parity. Uh, there are people in my office uh, that only pay 4% toward their pension, whereas I have to pay 16%. Thank you. Thank you. And let me ask our next speaker to come on up. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to um, 
everyone. My name is Jesse Castaneda. I'm a SEMA executive board member, and I work at Valley Medical Center's emergency room. I happen to be at work on the day uh, the garlic shoot, the garlic festival uh, shooting happened. I started my day about noon. I, I went on my own time to work on emails, time cards, and I was going to lunch about five. My wife called me, are you coming home for, lunch, for dinner? And I said, well, not really. I'm going to get something and finish work, and then I'll, I'll be home by about seven or eight. Um, as I was leaving, I got a call um, that there was all these emergency response, so I rushed back to work, you know, didn't get uh, dinner, and I was there till 1.30, you know, helping my staff, calling staff in, uh, and um, it, it was, everything seemed to move very smoothly because that's what we trained for. And uh, it's, when I was asked to speak about this, I kind of didn't want to because I didn't want to relieve the, the memories and stuff, but SEMA is a very important part of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask our next speaker to come on up. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Frances Chong. I am a SEMA member. I've been with the county for 13 years as an HIM assistant director at VMC. SEMA is asking for your support in pushing for a reclassification process and deadlines that guarantee a reasonable turnaround time that is similar to the other unions. My class study was submitted to HR three years ago and still has not have a projected date of completion despite the universal support of a, the department leadership, executive leadership, as well as the union. HIM, Health Information Management, is an evolving field and my class sorely needs an update to reflect even the basic work that we do in the department. As a reasonable turnaround time in these processes will benefit both the county and its employees. We're asking for your support to get a process that works for SEMA and for the county. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Could I ask our next speaker to come on up, please? Good morning, my name is Liberty de Guzman and I've been with the county for 14 years. I was recently promoted from a quarter two to a supervisor in health information management services at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Since my promotion, I experienced a $350 loss in base pay per pay period. Um, on top of that, I'm now salaried, which makes me ineligible for any overtime opportunities. Um, given that um, one salary and uh, given the cost of living, I am unable to remain in this position if the contract remains the same. I'm, I've informed my director that I will have to step down if uh, we don't have a better situation. Um, I'm asking here um, in front of you to provide us with a better contract, reduce our contribution, and maybe increase in pay, and, um, and to make sure that those who want to make a difference are not financially punished. Thank you. Thank you again. Next speaker, come on up. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Christina Egan, and I work for the health and hospital system for the county, and I have for five years. Many of us love our jobs. We want to stay within the county, and we want to be here. We want to be in this area to live and work. The challenge is our salaries and, our, and the pension. Many of us were shocked July 1st, thinking that we would be getting increased in pay, at least cost of living increase, and that our pension would not be affected. It was a shock to see that not only did our pay go down, but more money was taken out of our pay and put into our pensions. So unfortunately, I've lost $90. I'm getting paid $90 less now than I was July 1st, and that was a shock. It affects my, how I'm paying and working on my bills to pay rent, how I'm paying for my daughter's school, and like many of us, we really want to be here. So please, when you're thinking about the SEMA contract, think about us and how we want to stay here. We want to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, come on up, please. And as you come up, let me also call up uh, Mary Beth Rogers, Teresa Perez, Dolores Morales, Evan Dowling, Kately Hain, Scott Largent, and Mr. Trout. Welcome again. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Pamela Hamilton, and I'm a supervisor for the Registrar of Voters Office. We protect and ensure the community's right to participate in fair, inclusive, accurate, and transparent elections in the county of Santa Clara. I promoted from line staff and lost $2,000 per month in, in pay due to higher pensions and lost overtime. However, despite this, we all continue to do the hours that we do from 6 a.m. to 1 a.m. for every election cycle. 
It says, uh, without a significant reduction in our pension, the county will, is going to continue to, to it discourage employees like myself from promoting and better serving our county of Santa Clara. As a member of SEMA, I'm asking for you to support our contract negotiations to see this reduction along with a salary increase each year of our contract. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let me ask our next speaker to come on up. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Mary Beth Rogers. I'm a management analyst with DFCS. I've been with the county for over 30 years. Last week, with very little notice, DFCS was hit with a work action. With input, foresight, and judgment, only experience and professionalism provides, SEMA worked, members worked with administration to develop a list of critical needs that would ensure child safety in Santa Clara County. On the fly, SEMA members developed a system to collect information on the expertise of the available staff. All throughout the day, SEMA members discussed possible improvements to how we were working through this crisis. We believe we are much more prepared to handle the next work action should there be one. No critical needs were unmet. This is a testament to SEMA members' level of expertise, professionalism, and willingness to be flexible in a crisis. We believe that this one instance exemplifies the daily work ethic and high standards of SEMA members and justifies the contract proposals SEMA has put forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Teresa Perez. I'm a county worker and a SEMA member. I'm here today to talk about our pension contribution. I've worked with the county for 16 years, 10 years as an LGBT worker three. I promoted to an office management coordinator last September 2018. It technically was a promotion to management, but it was completely a financial setback. When I bought our family's home in Gilroy, where I worked, my goal was to promote to a leadership role to offset the rising costs of property taxes and start to secure my children's college fund. Now as a manager, I'm struggling to maintain my mortgage, property taxes, and have yet to put a dime in a college fund. After resolving the EW reclass as a negotiator, I enjoyed two pay periods of an 8% wage increase, then promoted. I gained the responsibility of 18 CSTs at three locations and one of the largest center road offices, but my $12,000 promotion was completely absorbed into my pension contribution. I am 100% a living example of why many are turning away from promoting. I've come to these chambers advocating for a reclass, continuing VTA services to the Gilroy Social Services offices, and now I'm here for and me and my family asking you to reduce our pension obligation and offer a pay raise. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Next speaker, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dolores Morales. I'm proud to serve as a SEMA president. I've been a SEMA member for 24 years. Our members have been advocates for the most vulnerable communities and have been integral to the fabric of this county. The importance of this contract and addressing the issues you, you heard today have motivated our workforce to take action. We are here today to express the issues that have a significant impact on our lives, our families, and the life decisions we make. Pension contribution, loss of pay when promoted, county processes that impact hiring, workload, and service to the public. We hope to resolve these issues at the bargaining table. We are the backbone of the county and proud public servants who deserve and demand a fair contract now. Please support us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Evan Dowling, SEMA member. Last evening, the labor movement scored a great victory when the executive board of the South Bay Labor Council voted unanimously to sanction a strike by SEIU 521 members. Excuse, excuse me. Against. I I'm going to, if folks are going to go ahead and exit, please oh, I, feel free I'd to. I'd rather just continue speaking. Okay, I apologize. Okay. Last evening, the labor movement scored a great victory when the executive board of the South Bay Labor Council voted unanimously to sanction a strike by SEIU 521 members against the County of Santa Clara. I, along with my wife, Maria Hernandez, proudly attended the SEIU 521 rally in the parking lot there. Many of us protested the shady practices of Jeff Smith, with some calling for his termination. In fact, Robert Brizuela grabbed my sign demanding that the Board of Supervisors fire Jeff Smith and carried it over 
Jeff Smith's head as he entered the headquarters of the South Bay Labor Council. But before Jeff Smith entered, he stopped and sneered at Maria's sign, which itemized abuses and wrongdoing under Jeff Smith's leadership. SEIU 521's proposed raises reflect workers' demand uh, for economic justice. All county unions ought to use their proposal as a template and in demanding respect and fair wages. We're going to invite our next speaker up, but if you'd like, why don't we wait just a moment or two so that folks can exit the chambers and we can hear you clearly. And that's okay. We can wait another moment or two. Thank you. Thank you. And folks, we're going to put out a last call for cards on public comment. I see some of you in the back. So if you have cards and would like to speak under public comment, let's ask that you get that done in the next minute or two so that we can just manage our agenda here. Thank you again. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Last February, I met with Senator Jim Bill to discuss how to hold enablers of childhood sexual abuse accountable for their repeated crimes. He said we didn't need any new laws, that presentation high school officials like Mern Stuckey and Mary Miller should be charged with conspiracy because they worked with others to cover up in multiple instances of sexual abuse. Not unlike officials at Michigan State, they knowingly endangered children for decades. A systemic failure to protect girls like 17-year-old me from sexual abuse. I want to believe justice is blind in this county, but it's getting harder when prominent Catholic leaders go unchecked, when sexual predators roam free. When I hear Mary Miller assured the board no one would ever face criminal charges. The police won't give me any straight answers. The DA's office won't return my phone calls. So I'm here again advocating for dozens of victims and begging for anyone to give a damn. Thank you. Is it Ms. Lehane? All right, Mr. Trout, I see you approaching. Come right up. Extra, extra here, all about it. The Epic Times. This is the best newspaper I have ever read in my life. Why isn't the Mercury News telling us about Michael Flynn? Why isn't the Mercury News telling us these important things that they're bringing up about the CPS and the fentanyl with China? I thank the Lord for Trump, and I pray he smashes Google. Zach Voorhees has come out and said Google's going to steal the election. I, Mark Trout, am a victim and a survivor of vote fraud. I know about vote fraud when I ran in, against uh, Don Rocha in 210. They stole my votes. But the Epic Times is a very excellent newspaper, and it gets into how the prosecution of Michael Flynn hid exculpatory evidence for eight months. So he's turning the tables, and his new lawyer is going to go against them because they have unlimited funds, all right? Now, 90, 95% success rate because they have unlimited funds. And if they can charge someone, they are very tempted to plead guilty when they're actually innocent. And our next speaker, Scott Largent, are you in the chambers? Mr. Largent, would you like to come on up? Ready, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, Mary Miller, that's been coming in here, uh, the gal, a couple of uh, speakers before me, I was able to chop up one of her videos and put it up on, on YouTube, and it's, I've been getting some interesting feedback about it. Um, sounds like she wants some community justice. Sounds like she wants an investigation. Uh, my interactions with San Jose Police Department is they cover a lot of stuff up, and when people come forward, what they do to silence them is they file civil lawsuits to shut them up. And I was able to find out that a lot of other people in my situation that were protesting, that they've been running them through civil court. And they're stacking these cases in front of different judges and different departments, um, so the right hand's not talking to the left hand. Fortunately enough, some of the uh, bailiffs were able to inform me what is going on. So it's kind of a show that San Jose is pulling. Uh, this woman needs some community justice. She needs an investigation. We all know what San Jose Police Department does, and they've been doing it for a long time. So, thank you. 
And let me, uh, colleagues, read through some cards that we've received. I'm not sure if folks have uh, left the chambers or perhaps never uh, made it, but I do have a card from Joseph Kwan and Donna Wallach and I believe it's Mila Krupa. If you're one of those three folks, come on up. Welcome. I'm Donna Wallach. I'm here to speak about um, Protect and Save Yurostak. It's a very sacred area for the Amamutsun people. They are a part of the Ohlone Nation. Um, Yurostak is a very, very sacred area to them. Unfortunately, um, because of the horrendous situation in this country, their land was illegally bought by the sergeant people, the sergeant family back in the 1800s. And in the, two th the early 2000s, or I can't remember what year, um, their land, uh, the sergeant farms went bankrupt. Uh, a debt agency bought it, and now that debt agency wants to sell this very sacred area to a mining quarry that's going to mine the sacred, sacred land and make it into gravel and sand. That is a horrendous thing to do. You guys, please step up and say no. This area will not be sold. It must be given back to the Amamutsun people so they have their sacred land. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Kwan. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Joseph, and I'm here to speak as a community member. Uh, I'm the son of an immigrant and a Bay Area native. Uh, nearly 30 years ago, when I was a little boy growing up in Cupertino, I would hear my father share his struggles with my brother and I, uh, fighting through traffic in his hour-long commute, working 60, 80-hour weeks. Now, I am a father of two with a six-year-old and a three-month-old. Uh, when I share my struggles with my daughter, I speak to her about driving two to three hours a day and working 60 to 80 hours a week. I wonder what my daughter's future and reality will be like 30 years from now. I urge the board to drastically increase funding for affordable housing, child care, and health care services provided by the county. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is uh, Mila Krupa with us? No. And... I believe I was uh, told earlier, but I want to double check that Michael Cabano is not here either. Okay. How about, I believe it's Victoria Aguilar. Please come forward. Welcome. Good morning, I'm Victoria Aguilar. I have been recently promoted as a SEMA member in April of 2019, and now I am working as a supervisor at the Department of Probation. I have been recently diagnosed with cancer. I am having my surgery on Monday, and I will be out of work for six to eight weeks. My income has dropped significantly because of being taxed by PERS, 16%. With my previous position as an SE, SEIU 521, I earned more with my take home and was able to save more and put more away in my deferred comp. Now with a pending medical leave, I have had to decrease my contribute to defer comp from 15 to 7.5 percent. I still do not take home what I made as a 521 member. It's an $800 monthly pay decrease, and I dip into my savings each and every pay period. SEMA members deserve a raise for all their daily work that we do. I am a single income provider trying to make an income and pay for my mortgage in this county. I, have, I am proud to call home. Thank you. Thank you. And we wish you well, Ms. Aguilar. I have a card, and I'm not sure. Have we heard from Kately Hain? Yeah. We did. Thank you. I wanted to make sure that we didn't overlook anyone. It's okay. Let me check with the clerk. Uh, do we have any other cards under public comment? We do not. Then I'll say thank you again to those who were here for public comment. And that takes us to our next item on the agenda, which is to approve the consent calendar and any changes to the Board of Supervisors agenda. And thank you. We do have a handful of cards, uh, colleagues who, uh, from folks who would like to speak on this issue, but uh, in order to let them know the status of the consent calendar and the proposed update, what I'm gonna do is ask the clerk to please read proposed changes to our consent calendar and our agenda then we'll go down the row and see if there are any additional changes requested from members of our board. Then we'll take public comment, and then we'll come down the row one last time just to make sure everybody's squared away on the calendar. Okay? 
Madam Clerk, can you walk us through the changes, which I believe the most recent version is on this goldenrod uh, document at the back of the chambers. Thank you. We have a request from County Council to continue item number seven to date uncertain. Item number seven is a hearing to consider adoption of resolution of necessity relating to acquisition of property located at 2300 Enborg Lane, San Jose, and necessary for the county's receiving assessment and intake center, property of Hearts and Minds Activity Center Incorporated. The hearing listed as item number 11 has been canceled. Item number 11 is the acquisition of real property for public park purpose as part of Coyote Creek Parkway Integrated Natural Resources Management Plan and Master Plan Assessor's Parcel Numbers 678-08-033-036-044-047-049 and-056 as part of an exchange with the City of San Jose. We have a request from Vice President Chavez to hold item number 12 to September 24th, 2019. Item number 12 is to approve referral to administration and or county council to report to the board with options for consideration relating to the fairgrounds and the fairgrounds management corporation. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to add item numbers 17 and 23 to the consent calendar. Item number 17 is to approve referral to County Council to oppose the proposed federal rule changes for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program categorical eligibility. Item number 23 is to receive report from the Office of the County Executive relating to an inventory and evaluation of parenting programs at Elmwood Correctional Complex, Main Jail Complex, and Reentry Resource Center, and contact visitation in the jails. We have a request from Supervisors Wasserman and Ellenberg to add item number 24 to the consent calendar. Item number 24 is to consider recommendations relating to agreement with First Five Santa Clara County relating to providing parenting education and support services. We have a request from Supervisor Wasserman to add item number 26 to the consent calendar. Item number 26 is to receive report from the Facilities and Fleet Department relating to the status of deferred maintenance projects. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to add item number 27 to the consent calendar. Item number 27 is to receive report from the Office of the County Executive and the Facilities and Fleet Department relating to the status of Elmwood Campus Service Model and Operational Planning Plan. We have a request from Supervisor Wasserman to add item numbers 28 and 31 to the consent calendar. Item number 28 is to consider recommendations relating to bids for construction of main jail and Elmwood Custody Health Services staff work area modifications. Item number 31 is to receive report from the Office of the County Executive relating to the assessment of county programs for family finding and reunification. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to add item number 32 to the, to the consent calendar. Item number 32 is to receive report from the Office of the County Executive relating to the implementation of the Community Awaiting Placement Supervision Service and the addition of programming elements. We have a request from Supervisors Wasserman and Ellenberg to add item numbers 33 and 34 to the consent calendar. Item number 33 is to receive report from Behavioral Health Services Department relating to the implementation of jail diversion programs and expansion of the capacity in the community to serve criminal justice clients with mental illness and co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. Item number 34 is to receive report from the Office of the Sheriff relating to in-custody terminology used to define inmate housing. We have a request from Supervisor Wasserman to add item numbers 35, 38, and 39 to the consent calendar. Item number 35 is to receive report from the Employee Services Agency related to organizational transformation efforts in collaboration with the Stanford Center for Leadership and Transformation. Item number 38 is to receive report from the Office of Supportive Housing relating to an expenditure strategy for extremely low income and very low income housing and revolving housing bond proceeds. Item number 39 is to receive report from the Office of Supportive Housing relating to partnership with the Santa Clara County Housing Authority and use of Section 8 project-based vouchers. We have a request from Vice President Chavez to hold item number 40 to date uncertain. Item number 40 is to receive report from the Office of the County Executive relating to countywide participation in the Government Alliance on Race and Equity and Development of Countywide Racial and Social Equity Strategy. We have a request from Supervisor Wasserman to add 
Item numbers 41, 43, and 44 to the consent calendar. Item number 41 is to consider recommendations relating to contracts for services with rape crisis center service providers. Item number 43 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 22 for 207 100,000, transferring funds from the General Fund Contingency Reserve to the Department of Planning and Development Budget relating to community restitution account expenditures for code enforcement costs. Item number 44 is the adoption of Executive Leadership Salary Ordinance number NS-20.19.02, amending Santa Clara County Executive Leadership Salary Ordinance number NS-20.19 relating to compensation of employees increasing the flat rate salary of the assessor, district attorney, and sheriff classifications by 3.09%. We have a request from administration to hold item number 45 to September 24th, 2019. Item number 45 is to approve a neutral position on Senate Bill 5. We have a request from administration to hold item number 46 to October 22nd, 2019. Item number 46 is to approve surveillance technology use policies for existing surveillance technologies that have been reviewed and approved by county council as to form and legality. We have a request from administration to hold item number 47 to October 8, 2019. Item number 47 is to approve surveillance technology use policies for existing surveillance technologies that have been reviewed and approved by county council as to form and legality. We have a request from Supervisor Cortezi to hold item number 49 to September 24, 2019. Item number 49 is the adoption of ordinance number NS-644, adding chapter three to division B19 of the County of Santa Clara Ordinance Code relating to the safe storage of firearms in unincorporated areas of the county. We have a request from administration to hold item number 50 to September 24, 2019. Item number 50 is to receive report from the finance agency relating to senior parcel tax exemption. We have a request from administration to hold item number 62 to date uncertain. Item number 62 is to approve retroactive revenue agreement with Part D advisors relating to reopening the county's past retiree drug subsidy filings to audit and appeal for additional subsidies from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in an amount not to exceed 1,524,754 for period September 1st, 2019 through August 30th, 2020, with two one-year extension options. We have a request from Vice President Chavez to hold item number 67 to September 24th, 2019. Item number 67 is to reject all proposals submitted in response to the fairgrounds request for proposals relating to real property located at the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds and terminate the request for proposals process. We have a request from Supervisor Wasserman to delete item number 75A. 75A is Supervisor Wasserman nominates an individual to be identified for appointment to the San Martin Planning Advisory Committee seat, uh, seat number five. We have a request from Supervisor Cortezi to hold item number 80 to September 24th, 2019. Item number 80 is to receive report from administration relating to high-speed rail and an analysis of the proposed fourth alternative for high-speed rail alignment in Santa Clara County for conformance with Board of Supervisors recommendations. We have a request from President Simidian to hold item numbers 86 and 87 to September 24th, 2019. Item number 86 is to approve license agreement with Elizabeth Bishop, an individual doing business as the mental health group of Alcoholics Anonymous relating to providing use of space at county-owned property located at 231 Grant Avenue, Palo Alto, in an amount not to exceed $6,000 for period September 10th, 2019 through September 9th, 2024. Item number 87 is to approve retroactive lease agreement with Stanford Healthcare relating to the rental of six parking stalls located at 231 Grant Avenue, Palo Alto, for an amount not to exceed $69,843,000 for period July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2024. And that concludes my list. I'm going to resist the temptation to say, could you do that one more time? All right. <laughs> Uh, colleagues, this is perhaps the longest list of uh, revisions I can recall in recent memory, uh, so I do want to be uh, slow, steady, and methodical about making sure we keep track of what's on, what's off. Uh, please take your time. Let me begin by asking if there are any uh, requested changes uh, or amendments from Supervisor Ellenberg, and then we'll work our way just down the aisle. 
Ms. Ellenberg? Uh, no changes, but I'd like to make comments on three of the items. Do you Please want to do. Wait for that? Briefly, right. of course. Thank you. I'm fine with um, items 26 and 28 being moved uh, to consent, but with regard to number 26, um, my concern is that there's no way to tell how long a project has been deferred, so I'd like to request an off-agenda report that details how long um, an item has been on the deferred maintenance list. And with regard to item uh, 28, um, I, I think it is appropriate to approve this contract, but I want to request a report back to the board on the overall picture of contract SWA increases and contract completion times. Um, I'm interested in this being shown to the board in total so that we can identify any uh, potential systemic problems or patterns of concern with respect to any particular contractors. And finally, with regard to item 68, which was already on consent, um, I just want to express support. Um, certainly, all children deserve to have access to art and cultural experiences near them. And our culture of inclusion is one that we should not only celebrate but encourage across all aspects of our communities. Murals, sculptures, and lighting experiences remind our youngest community members of the beauty in their neighborhoods and don't require a cost of admission. I'm really proud to work with my colleagues. Uh, I'm really proud of the work my colleagues have done in the past to ensure this partnership with SV Creates delivers on this access. And I'm particularly pleased to see that through the Arts Access Grant Program, our local institutions like the San Jose ICA are creating a space that not only welcomes but celebrates the LGBT youth in our communities. Thank you very much. Supervisor Cortez. Uh, yes, one clarification. Um, I just want to confirm 20, item 22 um, is still set to be heard as a discussion item. That would be the jail reform item, is that correct? Yep. Okay. I see heads nodding, so thank you. Um, as you said, President Samin, there's so much here, I just wanted to make sure something didn't get added that I wasn't aware of. On uh, item 45, which administration is asking us to hold, um, I'm gonna ask that uh, we actually discuss that item. Uh, that would have been a consent item I suppose, but in any case, I would like to discuss item 45. Thank you very much. Anything else, Supervisor? Uh, that's it for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. Um, through the chair to Tiffany, I asked that 35, item 35 be put on consent. I would like to change that to being held to a date uncertain. Number 35. Got it. That's. Are we, uh, we there on that one? That's item. Uh, ESA's report. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, item so that's, 35. That's one item. The L. other item, Mr. Chair, is item uh, number 72. I need to recuse myself on. Uh, it's on the consent calendar. I need to recuse myself because I have financial interests resulting from my ownership of stock in IBM. Thank you very much. Duly noted, and uh, we'll ask the record to reflect. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, and I apologize to my colleagues, I'm using a lot of sheets of paper to try to keep up with all of your work. Um, on item 23 and 24, these were items that were put on consent. Um, what I would like to ask for is that we get a quarterly report on the, um, the parenting classes. And in addition, I'd like to better understand um, what parenting classes are currently being um, being conducted by the rehab officers and whether or not the, that rehab officer work will be integrated into the first five work or be separate. And then, um, and I also just wanted to say on this one how excited I am that we're also gonna be including childcare and parenting classes at reentry. so thank you for that. On items 31, this is the family finding and reunification. I'd like to take that off of consent. And jail diversion, item 33, I'd also like to take that off consent. Those were items 31 and 33? Correct, as part of the jail um, reporting. And then, um, let me just look real quickly. And 
then I'd like to, um, I'm going to vote no on item 28, and this is the staff work area modifications. I have concerns about the underbid. The, the Super, Supervisor, forgive the interruption. I know both you and Supervisor Ellenberg have made reference to item 28. I'm going to ask that we take that item up on our okay. regular agenda in any event. So. Great. All right. Then item um, uh, 38, this is the loan repayment for continued um, uh, pool. I mean, the loan repayment for ELI and BLI housing, the staff strategy. And I just wanted to, um, I, I want to leave that on consent, but I want to just highlight that my understanding from us taking this action is that we would be focusing repayment monies on ELI housing. If that's different, someone should say so now, then we could talk about it. But if not, then I'm going to leave it on consent. If that is the understanding, I'm going to ask that it come off consent in a okay, moment so we'll have a chance to talk. So let's we can. just pull it then. And then um, on item 39, I, I do want to just highlight our uh, partnership with the Housing Authority. What I would like to ask staff to do is to create a, an annual mechanism as part of the reporting that you're already doing around our new housing projects to better um, know in advance what the project-based vouchers are that will be available and what um, resources the Housing Authority is spending in alignment with the work that you're doing. And part of the reason I, I'm asking this, colleagues, is only because I think that there's a lot of really good work being done, but it's split up. The way it gets reported is in so many chunks, it's hard to know what the Housing Authority partnership looks like. And it's, I, I think it's very, very good. I, I, I think it's moving in such a good direction that I want to be able to celebrate that. Then on items, 36 and 37. These are the two, um, the sales tax resolution and the sales tax ordinance. What I'd like to ask is that this be deleted. And the reason I'm requesting that is that when we took this vote um, a couple of weeks ago, we had three votes. It takes four votes to put this on the ballot in any case. I appreciate the staff work that's been done on it, but given that we've had our discussion, I would like to request that those be um, deleted from the agenda as part of our consent calendar. 36 and 37. And excuse the interruption, Supervisor. I just want to look to the County Council. Um, I don't think there's a special term of art. If somebody requests an item be deleted in the absence of any objection, the item is simply deleted, yes? That is correct. Thank you. And then on item, um, I think, let me just look really quick. I apologize, I want to make sure I don't drag us back later. I think those were all of my, my requests and changes. Thank you for my patience and my colleagues. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez and colleagues. Uh, I'm going to simply ask that items 28, and 38, 28 being the um, Elmwood, con Main Jail and Elmwood uh, construction project, and 38 being the um, Office of Supportive Housing uh, item. Both of those items were referenced by colleagues. I think they'd benefit from some uh, conversation here at the board. So I'm going to ask uh, through the clerk that both items remain on our agenda for conversation today. And then, excuse me, Mr. Chair. I, yes, it was my notes. Maybe I wrote down wrong. The request was to hold those to a future date. You wanted now to change that to hearing. Item twenty-eight. Twenty-eight and thirty-eight. Who was there a request Supervisor to hold? Chavez. I didn't hear that. Hang on. That, just. That's what I wrote down. I may be mistaken. Yeah. That's why, I, as I say, we have a long list, and I appreciate the fact that people <laughs> can take a moment, and we're going to work our way through it. 28 is an item that Supervisor um, Ellenberg referenced briefly in her remarks, I believe, and that Supervisor Chavez also mentioned in her remarks and said initially she planned to be a no vote on. And then I said, well, I'm planning to pull the item uh, from consent anyway so that we could hear it to hear. today. Um, so rather than have the item remain on consent, I'm going to ask that we hear it on a regularly published agenda. And then uh, on item 38, uh, Supervisor Chavez, I believe, indicated she was okay uh, leaving the item on consent uh, if there was a certain understanding as to how the funds 
would or wouldn't be used in addition to simply receiving the report. Uh, but that was inconsistent with my understanding, so I said, well, let's just hear the item hear today and uh, figure out what um, staff is intending and also what our board's policy direction is, if there is any board policy direction today. Okay. Colleagues, I think that's a correct restatement of where we are on those two items, yes? Good. And then just to recap before we go to speakers, uh, for the record, Supervisor Wasserman has indicated he'll be recusing uh, on item number 72. Supervisor Chavez, you had asked for a quarterly report back on items 23 and 24, if I understood it correctly, but I didn't get a chance to ask, is that a report back to the full board, through committee, off agenda? How would you like to frame that request? I think if we could get it to the full board, and the main reason I want to get it to the full board is I think there's a lot of interest in parenting classes and child care, and so we just ought to bring it back here. So at board meetings with a right, formal report to and through the board, and Thank it could you. either be on our regular agenda or consent, depending on the will of the board and the nature of the referrals. And then uh, I further have a request from Supervisor Chavez, I believe, uh, to keep items 31 and 33 on the agenda today rather than to put them on consent. And we also have a request from Supervisor Cortese to hear item number 45 rather than to hold it. Supervisor Cortese, do I have that right? Thank you. Colleagues, did I capture those? I wanna make sure that the clerk and I have the same understanding once we wrap here. Good. Supervisor Chavez, before we go to members of the public. Thank you. The only other thing I, I wanted to just um, ask staff is on item 27, this is the Elmwood SMOP. I think that's a weird acronym. But anyway, um, what I, I wanted to make sure of is that um, we could get, and maybe this could go, Susan, through your committee, just a better understanding of making sure that we have enough program space at Elmwood as we're making um, more, more changes to the services that are provided as part of the, the SMOP. I'd be glad to hear that at PSJC. Thank you. All right, thank you for that accommodation. And Supervisor Cortese, I see your light is on again, sir. Uh, yeah, President Smith, I just wanted uh, uh, you to consider, it's certainly your prerogative, um, a recess today, um, depending, of, of course, on the length of the agenda, but seeing how many items have been put back on discussion, you know, between at a time certain is what I would ask be announced uh, noon to 12:20 or whatever. Some usually call for a 15 or 20 minute recess somewhere there, only because I'm concerned that if, even though I, I think most of the public at this point knows that uh, we have speakers all over the place here, we can hear what's going on when we uh, try to get up to uh, recess on an individual basis. It's very risky to miss an item that you poll that you need to, to comment on, let alone vote on. So I'm just asking for that consideration. Uh, Thanks. Colleagues, Thank everybody uh, agreeable to a, uh, let's call it a 15-minute recess at uh, 1215, returning back to the chambers at 1230. Okay. And we'll obviously finish whatever item we're on uh, at that time so that we don't break in the middle of an item. But we'll look for a recess at or about 1215. Okay. And let me go then to the members of the public who have submitted cards on the consent calendar. I have cards from... Scott Largent, Ron Hansen, Carol Garvey, Melissa Willett, Donna Wallach, Von Villaverde, and Oscar Castro. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, everyone. On the consent calendar, a lot of times we have, uh, you know, I, even Cindy was talking about it, uh, some of the uh, visitation parenting classes and you guys know I talk about this an awful lot. Um, I see, you know, like there's things about the 24-7 dad program. There's things about seeing your kid at Elmwood. There's things about parenting programs to the reentry center. I see all that. But in Santa Clara County, you have to break the law to get help to see your child. Um, what we offer at our courthouse right now is one hour a week. There is now 68 people that are on that list right now at our courthouse. It's through kids, um, no, sorry, Choices for Children, $100,000 grant. 
Now, before that, it was at Catholic Charity Services, and of course it was defunded. We know it's all about money. Uh, Catholic Charity Services provided this visitation for me for about three months. It was with a therapist. It was, you know, multiple hours per week. I mean, it was a nice setup. We got to play on the lawn. We got to play in the fountain. We got to blow bubbles. We got to really have that bonding experience. So now the can has been kicked back to our courthouse over there on the fifth floor in a little room that's there that's been, uh, it's not a pleasant experience. By the time we get my daughter all the way up there and she sees dad and hugs me and we get her in the back of that room there, um, you know, it's rushing through a visit. It's very, very short. I don't know anybody that can bond with their child one hour a week. I just don't think it's possible. Why do we have to break the law to get these services? Why? I, I would be better off right now to continue that bond with my child to figure out a way to commit a crime to have visitation. I don't understand it. Why are people not looking into this? Why are there so many people sitting on a waiting list over at our courthouse? And why do poor people get their rights just taken away and nobody stands up for them? No, thank you. Mr. Hansen, you're up next, sir. Morning, Supervisors. I'm Ron Hansen, Chair of the Juvenile Justice Commission, and I'm speaking on its behalf and the Commission's RAIC Committee. I'm speaking specifically about agenda item number seven. <clears throat> The Commission's responsibilities include periodically visiting and inspecting the rake to determine if the staffing programs and facility are meeting the needs of the youth located there. Of ongoing and urgent concern to the Commission has been the continuing uncertainty regarding the location of this critical facility. While all would agree that the Enborg facility is not ideal, the staff and, the, and DFCS have continued to strive to make it work and indeed are implementing plans for program and staff enhancements predicated on a continuing presence at Enborg. In addition, the pursuit and subsequent receipt of licensing that allows specifically for five-day stays at the Enborg facility recognizes today's reality of youth placement difficulties. The Commission strongly supports these actions and further enhancement plans. The Commission was surprised last week to learn of the imminent eviction of the rake from Enborg. This action only served to magnify the chaos that has surrounded the rake for the past several years. Short of relocating the rake to a site far better suited and appropriate to the needs of those youth, which the Commission understands has not yet been identified, developed, or licensed, we urge the Board and the Administration to base their actions with respect to the Enborg facility on the course which will provide the best long-term stability for the programs, for the staff, and most importantly for the youth, who for their own well-being will continue to be welcomed at the rake. Thank you. Thank you. And colleagues, as our next speaker, Carol Garvey, approaches, I just want to indicate we have some speakers, including uh, Mr. Hanson just spoke and Ms. Garvey are coming up, um, who may wish to speak to items that are no longer on the agenda because they were held or deleted. Those changes are part of our action on the consent calendar. And so it's my interpretation and ruling that it is appropriate to welcome those speakers forward at this time, even if the items are no longer on the agenda. I just wanted to clarify why we were having testimony on items that were either held or removed. Ms. Garvey, welcome and good morning. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Carol Garvey, and I'm here to speak on the 5.8 cent sales tax measure that apparently is dead in the water, which is a shame. Uh, no one likes sales taxes, but the need is the result of 40 plus years of Prop 13. I had just begun my career with the county in 1978, the year Prop 13 passed, and I thought my career was dead in the water then. But you stand on the shoulders of giants, folks like Dan McCorkadale, Susie Wilson, Dominic Cortezi, Zoe Lofgren, Mike Honda, Becky Morgan, Rod Deardon Jr., Jim Bell, to name a few. And uh, they were able to cobble together creative budgets over the years, even with sh shrinking coffers, to serve the community and pay decent wages for its workers. Dan McCorkadale worked from Sacramento once he got elected to Senate uh, to bring funds to the county. I want to thank my supervisor, Cindy Chavez, and Dan Cortezi, who supported this issue, though I think it's in their DNA to do so. 
And I also want to recognize and thank Supervisor Ellenberg, who recognized the need for this sales tax, especially as it would have helped the county's women and children the most. The urgent needs of affordable housing, child care, and health care won't go away. I'm hopeful that you will continue to work to find creative, innovative solutions for these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Melissa Willett, Donna Wallach, Vaughn Villaverde, Wasser Castro, and then uh, Shamara Cisneros. Welcome, good morning. Good morning, my name is Melissa Willett and I live in San Jose. Over the last few months, I've heard the stories of Santa Clara <coughs> County residents and I've heard our communities and the families in those communities in this county that are facing a crisis of housing, a crisis of childcare and healthcare. And I wanna thank you, I wanna give a thank you to those of you on the board who stood up to let residents decide if they want to invest in their community and actually address the crises that they are experiencing. And it's disappointing that some board members do not believe that residents should be able to vote on this. I ask why, this is our future, this is our community, and this is our county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Donna Wallach. You must support the revenue measure for social services to the sales tax. We need the money for many community needs. I work as an in-home support service provider and I'm only paid $14 an hour. It is extremely difficult to live in San Jose on such low wages. I have to work five part-time jobs just to get by. There are not enough providers in San Jose. I continuously get calls from people who have been looking for in-home support service providers for months, some over three months. Having an in-home support service provider is not a luxury, it is a necessity. With the likelihood of Google building their not needed campus in San Jose, property taxes are going to skyrocket and our rents are going to also skyrocket. I can't afford to pay any more rent than I currently pay, $1,000 a month, utilities not included. Many of us in-home support service providers will have to move away. I will not and cannot drive two hours to get to my clients. It will also be a horrible damage to the environment to do something like that. We need many, many more in-home support service providers in San Jose, and as time goes on, we're gonna need many, many more. So please pass this revenue measure. Also, the so-called healthcare system in this entire country is horrendous. Only really rich people can afford to get really good health care. The only solution is health care for each and every person. Everybody, everybody gets health care, and actually that will save the county thousands of dollars. Thank you. And our next speaker is Vaughn, I believe it's Via Verde. Welcome. Good morning, President Smidian, members of the board. My name is Vaughn Villaverde, and I'm the Associate Director of Health Policy at Working Partnerships USA. I'm speaking in support of the five cent revenue measure. Um, we're disappointed that the board has decided not to give voters the opportunity to decide whether or not to fund our communities. But over the past three months, we held community forums where we heard from community members of the need for more resources for health care, early childhood education, and affordable housing. During these forums, we collected over 500 signatures that I would like to submit to the board. These are critical issues, and it's time to address them as a community. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll ask the clerk to take the signatures from you and make sure that they're shared with all members of the board. Mr. Castro, welcome. Good morning, President Smitty and members of the board. My name is Waskar Castro, Policy Associate for Silicon Valley at Home. I'd like to start, start off by thanking Supervisor Chavez for bringing forth the need to address the rising cost uh, and the need for affordable housing, health care, and child care in this county. Um, we're seeing residents that are continuously having to struggle to make difficult decisions between having to pay for their rent, medical expenses, or whether or not they can provide care for their children. Uh, that demonstrates a need for more funds in this county, thus uh, speaking in support of this uh, revenue uh, sales tax. We stand in solidarity with our partners uh, in, this, in this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mrs. Neros, welcome. And please help me with the pronunciation of your first name, which I'm guessing is something you've been doing your whole life. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm Siomara, so I Siomara? guess. Siomara? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mrs. Yeah. Neros. Please begin. 
Um, uh, good morning, as you might have noticed, we're the Bay Area Council. Um, we are a public policy organization for the nine county Bay Area, representing some of the biggest employers in the region, and we advocate for a strong economy and better quality of life for everyone here. And uh, when I think of quality of life, I think of stable, um, affordable housing. And um, as we all know, um, the resources, the funding for that affordable housing is uh, not finite. So um, especially with the, the dissolution of the redevelopment agency, we were excited to see um, some efforts put forth by the legislature with SB5. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think of very much a step in the right direction is not a new source of revenue, but at least a demonstration, again, from the capital um, to uh, provide some of those uh, funding for those in need. And I do appreciate some of um, the concerns or comments, for example, um, that it's not necessarily for those um, of the lowest income, um, but the local entities um, with their plants could choose um, to divert those funds for extremely low um, income housing. Um, and the fact that 50% would be uh, flexible funds and not necessarily, again, for affordable housing. I hear uh, time and again from affordable housing developers that um, it's helpful to use, um, have the discretion for the funding for infrastructure improvements, transit-oriented um, needs for those homes. So um, that flexibility could actually be helpful in the long run for uh, delivering more affordable housing. Um, and with that, again, the Barry Council is in support of SB5. Thank you very much, Ms. Cisneros. And we have two more cards. And folks, last call on cards from Jose Sacedo and Rosa Vargas. Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is uh, David. I'll be interpreting for uh, Jose. And before Ho Jose uh, Sosero begins, we're going to double the time so that you're not um, limited on time to the two minutes that it will be four minutes to accommodate the translation. Okay. Moment. That's good. Right. Buenos, buenos días. Mi nombre es Juan Salcedo. Soy residente aquí de San Jose por 35 años. Vengo en representación principalmente de todos lo, los compañeros de, de comida rápida, que el salario que tenemos pues es, es bajo para las rentas como están. Hello, my name is uh, Jose Salcedo. I'm a resident of San Jose. I've been living here for 35 years now, and I'm a fast food uh, worker, and I uh, am in representation of all the fast food workers that are organizing. Um, here in, in the county. Lo que necesitamos es que nos concedieran más fondos para tener una vivienda accesible, porque he, yo en lo personal he visto muchas personas durmiendo en sus carros con niños, porque no se alcanza más, y muchos están optando por irse a otro lado. Um, I, in my years here, I've noticed a growing homelessness problem. Um, more people, more co-workers I've seen uh, sleeping in their cars with their, with their children, with their family members. Y también eso se está prestando para que la, la delincuencia aumente porque vienen de otros lados dicen, se corre la voz, no, en tal parte allí hay mucha gente en la calle y de eso se valen y la delincuencia está aumentando. I've also noticed that it's created a public safety concern for a lot of the people that are staying in their cars, and specifically family, families and children that, that live in the, in the streets. Entonces, pues queremos que nos hicieran ese, esa, queremos hacer esa petición para que seguir en este país. Digo, seguimos en el país, pero tenemos que irse a áreas extremas donde sea posible. And so we're, we're asking this board to support the, the current measure um, that was taken off the consent agenda today to um, increase funds for, uh, for housing and for the social services that people need. Gracias por escucharnos. Muchas gracias. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Forgive me, thank you for being here. 
And I believe we have one more speaker, Rosa Vargas. Buenos días, mi nombre es Rosa Vargas. Estamos aquí para representar a los compañeros trabajadores de comida rápida y lo que nosotros estamos pidiendo que nos apoyen para una vivienda justa porque el salario que nosotros tenemos es muy bajo, no alcanzamos a pagar la renta, a comida, cuidado de niños. Uh, y pues la situación que estamos viviendo uh, es muy dura para nosotros aquí en San José. Yo tengo 25 años viviendo aquí. Hi, my name is Rosa Vargas. I'm also a fast food worker and in representation of all fast food workers here in, in the county. Um, I, I, like many of my coworkers, experience low wages, um, low wages that can pay for rent increases, health care, um, and the rising cost of child care. And so we're here to ask, to petition this board to do something about this. Por eso estamos pidiendo que nos apoyen con un poquito de, de presupuesto para, para las necesidades que estamos pidiendo, sugiriendo, porque pues uh, la situación que vivimos aquí pues no, no es muy buena para nosotros. Y pues... Eso es lo que nosotros estamos pidiendo, apoyo a la situación que se vive a, y pues es, es mucha situación. Habemos personas que pues estamos llegando a la situación que vamos yo creo a vivir en carros, en parques donde nosotros nos podamos acomodar porque la situación de la renta es muy alta. Um, and uh, I, I asked this board to help us with these issues that we've outlined. Um, as, as my coworker before outlined, um, homelessness is a, is a serious issue that a lot of uh, fast food workers are facing. Um, and so we're, we're asking that this board take action on, on these items that are of great urgency, uh, including the uh, uh, more funds for social services that people continuously rely on to make ends meet. Pues esa es la situación que se está viviendo aquí en la ciudad de San José y que pues muchos años atrás no se miraba esto y, y la... la La vida que estamos llevando aquí se me hace que lo estamos llevando muy rápida por esta misma situación que se vive. Eso es todo. Muchas gracias. And, and lastly, um, I, I've seen a decrease in the standard of living for workers in my years here. I've been living here for uh, 25 years now, and it's becoming increasingly harder to afford the things that we need to, to uh, make sure that we have a, a good life here in San Jose. So um, I ask this board to uh, take action on this, uh, and thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your translation services you. as well. Madam Clerk, let me confirm that we have no other speakers on the consent calendar. The clerk indicates that we do not. Colleagues, one last check to see if there are any additions, deletions, or corrections coming down the row. Ms. Ellenberg, Mr. Cortese, Mr. Wasserman, Ms. Chavez. All right, and I will indicate, Madam Clerk, uh, as I have been reviewing and listening, uh, I will also be a no vote on item 44, which has been moved to consent. A no vote on item 44. All right, then we'll ask that the uh, voting panel be displayed on our screen so we can take action on that long list. Do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar as amended? We do from Supervisor Ellenberg. Do we have a second? We do from Supervisor Wasserman. And we will all please vote on the screen. All votes have now been cast, so I'll ask the clerk to please display the results. And the clerk's uh, going to indicate that the motion carries 5-0. Once again, this is item number six. The amended consent calendar is approved on a 5-0 vote. All right, Madam Clerk, <clears throat> when you have the revised list of uh, items on the agenda, I would appreciate receiving it from you. That's helpful uh, every meeting. I thank you again. But I believe that that takes us to 
Item number eight, which is the public hearing for the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. And colleagues, one minute, please. Because this is a formal public hearing, I'm going to announce very formally that uh, this is the public hearing on the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. And um, this is item number eight on our agenda. And we're going to begin by asking the department staff to offer a verbal report, if they'd like, summarizing the item and your recommendation. Uh, good morning, Supervisors. Dr. Smith, Keeley, Director, Office of Supportive Housing, here with Consuelo Hernandez, Housing Community uh, Development uh, Manager. Um, the county is the recipient of federal uh, community development block grant and home investment partnership program funds. Each year we must report on the activities uh, funded by uh, uh, these two funding sources by September 30th. Uh, uh, the report and the item today covers the fiscal year 2019 activities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll ask if there are any clarifying questions from sta for staff at this point. There are none apparently. All right, well then we will formally open the public hearing. The public hearing is now open. Let me ask the clerk if we have any cards from speakers who'd like to speak on this item. She indicates that we do not. So without objection and hearing none, we will now close the public hearing. And with the public hearing now being closed, we'll turn to colleagues for discussion, deliberation. And in the absence of any comments or questions, we'll ask the clerk to please display the voting panel on our screens. We have a motion to approve from Supervisor Chavez. We have a second from Supervisor Cortese. We will ask all five members to please vote on their screens. All five votes having been cast, we'll ask the clerk to display the results overhead so that we can announce that item number eight, the staff recommendation, is approved 5-0. Thank you to uh, Keeley and Ms. Hernandez as well. Thank you. That takes us then to item number nine. This is again a public hearing, so for the record I will announce that item number nine is a public hearing regarding the purchase of real property located at 1695, that's 1695 Alum Rock Avenue in San Jose. And here again, we'll turn to department staff for a uh, verbal report summarizing the agenda item and the department's recommendations. Thank you. Um, this is, item is related to Quetzal Garden Apartments. It is a uh, new development um, that includes 71 apartments, uh, 28 of which would be used as permit supportive housing for chronically homeless individuals or families. The board approved um, approximately $9.83 million of Measure A funds in December of 2016, or uh, December of 2017. Um, about 4.26 million would be used for the acquisition of the land for which the county would then ground lease to the developer to begin uh, construction of the new development um, starting at the end of October. Thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions from board members before we open the public hearing? If not, we will formally open the public hearing on item number nine and I'll ask the clerk if we have any speakers who would like to address the board. Clerk indicates that we do not so without objection hearing none, I will close the public hearing and uh, we will see if there are comments or questions from board members, any debate or deliberation. Don't see any microphones on, so we'll ask the clerk to please display the voting panel on our screens. And we have a motion to approve the staff recommendation as contained in our published agenda from Supervisor Chavez. Uh, and a second would be helpful in moving us along. So I'll say thank you to Supervisor Ellenberg for a second on that item. We'll ask all five members to please vote on their screens. And that has now been done. So we'll ask the clerk to please tally the votes and display them overhead. Motion carries 5-0. Once again, that's 5-0 on item number nine. Takes us to our next public hearing, which is item number 10, purchase of real property located at 2904 Corvin Drive in Santa Clara. And here again, We'll ask the staff if they have a uh, public report or excuse me, a verbal staff report for the public. Mr. Lee, I'm looking to you. Sir, thank you. Uh, this is related to the Corbin Apartments in Santa Clara. It's a new development of 145 apartments, 80 of, 80 of which will be used as permanent supportive housing. The board previously allocated up to $29 million in 2016 Measure A funds for the development of which 9.5 million will be used for the acquisition of the land, which will then be ground leased to the developer, and they will begin construction mid-November. 
Thank you very much. Do we have any clarifying questions from board members before we turn to the public? Apparently not. Let me ask the clerk, if, uh, as I announced that I am formally opening the public hearing on item number 10, let me ask the clerk, do we have any speakers on this item? Clerk indicates that we do not, so without objection and hearing none, I will now close the public hearing and see if there is uh, debate or deliberation by members of the board. Any comments or questions? In the absence of comments from members of the board, we are ready to take the vote. So I'll ask that the voting panel be displayed on our screens and see if we can get a motion to approve the staff recommendation. And we have that motion from Supervisor Chavez, and we have a second from Supervisor Gortese. And again, this is to approve the staff recommendation. On item number 10, we'll ask all five members to please vote on their screen. That having been done, we'll ask the clerk to please display the results so that we can announce that the motion carries five to zero. Thank you both. That would take us to item number 11, but item number 11 uh, has been canceled. That would take us to item number 12, uh, but item number 12 has been held. And uh, that takes us then to item number 13 uh, as we enter into board referrals. Colleagues, this is a uh, referral uh, from uh, me and my office, and it is uh, simply uh, to provide direction to our administration and county council to provide regular progress reports to the board regarding efforts to improve the security and integrity of elections uh, here in Santa Clara County. Uh, some of you will recall that um, prior to the 2018 elections, uh, FGOC, Supervisor Chavez and I uh, spent some time uh, on a regular basis, month after month, working with our staff to up our game in terms of election security matters. Uh, the reasons for that are obvious and don't need to be repeated. They're in the memo. Uh, and uh, Supervisor Cortese, I recall you had weighed in earlier on this item as well, this issue of election security. Um, without uh, sharing too much, and that's always a challenge in these conversations, how to make sure that we're transparent with the public but aren't sharing information that would allow folks to compromise the system. Without sharing too much, I feel uh, like we made substantial progress. I also feel like uh, if we've learned anything through the exercise is that our work is never done in this regard uh, and that the threat never abates. And uh, so we have continued to uh, do good work throughout the organization to get us to a ever more secure place. Uh, and some of you know, and some of you were able to uh, have staff join us at the conference that my office and I sponsored, where we had about 125 folks from around the state, and indeed some from out of state, working on election security matters and trying to identify best practices that we could share between and among counties. One last thing I'll say uh, before just uh, uh, making a, a motion and uh, providing a little more clarity about the motion is, um, I think all of us, including the members of the public, are used to hearing about these election security matters as matters of national or state interest and importance. What is often overlooked, of course, is that the elections actually get conducted at the local level. I mean, there are 3,000 counties across the country. In some jurisdictions, the uh, responsibility may rest with the municipal government, but the votes get counted and they are either secure or not secure at the county level. Uh, and uh, that's why I think it's so important that we focus our efforts here, particularly as we are just a matter of months away now from a presidential primary here in California. So if I could get the screen to uh, pop up, I'll make the motion. And um, I think what I'd like to do is uh, ask that we get regular progress reports to the board regarding efforts to improve the security and integrity of the elections uh, in Santa Clara County. Uh, and if we could get those, um, actually as agenda items to simply receive the report, Dr. Smith, even if they end up on consent. I think it's important to keep highlighting on a monthly basis if we could. And I understand that there may not be a lot of news to share incrementally from month to month, but I just think this is an issue that for the foreseeable future, by which I mean through the end of the 2020 election cycle, we're gonna need to stay on top of. So that is my motion. I'm gonna lean forward and ask if there is a second. There is, thank you, Supervisor Cortese. We'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen because the clerk is giving me the look that says no cards on this item, I believe. There are none, just wanted to double check that and tell the public that, all right. All votes have been cast, so we'll ask that the item be displayed and the vote carries 5-0, that's item number 13. Thank you, colleagues. That takes us then to item number 14. And uh, Supervisor Chavez, I believe this is your referral. 
And Supervisor, before you begin, if I may, I just say, um, I am less familiar with Happy Hollow and its operations than those of you who have served at the city of San Jose level. So if you could provide a little bit of explanation, um, I just I sort of wanted to uh, acknowledge my need for a little bit more info about how the operation works uh, up front. Thanks. Thank you, and I'm happy to give you a tour, too, of Happy Hollow. Um, can I, can I call that part of my official duties? I think that, right. that would be that Mike would be Wasserman's good. requesting pictures of that. Let's pass on that. <laughs> so um, the reason I'm bringing this forward to my colleagues is that um, Happy Hollow is a children's zoo in, uh, da well, in just outside of downtown San Jose. And they um, have been working really closely with the community to try to restructure their presence in the community. They are in an area that is economically depressed, but many, many, many of the visitors come from all over the county. So it's a countywide facility, um, but what they'd found is that children who live nearby weren't able to access it. So they are beginning a brand new program and doing fundraising to make sure that Title I schools are able to, to physically come to the site. And prior to that, what they had done is they'd taken some of that um, the smaller animals and some of their education to the schools, but not, not um, vice versa. So now they're um, creating an access program for their site. As part of that, they are rebuilding some of their um, facilities and adding facilities to make it more uh, easy for children of all capacities and seniors to be able to participate in using the services there. It's actually pretty well designed now, but what I was interested in was taking a small portion of the million dollars that we have budgeted for my district for all-inclusive playgrounds and cleaving off $35,000 so that we could have an all-inclusive playground at Happy Hollow that would be ready to um, align with the programming they're doing for schools that are lower income. Could I, uh, colleagues, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask some questions uh, and then I'll go to, to the rest. Uh, Supervisor, for the record, um, and. And again, because I just want to make sure I understand. Happy Hollow is a city park? Yes. And it is then supported by a separate 501c3 foundation? foundation. That's okay, correct. That, that just that was part of the uh, just understanding I wanted to get. And then, um, and forgive me, my, my memory does not serve me well on this item. There were, um, in the what I call the second round of funding, there was $2 million per district. Was there a million that was left unspent in District 2? Is that the, the circumstance? And then the reason that this applicant um, wasn't eligible to participate in the second round of funding was because of the charging of fees to, for access to the park? There were two issues. One was charging fees, and the other was they didn't attend a workshop. Um, and part of the reason, and I actually feel um, like this was a mistake I made. I hadn't reached out to them until after the timeline, took a tour, and that's what prompted the yeah. request. And just, uh, you know, as a matter of empathy, on the one hand, we were rushing to try and uh, put that second round out before our colleague, Supervisor Yeager, uh, left the board. That was something he was enthusiastic about. On the other hand, that may have meant that the process was a little rushed for people who wanted to participate in the second round, but just didn't have time to parse the process, so I have some uh, sympathy there. And then, um, so there's a million dollars that uh, essentially the parks folks were gonna make available to other applicants going forward. Was that the, was that the plan? Yes, and we have, um, we had been working with the city of San Jose to um, do a match for a, a, a big portion of that money in the Emmer Prush Park area, which is also a low income community. Got it. And then um, is the uh, big difference between a million dollars and $35,000. So is the application that we're anticipating for $35,000? Mm -hmm. Thanks. And is the action you're requesting today in your memo a, a waiver of the rules so that they can apply or are we being asked to actually approve the allocation of funds today? Well, actually that's a great question. I. I wanted to approve the funds today, and um, in part because of timing opportunities relative to Happy Hollow being able to move relatively quickly. And one of the, my staff just corrected me that the Happy Hollow um, Zoo is actually run by 
the foundation, which is why we're, we would be making the grant to the foundation and not the city. Got it, but it's, a, but it's on city property? Yes, it's a city partnership, absolutely. Thank it's just, you. I wanted to make sure I was accurate. I've, I've, had, I've had similarly, I, I won't say confusing, but I, I've uh, struggled with, uh, I guess the Palo Alto History Museum uh, in Palo Alto is on city land that is at the corner of a park but is not technically parkland, and so you get into the same kind of, well, okay, so how does that, and does it matter, and so on and so forth. Thank you, all that's very helpful, and I appreciate the patience of my colleagues. I'm gonna to go to Mr. Wasserman, and then to Ms. Ellenberg. Thank you. I appreciate Supervisor Chavez putting forward this referral because my district also faced similar issues in getting applicants that felt like they could meet all the necessary requirements. That said, I would ask the motion maker um, to consider a couple of changes. One, approve, the, approve extending the program two, round two of the AIPG grant application deadline for an additional 60 days. Number two, I'd also like to ask staff to amend the procedural guide to either eliminate or reduce the 65% minimum hours accumulated days requirement and waive the requirement to attend the technical wor workshop if they had attended one in the previous round. I had people who had attended a workshop in the previous round, didn't attend in this round. Uh, and then were DQ. They were, no, they felt they were not qualified mm. meeting that requirement, was their understanding, whatever the communication was. So they, they didn't. This will give interested, interested applicants who did not apply because they felt they could not meet these requirements a chance to formally apply. That's what the 60-day extension is for. The bottom line is we all want to see these funds used for all-inclusive playgrounds. Can I have your verbiage? And Supervisor Ellen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to start by saying that, that I am a huge fan of Happy Hollow Park and Zoo. I spent yep. probably the bulk of my son's first six years of life there uh, and still enjoy visiting with friends and and family, it really is a tremendous community asset. I'm also deeply appreciative of all of your uh, commitment to all-inclusive playgrounds. I was part of the Rotary Playground Play Garden Project, which has already welcomed hundreds of thousands of visitors to its fully accessible features and attractions. And I believe that it's the Play Garden that stimulated this new interest in inclusive uh, play spaces all across the, the county, and I'm really glad that we are working on that. As is probably clear to everyone uh, by now, I am a fan of process, and respecting clearly defined processes helps us make decisions in a fair and transparent manner and avoid appearances of partiality and favor favoritism. In this case, Happy Hollow did not follow the clearly defined process, and if they had, it sounds like they may not have met all of the qualifications for this grant. So as much as I support their desire to add accessible play features, allowing this really well-known and beloved organization to work around a process to which dozens of other organizations were expected to adhere feels uncomfortable to me. And it also certainly does seem that the eligibility requirements may have ruled out some worthy projects. And should a third round of funding become available, I think we should review those requirements, particularly um, in light of the suggestions that Supervisor Wasserman just made. I do hope that Happy Hollow will continue to seek funding sources for all-inclusive features and, and hope that they have an opportunity to come back to us again, but I'm going to abstain from of this vote today. Colleagues, um, if I can weigh in, please. Um, <laughs> First, a shout out to our friends at Magical Bridge, who along with uh, the Rotary Play Garden uh, were really leading on this effort. Um, I came to our board with the initial proposal for a $10 million round of funding uh, with Supervisor Chavez uh, joining me on that memo uh, because my hope was that an injection of funds and a competition would serve as a catalyst for more activity and that this would then instead of becoming a one-off that as somebody put it quite eloquently it would become a thing 
and it did become a thing, and we had a substantial competition, which was a good and healthy thing, because that meant that we had engaged the community, and this is one of those, I think, small success stories where you can say it worked the way we hoped it would work. Uh, in fact, it worked the way we, we hoped it would work so well that uh, people, when I tossed off, gee, maybe we can come back in a couple of years and do this again, uh, that's when Supervisor Yeager, uh, to chuckles from the audience said, why don't we do it again before the end of the year because he was termed at the time. And as I say, we did that. Um, you know, I think Supervisor Wasserman has threaded the needle quite well in my view. And, and here's what I would say. I've got on the one hand a request, could we get some money today? I've got on the other hand a colleague who's saying, I think we need to respect the process. And I think uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I'm kind of where you are, which is, Let's try and respect the process, but let's also acknowledge that there are going to be cases that come along that are a little bit different. Supervisor Cortese, for example, uh, will remember that at various times he said to me, look, I understand the goal. Forgive me, Supervisor, I'm characterizing your words, so if I mischaracterize, please speak up. But essentially what I heard was, I understand the goal is to generate matching funds to leverage our county dollars, but not every community is going to be as well positioned to find those matching funds. Can we be a little bit mindful of that? So we've shown some flexibility along the way, even though I continue to believe and our criteria continue to reflect the fact that matching funds are, are key to the success of the program. I think in this case, I'm also struck by the fact, Supervisor Wasserman, uh, that your motion is, I think, helpful in regard to the fact that, if I understand correctly, there's still a million dollars unallocated because of the lack of um, competition in the process. Did I say Supervisor Wasserman? Excuse me. So uh, I, think, I think there's a way to both respect process and accommodate the unique case. The only thing I would ask for from Supervisor Wasserman, if he wants to offer it as a motion to Supervisor uh, Chavez, is that we uh, indicate clearly that this change in criteria, if it's over a 60-day period, is limited to these leftover funds and does not apply to uh, other funding cycles going forward. So people, I mean, as I say, the short version, and I'm sorry for, for uh, finally getting to it, the short version is, look, <laughs> we got a million dollars left over. The criteria apparently didn't work uh, to produce the level of engagement that we hoped for. And so if we need a little flexibility to uh, round up funds for the um, matching funds. I'm, 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 I'm open with that, but through a criteria. So, yes, Supervisor Ellenberg? If we do that, um, would other entities have the opportunity to apply based on the new criteria and new rules? That, that I could support. Yes, and that's what I understood Supervisor Wasserman to be suggesting to Supervisor Chavez, and ultimately it will be her motion. But I heard Supervisor Wasserman saying, rather than making any allocation today, and rather than calling out anyone singly, let's simply say, hey, that million is still there. Let's reopen the process in District 2 for 60 days for that remaining million with the criteria. Supervisor Wasserman, I'm now putting words in both your mouth and Supervisor Chavez's mouth, which is a risky business, so yes. I'll stop. <laughs> yes, yes, sir, when you said in the district what my motion was, was to reopen it. We still have 1.3 million. In we have four district. applicants that I we think being we being district one right and i think that this board will find appropriate use but because of particular rule we have in place that's why that's why i asked for the 60-day extension and that one change as you are so articulately articulate i believe you mean at length <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. it's restated thank you then why I, I i like that and appreciate it but um so it sounds like we shouldn't limit it to district two but the D1, I actually would like confirmation for D4 that all of the funds have been allocated, and if they have not, Countywide was the suggestion. Yeah, let's okay. just, for that purpose. Anybody with money left With over. money left. Cool. Yeah, let's do that. And I'm happy to accept the friendly amendment. The only, um, the only thing I, so I'm just gonna read it back into the record to approve extending program two, round two of the uh, grant application deadline for 60 days, that was one, and then have staff amend procedural guidelines to either eliminate or reduce the 65 minimum, minimum hour accumulated days requirement and waive the requirement to attend the technical workshop if they've attended in the previous year. Yes. And then the only other thing that um, I think the 65% minimum hours, is this the access issue? Okay, because what I was, I, the only other thing I wanted to um, ask for inclusion is that the staff 
uh, look at access more broadly and in part because some of the little organizations may charge at on occasion and not charge on occasion so I just want to make sure they're richly looking at the access question and if that's the case I would accept that as a friendly amendment to my motion before we go to a motion I'd see we do have staff now who can perhaps tell oh. us where we what the status is so please uh, introduce yourself give us your name and title for the record even though we know who you are and uh, share anything you think would be helpful to the discussion. Don Rocha, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, I'm just here to answer any questions you may have for me. Um, if there's, if you, uh, thank you for the clarification of what the amendment was. There's a lot of discussion, so I just wanted to track it so I can answer any other questions that you have. I have two quick questions, if I may. Can you make that work? That's my first question. Yes, we can. We can go out again. Thank you. Second question is, um, we had five districts, each of which initially had $2 million in the second round of funding. In how many of the five districts are those funds not fully committed? Uh, district one, two, and three. So the motion would apply to those three districts. Correct. Uh, I understand it's generically applying to all five districts, but as a practical matter, there's still leftover funds which might be allocated in those three districts with this accommodation, yes? Correct. Great. Any other questions for Mr. Rocha? Thank you, colleagues. Then we'll ask the clerk to please display the voting panel on the screen. I will ask if there are any members of the public here to speak on this item. There are not. Supervisor Chavez has made the motion, which incorporates by reference the suggestions from Supervisor Wasserman, who has seconded the motion. Could we ask all five members to please vote on the screen? That having been done, can we ask the clerk to display the results? And the motion carries 5-0. Thank you all very much. That takes us to item number 15. And uh, those, uh, this is the Title X Reproductive Health Services. And Supervisor Chavez, I believe this is a referral from you. Thank you very much. Um, back in March, I had asked the administration to assess the impact of the Trump administration's actions upon the Title X health services for women in our county. In May, the report came back that 36, over 36,000 women in our county um, could lose their health services be from the changes in Title X. And sadly, that's come to pass. Um, we're talking about the most basic health services for women, birth control, pregnancy tests, mammograms, pap smears, cancer screenings. And, we're, and in our community, I just want to say how much I appreciate already the, the support that the staff um, has given in terms of how we address this. In contrast, our county's core mission, in contrast to what the Trump administration is acting <coughs> both irresponsibly and cruelly, and at a local level, we're trying to step up for women in our community. So my referral proposes that the county, with willing local partners such as the City of San Jose, step up and protect these services by funding the gap uh, that is in need. For women in Santa Clara County, that amount of money this year is approximately $463,000. I would like the staff with um, the referral uh, action I'm asking for is to not only look at resources from the county, but look at surrounding cities to determine whether or not they would have an interest in helping us. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, the, um, thank you for the referral. That's my first observation. Uh, as I think uh, you know, this is an issue that has come up uh, in a number of venues here in the county. Supervisor Cortese and I have uh, heard the issue at our Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force. Mm -hmm. It's also come up in our uh, Health and Hospitals Committee, uh, and we've sort of been waiting and hoping and waiting and hoping, and now uh, no hope. So uh, the, I think the action is um, timely and, and important, so thank you for that. Um, might I ask that we get um, report backs through uh, the Health and Hospital Committee, and if you'd like through another committee, including your own, the Children's Seniors and Families, uh, if you wish. But I just, in terms of the follow-up, I think it would be good to have some committee deliberation on this before it comes back to the full board. And you mean committee deliberation on the, the amount of the money available or the actual other responses you're interested in? I, I just think whatever the response to the referral are going to be, it would be good to have that conversation at somewhat greater length in health and hospitals so we can have an opportunity for both public input and to walk through what the proposal is before it comes to the full board. So I'm very comfortable with that under one condition, and that is that 
Um, I think from from discussing this with um, Planned Parenthood, there's a, a bit of concern about um, continuity of services. And so what I would ask is that um, the staff be able to, even if it's the same report that needs to be updated, that those reports come as close to concurrently as possible, only so that we have an opportunity to make sure that they're not worried about a gap in services, if that's a comfortable way to proceed. I'm Absolutely, I yeah. uh, don't want the process to get in the way of continuity of service here. Okay, and so I think it'd be great to have it go to Health and Hospital. Let me just add, if it's going to Health and Hospital Committee, just one other request that I would make that I would want um, you both to give some thought to. Um, in addition to being able to respond uh, quickly, I think the other issue that I'm concerned about is how we communicate the availability of the services that remain in the county. And, you know, clearly Planned Parenthood will have a, a plan for that, but we may need to play a, lead, a leadership role in assisting with um, public communication, in part because what's happening at a national level has been so terrifying. And and if you're going to have a chance to talk about it in committee, I'd really appreciate a communication, a plan discussion about communication as well. Got it. And can we ask the administrator? Uh, uh, Dr. Smith, you're looking perplexed, so I want to let you lean in so that we make sure everybody gets the same uh, understanding. Yes. Um, the way that administration is reading the referral <clears throat> is asking for us to come back with an allocation recommendation uh, from an appropriate fund, and we were thinking um, possibly the Enterprise Fund, possibly the reserve for state and um, federal uh, contingencies, um, realizing that the full board has to take action before the money can actually be transferred and dispersed. So I'm wondering um, what the community referral will do to that process because, you know, we have to develop a contract and, and come back with a formal F-85 and allocation. And that's going to... Are you saying that you want the committee to review it before that, or? No, I think what Supervisor Chavez and I <clears throat> were able to find common ground on is um, bring it to this board with all due haste, deliberate speed, as quick as you can. Do the same with the committee, and if there's a little overlap or one gets in front of the other, that's okay, but we want the opportunity to have the two members of the Health and Hospital Committee talk it through at greater length, provide yet another venue for public input if it's out there, make sure we've explored the range of possibilities, even as we are bringing the matter to the full board for timely action. The other piece that I'm hearing, though, from Supervisor Chavez that your question goes to, Dr. Smith, is about, um, I think what I heard Supervisor Chavez say, and again, I'm in the dis dangerous territory of putting words in my colleagues' mouths, is, hey, there's more to this than just the money. There's the partnerships with others in the county to figure out how we address this. And I don't know yet what that might or might not look like. I think that's the reason in part for the referral, if I heard it right. But then I also heard a, a, a specific exhortation about sort of community outreach around this issue as well. So let me turn to Supervisor Chavez. So, and see if yeah, I got it let right. me let you, I appreciate this. And actually, as I'm thinking about this in real time, let me just make two points. One is that. Planned Parenthood needs money immediately. So the faster you can bring the, the money back to the board, the better. I, I am comfortable with that concurrently going through committee if it doesn't slow it down. If it slows it down a day, we want it to come to the board. I think that's, that's a fair characterization. The other thing, though, is that this is a one-year emergency funding plan. And what we need to have a conversation with the other cities and other entities about, and I think this is where Supervisor Simidian's completely right that the, the Health and Hospital Committee could be really helpful to us, is better understanding what the, what the total need is and how other partners can help us fund it. Um, let me just say two reasons why that's important. One, Council Member Magdalena Carrasco is asking the city of San Jose to also contribute money, and I don't know what their timeline will be like. And again, if they're slow, I don't want us to be slow waiting for their, their resource. But because we know 
that this is not a one-time hit, that this could be something ongoing, I think better understanding who our funding partners are going to be is really critical for a, for a couple of reasons. One is continuity and source of funds. The other is making sure the public knows that Planned Parenthood is going to stay open for everybody that they're providing services to now. And three, and this may actually be one of the more important issues, is that the strategies we use at a county and regional level could be adopted from other counties and other regions across the country. And the sooner we get out and show that we're doing that, the more I think we support other counties doing the same thing. Thank you. And the one other thing I would mention is uh, during the conversation, I've had a chance to check my calendar, and I note that the Health and Hospitals Committee is scheduled for September the 25th, which is the day after the next board meeting. So uh, if, you know, if something's ready within two weeks here at the full board, great. And then we could follow up on it the following day. Uh, if not, we will then have the ability to start from scratch, or not quite from scratch, but uh, on the 25th. Uh, and I don't think there's any reason why the dates should pose a conflict in terms of moving the conversation forward. So uh, looking to my staff in the uh, chambers here, uh, we'll just make sure that we have this item on the agenda for the 25th uh, so that we can try and play a constructive role or, or at least uh, have a better understanding of what the challenges are right now. And then for now, we'll ask the staff to target the 24th to come back to us, Dr. Smith. We won't have the contract done by then, but we can definitely do the, the allocation in the F-85 so that we can get a, a appropriate delegation to complete the contract, yes. Great, and then, and then that'll allow, Joe, you all to dive into what the what is. And if there, I assume that if there are other providers that that'll be part of the conversation. Oh, that's an interesting point. Other impacted institutions, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I mean, it's part of the, larger conversation that we're going to need. I have the uh, concern about Planned Parenthood, obviously. Uh, colleagues will know that um, we've been working with staff for the past two years now to um, try and effectuate a partnership with uh, Planned Parenthood in Mountain View, which remains, I think, the only clinic, Planned Parenthood clinic between Redwood City and San Jose. So in terms of serving that portion of the uh, community population, it's an important important venue. Um, all right, Supervisor Chavez, I think it's time to uh, you have, um, up, forgive me, Supervisor Ellenberg, way down there. How are you, ma'am? <laughs> nice to be noticed. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Supervisor Chavez, thank you so much for um, bringing this referral forward. I, I absolutely share your sense of emergency and want to just ask um, some more questions about how we can really do this um, very quickly, thinking both short term and long term. Um, there's an immediate need right now for these dollars. So my first question is, do we need to do a standard contract as opposed to uh, perhaps making a one-time grant of this money, just a, a straight-out grant, so that we can do that quickly? And then the pieces um, for the committee would be thinking more strategically in the event that this is long term of what partners from the cities um, would be willing to do this going forward, uh, what, what um, ongoing funding sources, and again, looking, uh, looking with Planned Parenthood at, at outreach and communication. I don't think it's yeah, no, our absolutely. responsibility, <laughs> but I yeah. fully understand why it's, why it's critical that we do that. Also, are there other entities in the county that receive Title X funding, or is this only a Planned Parenthood issue? It's only Planned Parenthood. And to answer the first part of your question, mm -hmm. we the board has to do the appropriation, modification, and allocation. So that's a board action. We do have to have a, quote, grant contract, which really just is evidence of the board taking action, but the board can delegate the signing of a contract to the county executive, which I would imagine you would want to do. And, you know, it's basically two pages of, here's your name, here's our name, we're giving you $498,000 to do this. It's not a 
complex contract. It's not a complex negotiation process, but it's documentation. Would that, would yeah, that work? That's, that's and and then idea. I think with whatever um, the city is, the, the city of San Jose is looking at, first of all, there's no sin in there having more money. Right. So right. San Jose can still right. give money, but as you said, we're not holding back while we wait for them to figure it out. But going forward past this single infusion, we ideally have a partnership with all of our cities. Right, that, that's actually brilliant. When this, if we could then, when, we, when the motion screen comes up, the motion I would make would be to, to recommend action that would come back on the 24th to the full board with a delegation of authority so that we can move forward quickly after this and the staff will come back with the source of funds and then that this then be referred also to the health and hospital committee to look at whatever it deems important but also long-term implications if there are other organizations that are that are impacted and any kind of support we can provide relative to communication just as a couple of subjects or a few yeah I, I um couple things. I think there may be um, other clinics in Santa Clara County who receive Title X funds uh, but who are not adversely affected. I'm thinking of the Obria clinics. Does that ring any bells? The what? O-B-R-I-A, Obria. Um, I've seen. Um, anyway, it's just something to look at when we have the larger conversation and they may or may not be affected by virtue of the way in which they do or don't provide services. Oh, that's but, an excellent point. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, then the, the next uh, thing I just, I think would be important to establish is um, at, at what point did the funding flow to Planned Parenthood and or others um, actually stop? So if our goal is to sort of step in um, and make the system whole uh, without a break uh, and without a loss of continuity. Um, my understanding is that Planned Parenthood withdrew from the Title X program rather than comply with the requirements on August the 19th, but I don't know uh, for sure that that's correct. And I also don't know what does that mean in terms of on what day did funding stop flowing. So I just think we just, we, it would be a good thing for us to know as we go forward. And then the last thing is whatever tool we use to try and facilitate this, um, the goal, of course, is to ensure that reproductive health services remain available. So um, while I think we want to be flexible, we do want to make sure that we're clear and specific about the fact that since these funds are being provided to replace lost funding for reproductive health services, that that is what the funding will be used for. As a let me uh, Yeah, it's actually try not to... the sort, if I could just make a point about that, the, the money that is being replaced is federal money that was never used for um, abortion services to my knowledge or hasn't been, at least from my discussions with Planned Parenthood. It is funding that they get to provide services overall to poor women that now has a gag, uh, a gag um, order attached to it, which means that they wouldn't be able to discuss options for women within their their purview. So it really is targeting low-income women who get subsidized for services through um, through Planned Parenthood. At least that's my understanding, but I think the point you're raising is still a valid one. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking at the referral language. Yeah, I, I think be, we may have misspoken it, it, well, on it that. Well, just, it just yeah. may be um, a, a misinterpretation on my part, but um, I just want to make sure that whatever it was that that there's clarity about what the funding is used for, whatever tool we use. Let's Got just it. put it that way. Well said. Dr. Smith. We, we definitely will bring this back to Health and Hospital to elucidate more completely, but um, as the board remembers, the policy change with Title X includes not only um, the funding, but a whole set of prohibitions about communication. And it's not um, participation and getting the funding is conditioned about agreeing to that. Obria is a participant, but they're a so-called pro-life participant, so they have not withdrawn from the program because they're willing to comply with the um, communication issues. Um, 
Planned Parenthood is withdrawing because they're not willing to comply. So we'll, we can go over the details in, in quite a bit of extra detail. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, we could ask the clerk, and I think I should, uh, to please display the voting panel on the screen so that we can let Supervisor Chavez make a motion. Uh, and uh, the second is from Supervisor Allenberg. Thank do, you. Do you want me to repeat the motion, or are you all good? I don't think so. I think, we're, okay. I think we're clear. And we'll and, come uh, back in two weeks, then, and then to you in two weeks. All right, great. Exactly. All right, then we'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen. Uh, before, actually, I cast that vote, I don't believe we have any cards on this item, Madam Clerk. We do not. I just want to confirm that before we vote. All right, all five votes have now been cast, and the motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. All right, that takes us to our next item, and that is uh, item 16, referral on hate crimes. Thank you. Um, so this, re let me just say, this referral, um, and I know we have a council member Esparza here, so I will be brief in my introduction of this so we can get public comment and then hopefully board discussion. Um, as part of, some months ago, all of us received an email from the NAACP asking us to do something similar, which was to create a hate, ki hate crimes um, task force or work group. What, once the Gilroy shootings occurred, it reminded me that in some times, I, I had been thinking that we were in a very safe space. I don't think I'd fully appreciated that we were part of a very angry world with a very angry president that's created an overlay of very angry people in our community. And that it has also given rise to people feeling more comfortable and more confident um, spewing hate in our community and with deadly consequences. So what I'm asking my colleagues for your support on is to allow the county to convene a regional hate crimes task force that will include the city of San Jose and other jurisdictions like the city of Gilroy to develop a clear set of recommendations to address hate and violence incited by our hate speech in our community. The hate crimes task force would be a time limited working group. Second, that the task force will develop recommendations to employ existing and state and federal law that protect women from hate crimes, but also to assess what new policies and legislation may be needed to achieve this end. And the task force will examine the pathology of hate crimes to develop better methods and policies to address them early on. The task force will develop recommendations on investments in law enforcement intelligence to combat the illegal gun trade and to monitor the pro proliferation of hate speech. And the task force will recommend school or school-based programs to promote change in our community. This referral builds upon the sister referral that was put forward by uh, Council Member Esparza, Council Members Esparza, Carrasco, Arenas, and Foley in the city of San Jose. Um, let me just add one other point to this. Some time ago, um, after the 2016 election, Supervisor Cortezi and I um, co hosted a, a, a series of hearings, and one of those hearings was on hate crimes, and it was really clear to us that. There were many people in our community who were very fearful of the changes that were happening um, and, and what they could see on the horizon, even through a very tumultuous election. I, I therefore, um, I wanted to both acknowledge and thank Dave for his vision and seeing this as something that we needed to, to address and then ask my colleagues to allow us to work with staff uh, to create such a task force. If there are questions about the framework, I'm happy to respond to them. Uh, but wanted to also give an opportunity to uh, Council Member Esparza before she had to go back to her board meeting. Thank you very much. We do have one card from Council Member Esparza and colleagues. Uh, with your forbearance, I'd like to call on her just to accommodate uh, her comments since we only have the one card before we weigh in. Council Member, welcome and thank you for your patience today. I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, and as the author, along with my colleagues, um, Councilmember Carrasco, Arenas, and Foley, who are all former school board members, um, we're authors of the sister proposal that will be heard um, at the City Council uh, to establish the Hate Crimes Task Force. Um, on July 28th, my cousin, six-year-old Stephen Romero, was shot and killed. Um, and his mother and grandmother were shot as well. 
And so while we were still reeling from Gilroy, then came El Paso, and then came Dayton. And really there's a common thread behind these attacks, and that's this domestic terrorism, this white nationalism that is really emboldened by the rhetoric that we're seeing from our national leaders. And we have a lot of fear in our communities of color, our immigrant communities, LGBTQ communities, communities of faith, and all the communities that know firsthand the trauma of hate. And so, and in my community, actually, church services are also down because families are afraid, which is remarkable to me. I've never seen that in my lifetime. Basically, we can't wait any longer for our dysfunctional federal government to take action. It's our responsibility here in local government to come together and take action. So I'm here to urge you to support today's hate crimes task force, and I'm ready to stand with you and work with you moving forward to help our community. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg to be followed by Supervisor Cortese to be followed by Supervisor Chavez. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Supervisor Chavez, for bringing uh, forward something very important. And certainly as a member of an historically targeted community, I appreciate your calling out the increasing number of hate crimes and hate-fueled violence. Um, I, I have two questions that I want to ask. Um, one more procedural and one substantive. The substantive one is um, you noted in the language protect women. Is this only geared toward uh, hate crimes against women? No, the reason that um, I, I singled that area out was mostly so it didn't get lost. I think we are used to thinking about this relative to communities of color, but one of the things that we're learning about the pathology of people who kill mass numbers of other people is that they've often had a history of domestic violence, whether it's been with a, 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 a partner, a married partner. So really I wanted to make sure we just didn't ignore women as part of the process. Okay, and I, the, the language maybe needs to be tweaked to, to note that, that it yeah, is that's particularly women, but not only women. And the procedural question, um, I've asked this before in connection with other commissions, but we, we have a human rights commission, and I assume the, the city has something similar. Um, and I'm always concerned that we're not maximizing the use of our commissions. What role do you anticipate them having? I, I do see from your description of the task force that it is perhaps broader than the specific mission of that commission, but I would like I would like the relevant commissions from the county and, and the city to be involved with this process so that we're not creating essentially siloed new organizations or committees that deal with issues that we already have existing bodies to address. So, so I think you raise a good point and I, I, I appreciate the point. I, I think if we want to involve members of those committees on this body or find a way for them to participate, I would ask staff to think about the best way to do that. What I would say is that this is intended to be time limited and frankly, whose attention I need is the, is the, um, our local departments, you know, whether it's police departments, our sheriff's department, our medical department, our mental health services, our public health department to really think about how we can share resources to start to address this. So I think there's a role for everybody in the community and, and frankly part of the reason I didn't spell out everybody who should be on it is I wanted the department, uh, I was hoping our department of um, social equity and, I always get their name wrong, David I'm sorry. Equity, equity and, and social justice. Thank you. Um, equity and social justice would give us feedback so that we could both be inclusive but also be time limited and very disciplined about having concrete recommendations come out of it. Good. I think your, your point about the people that you really want who can make change is something that commissions are often hungry to do and striving for but can't get that attention that you as a supervisor can command. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do think that it's it's important not just casually to have them at the table, but to, and of course I haven't discussed this with them, so <laughs> well, <I'm laughs> hopefully sure they're not excited. now rolling their eyes at me. Yeah, but I, I think that somebody in an official representation from relevant commissions that deal with I any agree. aspect of this yeah, should I agree. be 
intentionally but the, the, affected. I, I totally agree, Susan. I think you're right, and I think that's good feedback. I think the only point I was trying to make is that when there's an when there's a sense of urgency, we want to take advantage of that sense of urgency to, to bring broad Agreed. broad um, strata from the community together to solve problems. But I agree with you as well. Okay. I didn't mean to make it sound so casual, so thank you for that. I'm glad to support it. Thank you again for doing this. Supervisor Cortese. You know, thank you, President Smitty. And I'm very happy to support this and see it coming forward. And um, yes, um, there, were a whole, there was a whole lot of discussion, of course, at the uh, special CSFC meeting on this topic. And um, like many of the issues that we take up as a board, um, it was really an eye opener to see you know, how much is really going on and how little coordination there is. On, on that, in that vein, I just want to suggest um, something that you may already be thinking about or, or were thinking about at the time of, of writing up the referral, Supervisor Chavez, but um, this is that now, assuming this passes uh, a thought for everyone, including the administration, uh, for the report back. Um, there's reference in the, in the referral to you know, firearms, transfers, thefts, um, in, in a sense, kind of either directly or indirectly um, surfacing again that concern of a lack of uniformity in, in terms of how um, state by state, um, if not community by community, firearms are treated. Hate crimes themselves, of course, go far beyond any connection to firearms necessarily. And I appreciated in your memo, you're pointing out that the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation has been more than reluctant to provide data on hate crimes. And I think the important thing that we want to focus in on on that is, you know, that's less of a, of a political beef with the Federal Bureau of, of Investigation and, and more of a concern about the lack of uniformity in, in approach. In other words, if the FBI can't or won't, and I suspect part of their problem is can't, because there's such a there's such a divergence of definition around mm. what hate crimes even are from state to state for them to put together a, a federal report. Mm. I just think it's an opportunity. What I'm getting at here is an opportunity for this task force, you know, to lead. Um, to help lead us as the County of Santa Clara, uh, not only to address things here with our biggest city and the other 14 cities, um, but try to be a national leader to much like we did with the, the Blue Ribbon Task Force to bring in uh, the national folks, to bring in the FBI, to, to ask them, you know, what would we have to do in terms of building a coalition across the country, give, given that the federal government itself is not doing it. Uh, like we have on climate, like we have um, on immigration and other areas, what would be helpful to them so that they could actually, um, you know, generate the kind of, of reports that, that would help us and help law enforcement mm -hmm. um, do a better job of of getting to, to the root of the problem, especially um, where these issues are, are crossing state lines. And I think with... Um, implicit for me, the way I'm listening, and I'm sure I'm biased, but in, in Council Member Sparza's comments is you know, a notion that some of us are concerned about that there's, there's more than coincidence around hate crimes that are happening and popping up, including mass shootings um, from one place to another. Um, but I, I don't think we can put that information or data together without you know, bringing in some sort of federal cooperation, but, but why not? You know, why wouldn't our task force mm -hmm be the one to do that. So, so that's my suggestion. And thank you for bringing it forward. I look forward to voting for it. Thank you. That's an All excellent right. idea. I appreciate that. And Supervisor Chavez, additional comments? I was just going to make the motion. and Then we'll ask the clerk to display the voting panel so that you may. And the voting panel has now been. And I just wanted to make a quick couple comments. Please do. We have the motion by Supervisor Chavez and second by Supervisor Ellenberg. And as part of that motion, I want to make sure that I'm being inclusive of the comments, all comments made by my colleagues, just to give the staff something to work from. You know, I, I, uh, I wanted to really to say a very special thank you, Maya, to you. 
I think, you know, the tremendous loss that your families had um, is really unspeakable. And for you to be thinking broadly about the community at this time just speaks a world to you and, and to your family as well, so thank you. Um, and then to my colleagues, what I wanted to say is that um, one other thing that I hadn't thought about but we'll ask staff to look at is as part of the hate crimes hearings, there were a number of issues and initiatives that, that we started to carry forward. There are some that may be more relevant now, so I would like to make sure that the staff take a look at the, the, um, the referral that came to the board from the hate crimes uh, task force because there was a lot of work done in that instance that, that may have gone to the wayside. So with that, I would make a motion and ask for my colleagues' uh, support, but also to thank you for your very, very thoughtful comments. Thank you. And let me turn to the clerk. Just confirm there are no other speakers on this item. The clerk indicates that there are not. So we will ask all five members to please vote on their screens. That has now been done. So we'll ask the clerk to display the results, and we'll announce that the motion carries 5-0. Thank you again. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, uh, Sue Chavez. That takes us on to the next item. And um, item number 17 was placed on consent. Yes, Madam Clerk. So that takes us then to item number 18. Supervisor Cortese. Yeah, thank you. This is this may be even simpler than it looks. Um, Master Gardner's uh, on multiple occasions. Ma Master Gardner's, uh, as most of you know, um, has set up shop. Um, you know, with county cooperation at Marshall Cottle Park. Um, but they have brought up, uh, at least in my office, on multiple occasions uh, for more than a year now that um, they're interested in some sort of um, agreement and help from the county in terms of um, access road, basically ingress and egress um, to the um, the area of, of the park where they are um, using as a training facility um, with demonstration gardens. So I'm not asking that we build a road or fund a road, um, but it's just one of those occasions with folks coming to my office as an individual supervisor, although we've had some conversations f through my office with with parks and with, and with the other party, the master gardeners, that I felt like it just needed to be surfaced for the board and that I asked for a formal workload assessment. So I'm just asking the administration to come back in 60 days, talk, go talk to them, um, come back in 60 days, see if there's something there um, or some kind of public-private partnership um, that, that might work uh, to, to help improve that area. That's it. So with that, I'd like to move the item. We'll ask the clerk to please display the voting panel on the screen. I do have a question or two, but... Thank you. Um, uh, and I see... Oh, I'm not the only one, apparently, with comments or questions. So uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Cortese and a second by Supervisor Wasserman. And why don't I come down the row and see if Supervisor Wasserman, you have comments or questions? I do, thank you. Go to it. Um, I'm seconding this item that, that's in my district. And um, what we were asking, and I don't know if Mr. Roach is still here or not. He, he is not. What, where's Don? He's sitting in the back. Ah, he's got, ah he's, the computer with legs. He's hiding from you. Uh, the question I had was, um, I know it's my hope, is it your understanding that this particular use of funds, would this be eligible for park funds to pay for this, this improvement? It would be eligible, yes. It's on the park land. We do have an agreement with uh, Master Gardeners to work in partnership with each other where we would, you know, where they would do some capital improvements as well. Okay. That was, that was my my big question. I know we have a certain percentage that's allocated towards acquisitions, a certain percentage that's a allocated towards maintenance, improvements, that type of thing. And I just wanted to, to hear back and thank you for that, that uh, funds would be eligible to do what Supervisor Cortese is suggesting here. So that's my only question. Thank you. I don't see any other lights on, but I'm just going to say I don't, uh, this is a referral to come back with options, so I'm happy to support it. I did not uh, understand it to be a referral specifically calling for the expenditure funds on a particular road. Um, and I'm just, uh, here, here again, I just have to confess a lack of familiarity with the site. I'm looking at the overhead that I have, and I see a pretty good-sized road going right by uh, one end of the rectangle, and then 
a pretty good sized road going into the parking lot on the other side of the rectangle. And I'm sure there's a story which uh, we're not going to hear today uh, about uh, why that still presents access problems. But I'm just, I'm, I gotta say at the moment I'm uh, perplexed. So I'm hoping that when we get the report back within 60 days that Supervisor Cortese described, um, there will be um, some information that reduces my perplexity if there is such a thing um, or perplexedness or whatever it is that's clarifying. Let's put it that way. So we have. When you, and when you get back from Happy Hollow, I can take you over. There you go. That's a, yeah. Yeah. You, you don't want me toiling in the gardens, I can assure you that one. Not produce a good result, I have some reason to believe. Uh, we do have uh, a motion from Supervisor Cortese, a second from Supervisor Wasserman. Uh, we're going to ask all five members please vote on their screens on this referral. All votes have been cast. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. And uh, we can announce that the result is 5-0, as indicated above. Thank you again. All right, that takes us on to item number 19, Supervisor Gorsuch-Hazy. Uh, thank you again, President Committee. 19 is uh, asking us in, uh, to take two possible actions. Um, one is to approve the referral uh, from my office to the administration to submit a letter of interest to Silicon Valley Clean Energy, which is, of course, our CCA that we are bought into, um, relating to re receiving, not giving, um, a reach code grant in the amount of $10,000. So, um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, um, in a I'm sure Supervisor Ellenberg has um, heard some about this as um, uh, the, the primary member representing the board currently. I'm an alternate member, and I think three of us have served on on uh, the CCA board in the past. But uh, in, in recent um, weeks, they have, have offered these grants and um, are just looking to us to accept the grant, which basically requires us to exert some due diligence to, um, which is in part B, to, to try to, to establish the feasibility of adopting electrification reach codes um, uh, as uh, an over and above what we would uh, ordinarily requ require or be required to do um, under the Uniform Commercial Code or, or State Code. So there's no absolute requirement by accepting the money that we modify our codes, but there is a requirement that we um, we study the possibility of, 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 of adopting reach codes um, um, as part of uh, our code, our building permit code. So that is the request. It's certainly something I've talked to uh, the county executive about in advance before bringing this just to make sure it, it seemed like a good idea. And um, my understanding is um, and again, I don't know if Supervisor Ellenberg can shed any light on it, but at this point, uh, our, our other city partners have basically um, all accepted or are in process of accepting the grants. So they're, they're for everybody that's a member of the CCA. Thank you very much. I see Supervisor Ellenberg's light is on. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor Cortese, for um, calling attention to the work that we've been doing. Over the last um, eight months, I've really um, enjoyed serving as a member of the SVCE Board of Directors and have also had an opportunity to serve as an advocate specifically for these codes uh, and more generally to ensure that our county becomes an increasingly valuable ally to sustainable efforts being made uh, across the globe. I realize that these, these codes would only apply um, in unincorporated areas of the county, but I think that it's a good model for us to um, to demonstrate to the other cities, some more eager, some more reluctant, uh, to adopt these codes and really move us toward uh, cleaner energy use across the board. So I'm delighted to support this today. Thank you. In order to allow that, however, we need a panel on our screens that would allow a motion to be made. And we have a motion from Supervisor Cortese and a second from Supervisor Ellenberg. Let me check with the clerk, see if we have any members of the public who wish to speak. We do not. So unless there are additional comments, and there do not appear to be any, we'll ask all five members to vote on the screen. That having been done, we'll ask the clerk to display the results and announce that the motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. That takes us to item number 20, I believe, which is the county executive's report. Yes, Mr. President, as members of the board, I have just two things I wanted to talk about today. I'll start with the bad one and hopefully go to one that could be thought of as good. 
<clears throat> the Trump administration has been more prominent uh, in um, trying to repay California for our challenges to his administration and recently has escalated his uh, attention in this direction, has now directed <clears throat> his staff, Health and Human Services, to come up with a plan to remove homeless individuals from the streets of California cities uh, using federal agents. Um, obviously, we will oppose um, such an intervention, but I wanted to let people know that that's going to be a complex problem if it comes to fruition. <clears throat> Secondly, more <clears throat> a little bit happier, <clears throat> I want to remind the board that yesterday was the 169th anniversary of statehood for the state of California, which was uh, <clears throat> completed with the Compromise of 1850, which was um, a huge, uh, uh, unique effort because it's one of the few um, states that never went through the territory process. It went directly from military state after being purchased from uh, Mexico to a, uh, to a actual recognized state, in the 31st state at the time. <clears throat> As you'll remember, the Compromise of 1850 was during the debate. Not all of us were here then, Dr. Smith. So. <clears throat> Can I just, by the way, you're looking remarkably well preserved for 169. <laughs> Let me just. Well, <laughs> just for fun, because um, the Constitution, first Constitution of California was written in Monterey, and the um, first uh, modification and signature of that uh, Constitution in the legislature happened just downtown. So it's one of our big claims to fame and the whole reason why we have the Capitol Expressway. Uh, but sadly, because um, the rain made the ground muddy, the legislature decided to move from San Jose to Vallejo. <clears throat> same problem, moved to Benicia, same problem, moved to Sacramento, and left the courts behind in San Francisco, and we're the only state in the nation that has a separate Supreme Court location from our legislature. So there's the trivia for you today. <laughs> Thank you. On a more serious note, going, could you go back to your first uh, comment, please, and, and tell us a little bit more about your understanding of uh, what the Trump administration has proposed and what the um, timeline looks like on that? We don't have a timeline, but back in July, the Trump administration's, well, the president started criticizing Speaker Pelosi and the California delegation for any manner of multiple issues, um, including homelessness, particularly homelessness in San Francisco. Uh, but as you well know, all of our major cities have a major homeless problem. Um, apparently, at that time, he began to explore with his administration options for federal intervention and just uh, recently was publicized, or I should say um, evidence was collected that he's actually directed staff to come up with a plan to uh, use federal agents to come in and, and remove homeless individuals from our streets. Uh, we don't have a timeline, um, and we don't know whether this is just, you know, boisterous talk or an actual reality, but I think it's significantly a threat and obviously affects us dramatically if it did happen. Thank you. I'm going to look to my own staff in uh, the chambers and uh, ask that we make sure the item is on our Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force agenda. Uh, just for any follow-up that may or may not be available based on what information may or may not be forthcoming. Uh, thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Just a, a quick follow-up. When, when, um, when do your meetings occur? Are they regular? They, um, we, we are sort of in a period of transition. We've been, uh, historically we've been doing them sort of monthly and that seemed necessary during the early year days of the administration when 
there was um, there were a series of uh, troubling initiatives that were coming fast and furious, for lack of a better expression. Um, we have uh, since gone to uh, every other month fr uh, from time to time, uh, and it's uh, a little bit as needed. Uh, you know, if we need more than that, we can do more than that. But you know, we don't have meetings just to have meetings. But as I said, during the first couple of years, there was clearly a, a workload, a lot, a lot coming. So. Just one request I wanted to make is that at at some point in the next few months, it would be great to get an update on the work that you've already done and what we anticipate the work to look like. I'm particularly concerned about the waiver um, debate and discussion and the implications of that for the county budget. And so I know you're going to be taking that on. I think, and I know the health and hospital will be taking that on. But some of those issues probably just need to be crystallized for the whole board. Okay. Right. Yeah, we thank will. You. All right. Uh, without objection, we will consider the county council, excuse me, the county executive's report received and we'll go to the county council. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session of September 9, 2019. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, and colleagues, that would take us to item number 22, which is the start of our jail reform status report. I'm wondering, however, given the number of items in that uh, long list, if it might not be uh, well advised to simply say, let's take that 15 minute recess that we talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Wasserman, does that work for you? It appears to be. Then folks, I know some of you are waiting for that item and my apologies that we can't do everything all at once, but um, I think uh, if we'll give the board a 15 minute recess and uh, members of the public a 15 minute recess, uh, we'll be back just a little bit after 1215 and uh, we stand in recess until that time. Thank you.
Sometimes they work. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if we could ask the chambers to come to order and if we could ask members of the board to please return to the chambers. Supervisors are within the sound of my voice. If they could please return to the chambers, we would appreciate that. Thank you. Colleagues, again, we are at uh, item 22. This is the study session on jail reform. And we have a number of related items that are also on our agenda. But I'm hoping we will take a few minutes under item 22 to actually sort of talk more broadly, generically about sort of where we are in this effort and how we want to continue to stay on top of it going forward. So, um, Dr. Smith, you're appointing me to Ms. Wapensky, yes? Martha Wapensky, Deputy right. County Executive, will start off things and then we'll go where the board wants us to go. Please do. Go All right, us. as the PowerPoint comes up, I'm gonna ask the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with the Sheriff's Office over here. Good afternoon, Captain Thomas Duran. Good afternoon, Captain Christopher Grumbos, Personnel, Backgrounds and Recruiting. Good afternoon, Captain Tim Davis, Elmwood Complex. Melanie Jimenez Perez. Dr. Nathaniel Whips, Custody Behavioral Health. Roger Sue, Fleet and Fleet. Tony Fleece, County Executive's Office. And then also joining us, if there's any questions, is Cheryl Sola from the Management Audit Team. So back in March 2016, you'll recall that the board requested quarterly study sessions for updates on jail reform efforts from the uh, departments you see here in front of you. This is the 11th such quarterly study session. The study session has 13 different agenda items, as you can see, with obviously some of them went on the consent calendar. Item 22 is a joint report from the Sheriff's Office Custody Health, FAF. Um, and will be covered by the PowerPoint in front of you. And it's basically the status of the 80 summarized recommendations on jail reforms. The other items for this study session are uh, reports and other actions taken on the jail reforms. The board packet in item 22, I want to point out, contains updates to the summarized recommendations in red, the status of related jail capital projects, and a list of jail reform related board referrals that the departments are currently working on. You've seen this slide before, just so just pointing out as within previous study sessions, I'm gonna start out talking about the status of the jail fee reforms recommendations. We'll also cover any funding that have been put forward for these rec uh, reforms since we last met. And then each department's gonna talk about their accomplishments and future plans. This slide is more for uh, historical purpose, so I won't go into details. It's the work uh, and the momentum that continues on jail reforms since the board approved them uh, over two years ago. Out of these meetings, there have been 197 requests for information from the board and the department sitting here in front of you have responded to 173 of these. I wanna highlight two referrals that are going on right now. In August, the board made several referrals regarding jail construction around cost increases, timelines, operational impacts, and such. Administration's working to bring a report back in October and then also quarterly updates to Public Safety and Justice Committee. The second thing I wanna highlight is the jail management system. The project was reactivated as we told you about back in February 2019. The vendor and county staff spent the first few months ramping up to get the project back on track. Uh, last month, the board approved two change orders and the projected timeline for completion is now summer of 2020. And just a reminder that stakeholder groups at all levels of the organization and departments continue to meet to address the ongoing reform initiatives as well as the implementation of the consent decrees. You've seen this slide before. It's also posted on the jail reforms website. 43 of the 80 summarized recommendations have been complete. There's still a lot of work to do, but I can't emphasize enough the work done by the departments you see sitting in front of you today. 
With that, Tony will cover the actions taken by the board since our last study session on the next slide. So this slide has information on the jail reforms website, which we continue to update with any new and updated information, including what's new, the archive, and also any updates to summarize recommendations. And then this and the next four slides cover funding and action since the last study session on March 19th, and the two slides after that cover actions in the budget. So in the interest of time with a busy agenda, we're happy to not cover these slides unless there's a desire. Colleagues? No, I think we've, we've got them and we're good, so thank you okay. for that. Okay, with that then we'll hand this over to the Sheriff's Office to continue. Good afternoon. I'm Captain Duran and I oversee the Support Services Division. The Sheriff's Office has continued to maximize out of cell time and structured programming for all inmates. Closing W1 at the Elmwood facility and moving those inmates to M1 was a huge step towards this goal. We also work to integrate protective custody females into general population. As of today, we only have one female inmate and six male inmates who are unable to be out of cell with other inmates. We also are working on, uh, we are also working to change our programming curriculum and scheduling to ensure maximum participation. Our revised programs at a glance will be available on the Sheriff's Jail Reforms website soon and we'll send an off agenda report to the board letting them know, letting them know when the new schedule is live. Good afternoon again. I'm Captain Christopher Grumbos and I oversee the Sheriff's Office Personnel Backgrounds and Recruitment Unit. Uh, here's an updated chart of our progress hiring for the custody academies. Uh, public Safety and Justice has, been, uh, has seen this format in our quarterly updates. Uh, it highlights custody academies through the fiscal year. Uh, we just graduated 40 cadets on Thursday, uh, 20 of those being assigned to Maine Jail and 20 to the Elmwood facility and then they're all distributed evenly between all of the shifts to increase our coverage. We continue to recruit for the maximum number of qualified candidates and can have continued to make great progress towards that. We look forward to the results of the staff and analysis and are working with the county executive's office on a higher ahead program. Hi, my name is Nathan, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Woods, and I'll be talking about uh, Custody Health Services. So currently right now, Custody Health Services in the Sheriff's Department is in collaborations with uh, County Council to revise our, pol our current policies to meet the ADA mandates. Uh, policies are also being re revised for Custody Health Services to meet uh, compliance with the remedial plan as well. <clears throat> currently right now, we are looking at implementing a white card electronic pilot study, which will kick off sometime within the next few months. Custody Health Services is also in collaboration with uh, Custody Bureau to start uh, allowing or providing information or notices to um, inmates um, in advance, 24 hours in advance, so they would be aware of clinical services so we can improve our compliance rate. Custody Health Services is also working with reentry and SSA to ensure that we can um, pr improve our protocols for Medi-Cal applications prior to release. With regards to uh, medication improvements, uh, we have made improvements in three different areas for medication compliance. Um, if, regarding um, cardiac medications, we improved from a 32% rate to a 63% rate. With regards to cardiovascular medications, we went from a 30% rate to a 69. And then finally, psychotropic medications, 27% rate to a 61% rate, which I feel are significant improvements, and we hope to improve those numbers as we move forward. Also, the acute psych team had implemented a unit-based team to improve our reports in the morning and communication to ensure um, information is related to improve our patient care. Also, we have, since we've placed psychiatrists in our booking area, we have managed to uh, decrease 
emergent behavioral consult request being the fact that the psychologists have been present, uh, the psych excuse me, the psychiatrists have been present at the time and we were able to see them immediately instead of them having to wait over a period of time. And I'm speaking about one of the programs. This is the STEP program, which is for substance use inside custody. And this particular program has been very effective in this first year. So you can see that we've had over a thousand referrals and many people have been screened. We've been successful in, in placing people into treatment and into recovery residences. So those numbers for the population we're serving is, are quite positive. Um, the other thing that's happened over the summer is in addition, we're adding the STEPS program to serve female and LGBTQ inmates over at the Elmwood Correctional Center. Rogers Hoof, Season Fleet. Status of projects, new main jail south, where bridging doctors are complete. We've updated signs to the board in December 2018 and currently in review with the state. We hope to advertise RFP to fall 2019 and the payment of the old main jail south continues and is to be followed with the demolition in fall 2019. Main jail north dental suite, construction is in progress and scheduled complete December 2019. Suicide prevention, barrier systems are complete for Elmwood and Main Jail North, and the working housing units are scheduled with ADA improvements to minimize disruption to housing units. Schedule is complete 2022 due to phasing of work. Americans with Disabilities Act work, Main Jail North quick fixes are 100% complete. Quick fixes construction have started in the following units and are about 45% complete. Main Jail North 8A, Women's W2, and Elmwood's M8. Construction is scheduled to complete 2022. Main Jail North and Elmwood Correctional Health Admin. Construction is 32% complete with completion scheduled for February 21. Uh, recent facilities and fleet project actions and with Westgate Harney designs are complete, but we are rescoping due to the budget. And with ADA Path of Travel designs, designs are complete and permit is is complete. Uh, physical work is still start is at space to start 2022. And what's uh, service model and operational plan swap is in progress and scheduled complete spring of 2020. That completes the presentation. We'll go ahead and take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, we have a number of individual items coming up uh, as you <coughs> as you know on our agenda that are connected to our uh, jail reform efforts and just our, our efforts in the jails more broadly than that. Um, Ms. Popinski, I wanted to sort of start the conversation off by just saying um, I uh, think I was the one who asked uh, that we commence these quarterly um, study sessions in order to make sure that we didn't lose uh, impact, uh, or lose attention or focus rather on uh, jail reform. Uh, I want in a minute, as I mentioned earlier, to sort of have some discussion about sort of more broadly where are we because we're pretty deep into the details here and I know that that's what all of you have to do on a daily basis, so thank you for that. But I want to kind of raise the conversation up a little bit. Before I do that, however, I do want to turn to members of the public who've turned cards in. So I want to call Angela King, Anthony Walters, and Ron Hansen, and I believe those are the only cards we have so far on this item. If you would like to speak to this item, that's number 22, please turn your cards in uh, now because we're gonna finish with public comment and then bring the matter before our board uh, to receive the report formally. Come on up, Ms. King. Welcome. Hang on just a moment, please, Ms. King. We're gonna reset your time. There is a microphone built in, but you just sort of need to speak straight ahead. It's right there in front of you at the top of, nope, right at the top of that black, there it is, that's it. But we're also okay. gonna ask the clerk to Ooh, make sure that you okay. can be heard. Go to it. Okay, so I'll try and be quick. Um, uh, what I've been doing is meeting RNPA, myself, um, representing the nurses, um, for some core issues that 
we ethically feel are very important. I'm going to bring up a few of those. Um, one of them is 24-hour uh, MD coverage. Um, between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m., we have no doctor coverage. Nurses make all the medical decisions on 5,000 inmates, um, which uh, <clears throat> is clearly out of their scope. We have had problems. Um, and I know that Dr. Cherney has put in a um, recommendation for an urgent care, 24-hour urgent care, and I'm just waiting for that to be approved. The second is uh, we have an infirmary and we have an uh, eighth floor acute psych unit. We've asked for a full-time janitor during the day to be able to clean the cells of these patients. All of these patients are either physically or mentally incapable of keeping even a rudimentary um, clean environment. What happens is when someone's going to tour, there's a mass cleanup, the tour happens, and then people like me who are in the grassroots see the reality. Um, and I have been told that that is something that uh, Department of Corrections will not approve, and I'm asking for them to reconsider. Um, we have uh, severely mentally um, ill patients on the fourth floor. We are uh, administering medications to them in a very unsafe manner. I'm going to run over. Can I have two more minutes? I'm afraid not, but there might be a follow-up question from a member of our board. Okay. All right. I didn't... Okay. Let me help here. What other concerns do you have that you'd like to share with us today? Thank you. I won't take up a lot. So um, it, these, these patients, we've had 17 nurses walked off for um, situations that have happened in the custody setting. Um, there is no Excuse my interruption. There's what, no is, verbal what does that mean? You said walked, walked off? Walked off. They're on administrative leave where they've been fired. Because? We're, various reasons but what i'm saying is if we had 24-hour physician that was available to us we wouldn't be making decisions that can just provide our license on the fourth floor we are administering medications to our most severely mentally ill patients uh, in a way that we have no idea if they're actually taking the medication What's a high risk to get walked off? They're hoarding their medication. They take it all. They overdose. They die. My responsibility for having given them these pills. Got it. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. And I asked eight months ago for language lines and a sign language laptop in booking and in the clinics. This is a very high risk also for patients. We are putting them on speakerphone. Every time I interview a patient down in booking, I am violating HIPAA, HIPAA regulations, and I am also at risk of a patient not divulging to me their uh, medical conditions because they don't want it blasted. Okay, I'm um, gonna say, I have to say thank you at this point because we've gone well over time. I wanted to give you an opportunity okay, to- Okay, I'm so to sorry. No, if you have information in writing, Either now you can give it to the clerk, she'll copy it and make sure we all get copies, or if you'd like to pull it together in notes uh, for items particularly that you couldn't get to, if you get it to the clerk of the board, uh, we will request that she share it with all five members of the Board of Supervisors. I, okay. okay, all right, sorry. Good. No, 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 thank you very much. Mr. Walters and Mr. Hansen, please come on up. <clears throat> Good afternoon, supervisors and community. RNPA has many concerns that we would like you to address, and patient safety is at the top of our list. Excuse me for not introducing myself. My name is Anthony Walters, Association Representative for the Registered Nurses Professional Association. As I said, patient safety is at the top of our list, number one. Nurses are regularly being scheduled for double shifts. They're extremely overworked and tired. Number two. RNPA has recently received more assignment despite objection forms than ever before in its 40 year history. This means that nurses are documenting unsafe assignments and reporting them to management. Three, 
there aren't any doctors, as you've heard, on call for medical consultations after 10 p.m. This is not sustainable, nor does it address whole patient care. Four, our nurses have complained about the staffing shortage at several Board of Supervisors meetings, and some have recorded speeches asking you to solve these problems. Patient safety is in jeopardy, and your immediate action is needed. We know that you understand the severity of these issues, and we ask for your continued commitment to improving our custody health care system. Please consider implementing patient ratios in our custody health settings. I thank you again for your support for our nurses in the County of Santa Clara. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hansen, you're up next, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ron Hansen. I'm a field aide with PACT, People Acting in Community Together. I'm speaking here to item A, summarized recommendations, OVR 1 through 4. Many here will recall that leading the large list of jail reforms put forward by the Blue Ribbon Commission, among others, was the need for a jail and sheriff's office oversight body, and also the need to examine and possibly modify the current joint sheriff and Department of Correction operation of the jail. Unfortunately, three and a half years after the cessation of the Blue Ribbon Commission, and nearly five months after receiving the report of the evaluation committee, I and others hope that the board is about ready to move forward with a contract for the Office of Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring, OCLEM. The establishment of this office is all the more important because for the last year, the Sheriff's Office has refused to meet with community members on jail-related re matters. We urge the board to move forward with all deliberate haste to establish and appoint the Office of Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring. Thank you. Thank you. On that point, uh, colleagues, uh, I can report to you all, forgive me, I should be speaking into the microphone. I can report to you all that Supervisor Chavez and I, uh, who are your ad hoc uh, task force on this item, um, have received the comments from the evaluation committee or the review committee, I forget the proper terminology, that reviewed uh, proposals from a number of possible consulting firms that might serve as our, um, believe it or not, we already call the acronym OCLEM for Office of Civilian Law Enforcement Monitoring. Uh, and uh, we think we are going to be ready, Supervisor Chavez, correct me if I'm wrong, at the first meeting in October to come forward with a recommendation. We have some interviews we'd like to conduct as uh, members of the board on your behalf, uh, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to come to you at the first meeting in October with a recommendation to direct staff at that time. So thank you for the prompt. You anticipated an announcement that would have been forthcoming. So there we go. More broadly, uh, colleagues, um, and Ms. Wapinski, I'll turn to you and Dr. Smith. I think um, three years into this exercise, uh, we have, um, that the strength and the weakness of the effort is perhaps the same, and that is that, uh, as the enclosure points out, we have 623 recommendations from 15 different sources that are grouped into 80 summarized recommendations within 13 categories. I think we have to be careful that we don't, as we look point by point by point, to make sure that there's follow-up, which we have to do, that we sort of don't lose track of the bigger picture, and I am anxious that these study sessions have become increasingly granular rather than sort of big picture opportunities to assess how we doing on issues like civilian oversight, on issues like custody health more broadly, on issues, and so on. There, the 13 categories was an effort, I think, to help us do that if only we would take that opportunity. I also think that um, it's probably time, uh, and uh, forgive me, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, but it's probably time for us to try and push some of this conversation into the policy committee level uh, at the Public Safety and Justice Committee so that you and Supervisor Wasserman can hear some of this at greater length. I, I want to be clear, I don't think we should stop having these report backs or study sessions at the full board level, but I think we need to find a way here to make them more than sort of a check the box opportunity for the board or a sort of report from all of you about every one of the 623 items. So I'm just gonna let it go there for the moment because I know my colleagues are gonna wanna share uh, their thoughts about this as well, but I'm hoping that before we take action today to receive the report, we um, have uh, spent a little time thinking about how do we move forward to stay on top of these issues um, in a 
a sort of a more um, comprehensive way and slightly less line by line by line. Supervisor Cortese, Chavez, and uh, Ellenberg in that order, please. Oh, thank you, President Smithian. Yeah, I, I like the idea of, um, of the committee work being done, and, and I think that might also create another opportunity uh, for employees, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, rank and file, um, employees who are, you know, doing the day-to-day -day work um, as, as directed by management or as uh, directed by these recommendations to be able to, um, you know, give some kind of rolling feedback as to how things are really working or maybe some things that might not be explicitly called out in the summary of recommendations but are, are sort of a nuance that, go, that would need to go along with that. I think some of the, um, uh, what I was hearing from the speakers, I've heard in, um, in small group discussions myself with uh, nurses particularly, I'm just going to use the dispensation of, of meds as a, um, you know, not as a staffing issue in the sense of meet and confer and collective bargaining and do we need more staff and some of the, some of the things that are outlined in this report in terms of future um, staffing increases. And I understand that we're in the middle of collective bargaining um, negotiations all the while, but I think there's some issues around staffing practices that people see happening, like how, we're, how we are dispensing drugs that would require an adjustment operationally um, aren't really necessarily, um, it shouldn't be probably meet and confer or collective bargaining items or items that get um, called out you know, with neon lights as, as part of the analysis of implementation of the recommendations. So, I would like to see, and I've t t talked to um, our county executive, Dr. Smith, about this, some kind of a, I, you know, I, I kind of want to say a, a technical advisory committee that involves employees who are, are trying to pull off some of these practices, trying to actually do these things, um, you know, or m maybe more informally, um, you know, the, the executive himself or, or his designees just in, in more of a brown bag type of environment, um, just sitting down and saying, what are, you, what are you seeing? Where, you know, where are the, um, the glaring issues in, from your standpoint? And, you know, how do we sort of bring, bring these, all these recommendations to life when it comes down to what it's like to actually um, function in the, you know, the day in the life of a nurse or the day in the right life of a correctional officer. If that's already happening, I guess it would be good to hear that, but it's, it's, it's a discussion that we've had, I've had, again, in small group discussions with some of the employees, um, which had no, no collective bargaining import at all um, or substance, um, just sort of concern um, in compassion for the quality of the work that they're delivering. And according to them, it doesn't have that kind of an outlet. And I, I feel that way as a supervisor sometimes, and I'm sure some of my colleagues have experienced this. Sometimes you feel like people are coming to you not because they're trying to go over anyone's head or end run the process or anything like that, but they just don't know where in the process do they, are they able to make these recommendations other than dropping something in a, you know, in a suggestion box, uh, you know, or writing another email? Where, where can there be actual two-way communication around, you know, sort of around a small table and a round table style um, where we can get to, to some of these um, maybe lesser but still critical uh, issues when it comes to everyone's well-being and safety. Supervisor. So I, I, don't, I don't, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. And I, I, was, I was kind of fishing for the county executive as well to, to indicate whether or not that can be done and, and without commingling that with collective bargaining processes that are underway and clearly yeah. setting up a separate advisory Colleagues, process. before we go, go forward, I, Supervisor um, Chavez is next in line. 
That being said, I see that Supervisor Ellenberg wants to comment, I think, on this particular Just piece of the conversation. And I know that Supervisor Cortese was looking to our county executive. So Supervisor Chavez, if I can ask you to pause for a moment. Let's hear briefly from Supervisor Ellenberg, let uh, Dr. Smith uh, chime in. Then I'm going to go back to Supervisor Cortese to make sure that he doesn't have any additional comments or questions. And then we're going to go to Supervisor Chavez, who theoretically is next in line. Thank you, Thank and, you. And, and I apologize for the interruption. Um, Supervisor Cortese, I wanted to note that that, 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 <laughs> that was not my intent. Um, but just to note that the very kind of group that you're describing um, actually does exist. The challenge that they are facing, um, as I think Ron Hansen mentioned, is that the, uh, their um, previously regularly scheduled meetings uh, with the sheriff were terminated a number of months ago. And I'm, I wonder if perhaps the, the buildup in what you're hearing is, is at least indirectly a result or partially a result of those meetings being suspended. And, and I have asked at uh, PSJC uh, before, and I, I will ask again now if um, the sheriff through her representatives here would reconsider meeting with that group of community advocates and constituents um, regularly to address on the ground, in the moment, issues that people are seeing. Through the chair, are you looking for a response now? Or I'm sorry, I'm seeing different messages. I would love a response. So, of course, Sheriff is not here today. We will take that back to her and explain to her. I know we have provided an off-agenda response, but that was a couple months ago, so we will revisit the issue. Thank you. Dr. Smith, and then I want to go to Supervisor Cortese and then Supervisor Chavez. <clears throat> um, I heard uh, Supervisor Cortese uh, suggest a meeting on a regular basis with uh, nursing staff and medical staff and uh, custody. And I do meet on a regular basis with RMPA, but it's in my office. So I think what I'll do in response to your request, is set up meetings um, on a monthly basis at the jail. We'll probably rotate back and forth between main jail and, and uh, Elmwood and do exactly what you're talking so I can get a feel myself of ex what's going on and uh, make an appropriate action. It, to me, that sounds fine. And um, President Zeminian, as far as um, I think what, why you were coming back to me, I, I, I mainly want to surface the issue and make sure like I said, that there's an appropriate place for these things to go. And I don't think that should exclude the committee or the Board of Supervisors kind of mirroring what you said earlier. But I, it feels like there needs to be technical folks. I've never really been entirely comfortable um, just really because of the 30,000 foot altitude I'm at most of the time, understanding you know, when you get into these kind of custody health issues about things like delivering meds, you know, who is, who is in charge and, and who should be running that, you know, I, I could imagine in my imagination, wildest imagination, the sheriff saying, I'm more than happy to do what I can, but I don't really have the expertise myself or the, um, um, or perhaps even the authority, you know, to, to dictate exactly how meds are dispersed. You know, I can imagine that. Um, but that's not to say the sheriff shouldn't be there so that if there's a decision about how meds should be dispersed that somebody can who's in charge of of folks in the jail can make sure it actually happens that way so i i, I just I appreciate the county executive stepping up and leaning in on the issue and saying he's willing to you know to conduct those meetings a little bit differently it sounds like a little bit more openly because i just think there's a piece of it that's going to require the medical expertise that you have and that your side of the operation has. And I, when I say medical, I mean across the board, mental health and physical health. Thank you. And, and thank you, Supervisor Ellen Burke, for reminding me about that other process that's broken down. Thank you. I'm just asking uh, <clears throat> Dr. Woods to 
work with my office to set it up. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Duly noted. I think that takes us now to Supervisor Chavez to be followed by Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Smith, I here's a concern that I have that I, I would love to get your thoughts on. As it relates to medical in the jails, I, I have been party to a lot of discussions with um, with the staff here, with with RNPA, we've taken a tour, we met, we've had a lot of conversations. So I, what I'm concerned about is that the gray area between whose job is what needs to be more clearly um, refined and defined um, <coughs> within, even within the, the jails themselves in terms of whose job certain topics fall under. And so what I wanted to do was just give you the, the list of issues that have come up and ask if, as you meet with folks, if you could at some point come back um, to the board, and it could be through public safety and justice, but really defining so we know who, who to hold accountable for what part of the what part of the challenges in the jail. So let me go through this list and then maybe you could, as you all go through um, these meetings and you resolve them, that you know you can say, okay, and this is a person who's gonna be responsible. So um, medical coverage in the jails, not just the missing time that we don't have a doctor on site, but making sure that we have doctors available during the times we're supposed to have them, even now. Um, we were getting feedback that, that they're not always available, and when they are available, they don't come in, even if they're supposed to, when, we're at, when a nurse is asking them to. Um, second, whose responsibility is it to maintain the cleanliness of a cell, and are we anticipating that cells in a medical bay should have a certain level of cleanliness as if it were um, a hospital or a medical facility. Um, medication, the challenges around dis dispatching medication in a, in a place as complicated as a jail and whether or not there are pro process improvements that need to be implemented and laid out and what would those look like and again whose responsibility is to track that and make sure that we're, we're doing it. The protection of HIPAA, and I think this is a complicated one because there's the language lines that were, were described earlier, but I also think that in some ways we're asking custody staff to interact with um, inmates when they don't have a full knowledge of their medical needs, which could actually be very important, and how do we, important knowledge for them to have, and so how do we share data in an appropriate way that's HIPAA compliant, but that doesn't presume there's always a wall between one party or another, depending on the role they're playing in our custody environment. When we have um, needs for equipment for patients, whose responsibility is it to make sure that the equipment's available, that the patient has access to it, and how does that get in and out of the facility in a timely fashion? And then overall, from a medical perspective, the, the, um, how, how the structure of the medical work can be aligned to some broader goals. And this actually goes back to the point that, um, that Supervisor Samidian raised at the top of this, this discussion, which is the part of the reason we end up talking about the details of all of these things is very simply that we get calls and complaints, my office, and I know all of our offices do, about, the, about things that are happening in the jail. And when we call to get something addressed, not always resolved to anybody's satisfaction per se, but to just get it addressed, it's sometimes very difficult to find out or even to get a response that's, oh, I got this, and this is why we're not gonna do it this way, or this is who it goes to. And it, and it made me think a question about just medical in general. You really, under your leadership, and almost immediately, you started to fund um, and really brought to the board ideas about what needed to be fundi funded at what level. And now that we've been in it a few years, where are we? Are we where you wanted us to be, uh, Dr. Smith? And what are the goals that we should be using to determine 
that we're doing what we need to be doing in the jails relative to any subject, but medical in particular is one that's caught my attention. So I feel like all of these issues I have heard about, almost all of the issues someone has given me feedback about how they could be addressed, and literally none of them have been addressed to date in a way that it seems like all parties say, oh yeah, we're, we're moving in the right direction. So I know that's a lot. I'm happy to give you my list. And I can also give you the letters of, uh, that we've gotten because I think it might help, help. But I'm really interested in what should our expectations be for medical services? How do we measure them? And how do we know that we're on track? Um, we'll do that and discuss that in the committee. Um, I hate to even say this, but um, how would the board feel about me coming back with a recommendation to change the authority of the director of the Department of Corrections? Because <laughs> you have the authority to change it. Right now, the way it's written into ordinance, it's limited, which sort of makes it hard to do all the things that you're talking about, but it could be changed. And I'm not polling the board, but I'm just giving you a heads up. I might come back and ask for that. Well, I think, Dr. Smith, as you, in all sincerity, as you, because no one's diving on their microphone, but I, in all sincerity, Joe, I think. Joe is about ready. Oh, are you? I'll, no, I'll have some thoughts in a moment. <laughs> okay, but, but what, uh, I was, what I was actually going to say is that if we were to t take a giant step back from all the reforms that we've been working on now for, I don't know how many years, but, but, but pr prior to the death of Michael Tyree, I think Supervisor Simidian was working on one set of reforms. I, I know Supervisor Cortez was working on another, and I still on a whole nother that, that we were being kind of all kind of pulling on what do, we, what do we do here. So I guess the question I would ask is, as we get through this set of, of um, reports, I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what are the goals and objectives that we're trying to meet, and what's the best way to do it? Because in my mind, the, the conversation we haven't had is, okay, we know on average we have X amount number of people who um, have significant medical issues, and one thing we know about inmates is a lot of them are really sick, and so we, we, get, we get really unhealthy people, and how, how, what is our responsibility to their health, and what's our, our goals? Other thing is reentry. Like, what's our objective for recidivism? Like, we're going to do, we're doing all this work in the jails. We want to do training. We want to do child, child uh, development. We want to make sure people see their children. What should our expectation be relative to recidivism? I think those broad questions, and I think that's a little bit of what, when Joe was saying, you know, we're getting into the weeds, and I know you don't want me saying how many doctors and why isn't that doctor picking up the phone, but that's my metric right now for what, is or isn't working in custody. We'll, we'll do what you said and come back with a report and try to address both your concerns and uh, President Smidian's concerns and, uh, well, actually the full board's concerns that we have a broader, more um, big picture policy discussion rather than uh, lots of details so we can see the forest rather than the trees. Did you want to respond just to this point? Because I actually have a couple other things I'd like no, to No, I, I, I have some thoughts. I'll uh, share them in a few minutes, but I want to let you finish your thoughts. Thank you again for your patience earlier. And then I want to go to Supervisor Ellenberg, whose light is on as well. Great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just ask a little bit about the the staffing and, and say two things. One, good job getting caught up. That was... I know you haven't all slept in a long time trying to make that happen. When you were talking about a strategy for hiring ahead, what's that, what do you anticipate that need is? And particularly because I saw that vacancy numbers had that asterisk about you know, retirements and people leaving that, you know, something we don't always have control over. Absolutely, no, we've, uh, our team has done a great job with, with getting these uh, deputies hired. Um, we're, we're constantly looking at our, our vacancies and having to uh, look at that and, with, and how many we hire. And uh, the issue with the retirements is we, 
we know how many can retire, mm -hmm. but when that happens, uh, it's anybody's guess, right? They don't often tell us, you know, a, a year in advance that they're going to be leaving us. So uh, with the hiring ahead, it would allow a buffer in the sense that if we were to go over those allotted vacancies that, you know, in the anticipation of those uh, retirements come in that we, you know, people wouldn't uh, be without a job once we hired them. Is the idea that, and I don't know if Dr. St if you all have come up with an agreement, but is the idea that you want to be hiring 5% ahead or 10%? Do you, have you all made, a, so you're still in negotiations about that? That okay. is correct. Because the one, th there were two issues I just wanted to raise relative to that. One, I, I think we, in a number of areas, hiring ahead is just, it's just smart and um, and this is one of those areas. The second is I know that we have had a broader discussion around um, issues that would make it easier for recruitment and the retention of um, employees, particularly folks who are responsible for raising their kids. And so I know that one of the issues is that we are, I think um, ESA is doing a, a broad study relative to childcare. Um, one thing I wanted to ask all of you is to make sure that you are making sure your employees respond to what that, what their needs are relative to that. And there are two in particular that I, I I'm a little confused about how they would work. And one is um, overnight childcare, you know, for people who are working swing shifts. But the other is sick childcare. And I know the city of San Jose took a look at that a number of years ago, and we didn't really have much success. We were really focused on public safety because their hours were so wacky and when people have to go to court and testify, all of that kind of thing. But I, I just want to make sure that you are really encouraging your folks to give us ideas about childcare in particular, if that's really a core need, which I know the sheriff has asked us about, but I'm not so, I, I, I don't know how big that need is relative to your ability to hire and retain. Absolutely. Thank you. And then the last thing I wanted to ask about is that we had, um, I am very interested in making sure that the, that we're, that we're doing um, as much as we can to make sure that we're, we're having a continuity of services for people inside the jail and outside the jail. And I mention that because I know we have a rule about who can and can't volunteer in the jails and many other jails, San Mateo, San Quentin, Santa Cruz, and LA, will allow for people who've had a felony conviction if they think that, if they've cleared the um, uh, background checks, you know, if it was something that was long ago and not as serious, or I guess all felonies are serious, but something that would still allow them to be a good peer mentor or to provide <coughs> services. And I wonder if that's a discussion that you all have had because we've had some security issues or if it's something that, um, that you all are thinking about as it relates to volunteers and service providers in the jail. Supervisor Chavez, I'll take the first half of the question first. So one of the pluses about the new first five contract is we're working with <coughs> the Entry Resource Center to make sure that the curriculum we're using is compatible inside and outside. So Great. if an inmate is released and they've got two weeks left, they can pick that up. So that's the first step towards moving. That's the first kind of curriculum that is in stone. And as for the second part, we are still in the process of instituting our new two-year background clearance process with, with all of our volunteers and all of our contractors. And it is following the, the standards that you outlined, but we can also continue to talk with county council and see if they have any additional recommendations. Right, and let me be clear, safety is first, and I'm not trying to compromise that. It's very, really a genuine question as to whether or not we're missing good programming because of it. So I'm, I'm really interested in your, your thoughts on that. And the last thing that, um, I, I know that was my last question, but one thing I wanted to ask Dr. Smith, at some point as we're listening to all of these reports, I know that um, you all have a process of your, based on a referral we gave was doing a, um, a jail staffing study and I was just curious about when that was gonna come back if you knew. But I thought I'd just give you a shot, a chance to find the right person while other people are asking their questions. So at this point, it looks like uh, late fall, early winter, it'll come back. <coughs> oh great, good, good, thank you. Supervisor Allenberg. Uh, thank you. I. 
agree that some of this, and, and certainly at this level of granular detail, should be in front of PSJC, and glad to take that on. But I will note that so many of the things that we're talking about and so much of our job will be greatly enhanced and facilitated by hiring an OCLEM person. And I, I heard you say that, they'll, that you'll come back with a recommendation the first meeting in October. I want to thank you for that and also encourage you with all my heart to not delay beyond that. Let's get this person in place. That's the expertise that we, are, that we lack and, and I think will, an, will help us answer a lot of our questions, also help to really uh, monitor the feedback and that would be the person I would think to, uh, to then go to with a lot of these concerns and issues. So again, just... Um, strong encouragement to get that to us as soon as possible and let's and let's move ahead um, <clears throat> well I it, at one level I think this uh, this item's been uh, all over the place uh, at another level, I think that's a very constructive development because while it may not seem terribly focused uh, to some of you, uh, I, I joke that every now and again you go to a board meeting and a conversation breaks out. Uh, and, uh, um, and I think that it's important that we have these conversations. So I want to be clear about some things that have um, already been discussed over the years, but to Dr. Smith's uh, comment about um, the chief of correction position, um, I, I was waiting, Mr. Williams, and you, you've shown great restraint today, not leaning forward to say another issue that this board needs to confront is the model that we currently have, which uh, frankly we're sort of treading water on. Uh, but, but I see you leaning in, so go ahead and uh, take the opportunity if you like. It, we, we do have a sunset date on the existing ordinance, and my office is planning to bring the jail structure item uh, back before the board uh, also at the, in October. Because the sunset date is? Is January of? Of 2020. Okay, so um, here, here's my take. Um, organizations run best when there are clear lines of accountability and we know who's responsible for what and who's accountable for what. And we have frankly not been in that place since I came back on the board in January of 2013. Uh, we have a system that um, clearly uh, puts the responsibility for, quote, running the jails uh, in the hands of the elected sheriff. That being said, we have a system that calls out a chief of correction uh, that suggests that somehow the county administration as a whole and the board as a whole has a role that is greater than it really is because the chief of correction is responsible for a relative handful of administrative functions, laundry, food service, administrative booking, warehousing. Um, I'm not suggesting those are unimportant roles, but they're not the core function of a correctional uh, facility. So we're sitting here as a board having conversations about issues that quite frankly should be resolved uh, by the jail and by the jail's management, which is the sheriff's department. Uh, and yet here we are. Now, um, in fairness, <laughs> Uh, there are certain functions, and custody health is certainly one of them, and Supervisor Chavez has been on the custody health issues for a long time, so let me acknowledge that, uh, where the sheriff's office can rightfully say, hey, we can't do everything we're supposed to do without some cooperation and collaboration and support from other entities or agencies that are outside the direct purview of the sheriff. But um, to Mr. Williams' point, we, we need to figure out who's running the jails and uh, whoever that party is should be running the jails right now. Um, you know, my reaction is when everybody's in charge, nobody's in charge, and uh, that means when everybody's accountable, nobody's accountable, and that's kind of where we are, and I um, sense that in the frustration of members of the community who are trying to figure out to whom they should go to get results on matters of concern to them. Um, I continue to believe that it is um, not appropriate to have a chief of correction who reports to the board of supervisors who is the same person as the under sheriff who reports to the sheriff 
That's not a criticism of the Board of Supervisors or the Sheriff or any of our under sheriffs or Chief of Corrections historically. I just think that's a model that doesn't work. Telling somebody, hi, you are a direct report to the Board of Supervisors and you are a direct report to the Sheriff and if you get competing direction from those two different bosses, good luck to you. That's just not a workable system in my view and I would hope that at some point we could confront that. We've struggled with it and uh, Mr. Williams is reminding us that uh, before the end of the year we'll have to struggle with it again. We can either uh, come to some resolution, good, bad or otherwise, or we can punt yet again, um, which uh, you know, will leave the issue unresolved. Um, I uh, think that both Supervisor Ellenberg's comments about the uh, Office of Civilian Law Enforcement uh, and Oversight um, is a, um, monitoring rather is a uh, timely, same with the members of the public. Um, but I also want to say uh, that um, let's not kid ourselves, that's going to be the solution to all of these problems. So uh, I don't want to overly freight that, um, that particular one. Last thing just on issues of reform before we talk about where do we go from here. Um, my engagement on this issue, just for the record, was um, actually um, not a function of the Tyree tragedy. It was a function of the Ferguson case. And uh, I've said this before, but I want to say it again on the record because we have some new participants in the room. Um, in the aftermath of the Ferguson tragedy, you know, people around the country expressed their anger and their sadness, which I thought was appropriate on both counts. But I felt that as elected officials, our responsibility was to ask ourselves, what can we do tangibly to make sure that we never have a Ferguson in Santa Clara County? Or to come as close as possible to making sure that we never have a Ferguson in Santa Clara County? And as I did my homework and worked with the Sheriff's Office, among others, um, I came away with the conviction that there were three things we needed to do. The first was body-worn cameras and worked quite, quite closely with the Sheriff's Office and um, while you know, that's a, always a work in progress, uh, it, you know, we, we got there and we got there relatively expeditiously. The second was implicit bias training. Again, working with the Sheriff's Office, uh, we got there and we got there relatively quickly. You know, I know that we're having trouble managing all of the training uh, expectations that we've got in the organization, but, and the third was, uh, and remains meaningful civilian oversight. And I felt that if we could do those three things, that our chances of having a Ferguson in Santa Clara County were dramatically reduced. I still believe that. Um, I'm glad we've uh, essentially gotten to a good place on the first two, still work to do. Uh, and the third one is the sort of final leg of the three-legged stool. While all that was underway, we had the tragedy uh, of Mr. Tyree's murder and uh, the issue of jail oversight and civilian oversight uh, became more prominent. And um, I have made uh, plain, and I think everybody's in alignment on this, that civilian oversight is about both the enforcement side of the Sheriff's Department as well as the jail side. And so that's one of the challenges, frankly, in putting together a, um, an office, uh, finding folks who have the expertise or the ability to pull together the expertise in uh, both arenas. So um, I'm, I'm looking as we go forward on this issue, Dr. Smith, to get clear about who's responsible for what in a way that I think has been um, compromised, frankly, by the need for jail reform work by our board over the last three and a half years. I think it's time to remember who's responsible for what and uh, hold people accountable for the pieces. If it's our responsibility at the board, great. If it's the committee's responsibility, great. If it's the sheriff's responsibility, great. If it's custody health or whoever, great. But let's, I think that time to sort of say, let's be clear about who's responsible for what. I do think Ms. Wapensky and Dr. Smith, I think going forward, having the opportunity to have the sort of higher level conversations because really, you know, this is about helping the board make good decisions going forward. And so, you know, as I say, each of these individual items is important. It's important to somebody uh, or wouldn't have ended up and remained on the list. And, you know, if it's your life on the line, uh, then it's absolutely 100% important to you. 
Um, but I, I do worry that we are losing the ability to ask ourselves, how are we doing on some of these larger systemic issues? So I'm pleased that we're going to uh, ask the Public Safety and Justice Committee going forward uh, to take on a little bit more of the to-do list function. And uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Smith and Ms. Wapensky working with our various uh, colleagues here to try and uh, make the future study sessions. Um, I think we could go down to two a year, frankly, but uh, if we put some of this work into the committee where I think it uh, is probably best managed, uh, but make them a little bit more systemic in their approach. Dr. Smith, does that sound like it would work to you since you are leaning in on something anyway? I'll take advantage of the opportunity to ask. Sure, that will work. Okay. Other Can comments? I? Yes. Um, some of you are aware of this and some of you are new, new to the board, so I just would like to go over some history. I won't go back to 168 years ago. Um, but uh, when the electorate voted in an amendment to um, Section 509 of the Charter, um, that gave the Board of Supervisors through the Department of Corrections the authority to assign various responsibilities that were part of jail to the sheriff and various responsibilities to other entities. Um, as it turns out, what happened was <clears throat> those assignments were done <clears throat> based on budget units so the budget units that were, that contained um, badges, you know, custody officials were placed under the sheriff's office and the ones that didn't were placed under the Department of Corrections. That ha that's why we ended up with this crazy thing of, you know, the Department of Corrections is responsible for, you know, food service and administration and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> I, strongly recommend that we reevaluate that and break up the responsibilities based on function rather than on budget units because budget unit is just a way of collecting expenditures function is the kind of um, organizational structure that you're talking about that you're all talking about so that you know who's responsible for what function <clears throat> which will require us to come back to the board <clears throat> with options when we come when county council comes back with an ordinance modification and maybe we'll have a couple of options that would give you a choice of how you divvy up the responsibilities because I think you've all hit the nail very squarely on the head the jail is an intensely dangerous and and stressful environment where everybody has to work together. And um, the team function, if it falls apart, um, causes great dysfunction rumbling through the entire system. <clears throat> and this reform effort that we've been embarking upon is making progress, but it's also moving everybody's cheese as they say, so that there's lots of disruption going on. And now is a very good time for us to be clear about which functions are responsible to which individuals. So uh, hopefully that is acceptable to the board. If we can, uh, in the absence of any other cards, and I don't think we have any other speakers, if there are no other comments or questions, if we can, uh, get the voting panel on the screen, I will lean forward and make a motion to receive the report. If I can get, there we go. And uh, we'll also uh, direct staff to work on reconstituting the study session format for subsequent board meetings and uh, going to two a year rather than four. Uh, and uh, referring specific items to and through public safety and justice as appropriate uh, and rather than uh, thinking of those as study session topics per se. I think that captures where we were as a board, but Supervisor Chavez, since you're the seconder, I want to make sure you're comfortable with that characterization. Yep. 
Thank you. And I see Supervisor Wasserman, your microphone is on, sir. Thank you. I think moving from uh, four meetings to two here at the board is, is a good move for everyone. It's an extremely important and uh, costly issue that we're dealing with. Um, making good progress on the 623 items on, on the list. It's very complex, uh, and, and I think you're all doing a great job. I just wanted to point out, um, I know how important these, this issue is to the five supervisors here, and I just, in the effort of minimizing duplication, um, I like the idea of going twice twice a year here at the board for these study sessions. And I, what I heard you just say now, Supervisor Sumidian, I thought was a little bit different and I liked it better than what was, what was said earlier. And earlier I thought the suggestion was that these study sessions get moved to PS and J. And that would not be beneficial because I know it needs to ultimately come back here and it would be a duplication of staff and time. Now I hear you saying the study sessions go from four down to two at the board and a couple of select items go to committee first and then they're forwarded then to the board. Is that what you're proposing? I think your um, restatement of, of the second or later uh, version is correct with okay. perhaps one minor clarification. I think it's more than a couple of items that are gonna be coming to public safety and justice. So looking at today's agenda, for example, including a number that we ended up putting on consent, there were probably at least a dozen items just today um, that were each one individually important in sure. the lives of some significant number of people, but that are more about implementation uh, than about sort of larger um, issues. So uh, I should have just said yes, but more than a couple. Okay, and I'll, I'll take back the couple. Whatever they are, they are. Yeah. It's some meeting at six and it's some meeting at 16, whatever it is. But what I'm saying is this particular item has been an enormous, passionate, emotional, dangerous, financial, complex, multi-organization, da 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 issue since day one. And we have a long way still to go with the new jail going to be built besides modifying what we're doing with our current facilities. I just wanted to make sure that when these items are heard and you eight individuals here are here and the time and the staff to get here and the five of us are here and the members from the public are here that we don't have duplication of all of this at PS and J and then all of this again at the board. And that's all I was asking as we change the format of what we've been doing for the last year or two moving forward. Done, thank you. Got it. All right, we uh, have five votes that have been cast. We super, I'm sorry, Rose Cortese, before we. Uh, just a clarification. Uh, please. Uh, that the motion didn't specifically talk about the executive's um, efforts, which he's gonna move into a, a slightly different form, but I'm assuming silence in the motion means that's to continue. That was just the one issue I brought up, I had brought up. Yeah, I look thank forward you. to hearing what the executive comes back with. Great, thank you. All votes have been cast. We'll ask the clerk to display the results. We'll announce that it was 5-0. We'll say thank you very much to everybody who's there. And please stay with us if you're part of the subsequent discussion on other jail-related items. All right. Thank you. Madam Clerk, I believe that items 23 and 24 were both placed on consent. Do I have that right? That being said, I believe that item 25 is still on our agenda. Yes. So that will be our next item. And that's placement for high-needs women leaving county jail. And Ms. Wapensky, do we turn to you for the intro on this? Yes, um, I'm gonna ask the panel in a moment to introduce themselves, but this is a review of a high, high needs women in jail defined as having mental health and substance abuse issues, um, also exhibiting violent behaviors in the jail and community, and who cycle in and out of the jail and prison for years on violent charges. This report is a collaborative effort among the departments you see here today um, and so before I finish my presentation, I'm gonna ask the uh, staff to go ahead and introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Childs. Hi, I'm Holly Child. I'm the Director of Research for Probation. Good afternoon, Gap Lay, Deputy Chief Probation Officer of Adult Services. Good afternoon, Javier Ayere, Director Officer of Reentry Services. Melanie 
Jimenez Perez, Sheriff's Office. Tony Tully's Behavioral Health. Dr. Nathaniel Woods, Interim Custody Health Service Director. Roger, Roger Sue, Fleet and Fleet. And Tony Felice from the County Executive's Office. Thank so, you. And before you go further, Ms. Child, have you appeared in front of our board before? Yes, I just didn't. Re I, we were kind of moving some staffing around about who was going to cover today, so I'm kind of a last minute. Well, I'm sure you'll do just fine, but I just I couldn't remember whether you had been in front of our board before. I have been. Thank you. I thought so, but I couldn't place the the issue or the topic. But your title is Director of Research for Probation? Correct. Thank you. Correct. All right. Um, take it from there, Ms. Wapinski. Sure. I was just going to make some brief comments. Please. And the uh, re representatives from the departments are here to answer questions. The sheriff's office identified 26 women in custody who meet the definition that I just described. The stories of these 26 women are, are very similar. Um, the specific demographics and data are contained in the report, but their similarities, they have significant mental health issues and or trauma symptoms. They've been in numerous treatment programs. They face challenges with long-term employment but also housing and consistent treatment support. Of the population we studied, 81% accessed mental health treatment, 27% accessed substance abuse treatment, and 42 have registered or been referred to reentry services. Before we take questions, I want to point out the next step will be to use these preliminary findings in the report to answer the rest of the referral, which is to complete an assessment of appropriate release conditions for these women. Uh, placements that are gender responsive, and then any additional resources that may need to be considered. And so with that, the team will take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Uh, Wapinski, I think Supervisor Chavez, this is a response uh, to an issue you raised. Am I remembering that correctly? That's right. Thank you. Um, so first of all, what I wanted to um, say to the team here is that I really appreciate the amount of work and how how deep you got into understanding the situation of this um, group of women and doing it in a way that appears to be both respectful but also anonymous, which I know is very difficult to do um, in, this, in this body of work. The, the two things I, I just wanted to raise as questions as this comes back to us, I am interested in understanding how, if, if we can use our reentry partnership to track um, with enough uh, support that we would actually be able to use this to inform us about future, um, how, how are we more responsive in the future. The reason we picked this particular group of women was that some of the um, of the staff that work in, in the jails were seeing a repeated, a, a small group of just repeat um, offenders that were in our custody and very unclear about what was the trigger that kept getting them back into us, in part because they only are working with them for a really short period of time. So I'm just interested in making sure that as you come back, you give some thought to how we would assess what interventions work and what interventions don't work. And if that's really part of reentry or behavioral health, I, I, don't, I don't have a preference or probation. It's just a, a very broad question. Yes, we can bring that back with the next step. As part of it. And then the other question I was going to ask is, um, as you take a look at the, um, this group of women, I, I wonder if we have looked at other um, f local jail facilities to see if anybody else is doing work with this particular type of group of women, and if so, are they a little further ahead of us, or are you all going to be the first? Or do you know the answer to that yet? I don't think we know the answer to that, although you guys can speak up, but we can bring that information back. No. Um, Javier, you're Director of Reentry Services. The only other project that we're aware of, but that may not fit under the classification of high needs women, um, is a project IF that was presented uh, two years ago um, by the state of Washington. And we're looking at doing something very similar with working with the Office of Women's Policy, probation, and the Sheriff's Office in Behavioral Health. So um, currently we have two um, client navigation providers that are getting referrals through the rehab officers, through the Sheriff, and if they're um, identified as women, then um, we could then track them when they come to the reentry center to see what 
services they're receiving and intervention programs that they're receiving through behavioral health. But we're still in the preliminary discussion as to what type of um, comprehensive program we could provide. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other part of the question, and this is really more of a question, I think, Dr. Smith, for you, is that as we, <laughs> did you hear him? Uh-oh. As we have been, um, as we'd been exploring, you know, the, all the services that we're providing and all of, and all of the um, different approaches we've been taking, I know one issue that I've raised with um, Gary and with you is whether or not we have the capacity to use real-time technology to determine um, what services that folks are accessing, and also if we can look at the whole set of services, if they're being, you know, that they're being required, if there's a requirement for services, what those are relative to what they choose to do. And here, here's really the reason I'm asking the question. I don't, I don't, I know we don't know enough about dosage. We don't yet. We're still better understanding that. But I'm really interested in whether or not we have the capacity to, to collect aggregate data that helps us with decision making two, three, four years down the line. And so I know there are a lot of different apps that people are using that are self-reporting that are, that are, that are interesting and popping up, but it would be interesting in my mind to determine whether or not there's a, 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 a technological partnership that we may also want to consider. I, I don't know what that would be. It's, we get pitched on these ideas all the time. Yeah. Um, more complex answer than I can give you right now. I wonder if you might refer it to public safety and justice for us to get some details back to the c committee about what options there are and, you know, go from there. Yeah, and may, it may be just be a scan of tools. I, like I said, I know they're popping up all the time. I just, I got visited not too long ago by some Stanford students who were using, well, they weren't students, they were human adults, but they seemed young to me. Human adults. But they, um, but they had some interesting technology that they were trying to determine whether or not someone would willingly use if it helped them get through a process. So in any case, I, that may be too broad a question. I can also refine it a little more. And, but just if you could keep your eyes open for whether or not you're being pitched by partners, you think, oh, this might be something we can use you know, in a way that really enhances our ability to to better understand what services are being used and in real time because I actually think that's going to be very significant for us long term. But thanks so far. This is moving in a really great direction. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, if you could post the voting panel on our screens, that would allow Supervisor Chavez to make the motion to receive the report. And we could then call for a second and say thank you to Ms. Ellenberg for that. I could ask all five members to vote on the screen, confirming first that there are no additional speakers on this item, and there are not. So all five members have now voted. Please display the results. And on a 5-0 vote, item 25, the item has been received. Thank you very much, and thank you for the work underlying the report. Madam Clerk, that would take us to items number 26 and 27, but I believe both were uh, kept on consent, yes? Okay. Then that takes us to item 28, Custody Health Services Staff Work Area Construction Contract. And there were a couple of comments, questions, and I just said, why don't we simply take the item up? So who's going to present on this? Roger Sue, who will be presenting. Is that Roger Sue, I'm here to uh, answer any questions specific to this item here. I do have some questions, and uh, one of them may be for the County Council's office. So. Um, Just so you know, it's me, Mr. Sue, on the one hand and on the other hand. <laughs> um, on the one hand, I was delighted to see that the bid came in uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars below the engineer's estimate, which has not been our experience the last couple of years, 25% um, below engineer's estimate. On the other hand, that always makes me nervous that then we're going to end up with uh, change orders or um, supplemental work allowances. Is that the term of art we use? Uh, as we have been uh, over the past few months, and I note that, in fact, here there is an additional $200,000 part of the supplemental work allowance. How confident are you that uh, when this project is done, it's going to be a $610,000 project? I think this project would, um, would probably have some challenges because it's an existing facility, and we do know from past history that there are things that slow the project down, whether it's access to facility or things that put the contractor on hold 
because of, uh, again, of access. Um, unforeseen are definitely an, a, an issue with these type of facilities. Um, because just because we don't open up the walls yet until contractors are in there, we can't find things that are existing that may be incorrect, that building officials may want us to correct. So there are uh, various unknowns on this one. Okay, putting aside the unknowns for a moment, how confident are you that the $610,000 bid reflects the actual achievable cost of doing the work that has been identified for performance? I think with this contractor we've dealt with before, I think it's, um, it's, it's uh, a number that he does, potentially does, he does a lot of numbers are lower than, than what's out there. But he has done projects within that, that time, time frame and the dollars. Okay. Um, the, uh, I believe the indication is that the work will be performed over a period of how many days is it? I believe it's 240 calendar days. 240 calendar days. So the question for you or county council is, um, do we have a liquidated damages clause so that the, if there's a delay on the work, that, the, um, that there's some incentive to get the work done in a timely fashion? I believe there is, but I need to go back and confirm the dollar amount for you today. Is there any reason we can't kick this contract to the meeting two weeks from now? Uh, the only issue is the, the bids expire on October the 10th, and if we don't award contract, we'll have to rebid, which we can do. But we could do it two weeks from now and still be within the exp expiration period, could we not? We could, yes. Okay. Then I'm going to ask that that's what we do. Uh, colleagues, just so you know, I did try to get the liquidated damages number yesterday and just wasn't uh, something that we could get on short notice apparently. But I'm going to ask the county council to work uh, with you, Mr. Sue, on this as well. And let me tell you where I'm going with this. Um, we're about to do a boatload of work at that jail. And um, it's a busy construction time. I'm nervous that we've got somebody who has come in 25%. On the one hand, I'm delighted. On the other hand, I'm nervous that somebody's come in 25% below the engineer's estimate. And what I don't want to do is suddenly discover 240 days from now that the thing is sitting there uncompleted and that there's no incentive for compl timely completion because the liquidated damages provisions are so modest that someone says, no, I can make more money by being busy over here than I can on your little podunk project here at the jail. We've had this project with a problem with other county projects in the past, um, and then things sit, 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 while somebody goes off and does another job that's more attractive to them in real time in terms of the dollar amounts. So what I'd like to do is ask the clerk to please um, give us a voting panel, and I'm going to lean forward and move that the item be continued to our next meeting two weeks from today, and that uh, staff be directed to come back with uh, information about the liquidated damages provision and provide some assessment as to whether or not the liquidated damages provision is sufficient to compel timely performance. I'm also going to ask when you come back that you come back with a proposed reporting process on this one little small project to see what happens to the costs. I'm going to use this one as my case study, my hypothetical, and say, okay, unexpected, that's fair enough. But otherwise, are we looking at change orders or other things that improve, that increase the cost of the project over the life of the project? So I'd like to know what your thoughts are about how we might monitor that on just this one project. Mr. Williams, you were leaning in on liquidated damages and then you sat back. Should I leave well enough alone or do you have a comment here? I was just going to share that I'm informed that the liquidated damages provision is $1,700 per day. Calendar day or business day or? It's calendar day. All right. Can we ask, I still want to continue the item, and I'd like you to come back and talk about whether or not that is sufficient to compel performance on the 240 days. Okay. Thanks. Motion is to continue. Second is from Chavez. Could we ask the other three members to please vote on their screens? Thanks. All votes have now been cast. We'll display the results, and the results are 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. That takes us to item number 29, which I believe still remains on the calendar. Yes, Madam Clerk? It does. Thank you.
And who's presenting on this item? If I may, it'll be the Sheriff's Office along with Procurement and Technology and Services Solutions staff. Thank you. And once they have presented, we will... Um, we have one person who uh, wishes to speak. Thank you. And welcome, and who'd like to begin? Good afternoon. Um, I'm Assistant Sheriff Eric Taylor, and I oversee the Custody Bureau. With me today uh, from the Sheriff's Office are... Captain David Sepulveda. Captain Thomas Duran. Melanie Jimenez-Perez. We are here today to respond to questions from the board. We are anxiously anticipating starting this contract so we can work with Legacy to formalize an, an implement implementation plan and timeline. Introducing tablets is an important project we have been working towards for a long time. The goal of the tablets is to provide in inmates with access to ex educational uh, resources and to make the submission of grievances electronic and to increase inmates access to information and increase their ability to communicate with their families. We will continue to update the board on our progress during the quarterly study sessions on jail reforms. Thank you for considering this item and we are here available for questions. Thank you very much. Do we have anybody uh, here from the Public Defender's Office? Ms. Wapensky, have you or any of your team heard from the Public Defender's Office on this item? I have not. Anybody here heard from the Public Defender's item on this? Yes. I uh, received a, an email a memo yesterday from Molly O'Neill, which I had assumed all of our board received. Well, that's why I'm trying to find out who else has been in receipt. They did notify us of their report as well and took that as their comment. Okay. Uh, and this is the letter dated uh, the, the 9th. Yes. And would anybody, uh, there are recommendations in the document. Would anybody on the team care to respond to those recommendations? Because it says, the recommendation is before proceeding with approval of the item, I recommend the following, a discussion to ensure a full understanding about how jail phone call recording information is shared. And then further discussion, consideration of how tablet communication information will be shared with third parties. And then, um, uh, if the board must approve these use policies at its meeting on September 10th, at a minimum, the board should direct the sheriff to return for a more robust discussion about how the jail phone call recordings are shared and about possible revisions to the surveillance use policy in terms of how tablet communication is shared before the legacy system launches, which I take to mean a request that um, we might take action, but before the system is actually put into place, that those conversations take place. Um, I see that uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's light is on, so let me turn to her, and then uh, I will get to Mr. Hansen in a moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think you reflected uh, the public defender's comments well. It's, but we're, we're still kind of facing the same challenge in the same circle. Um, we have to approve the contract so that the sheriff can get information to answer people's questions. We can still hold the rollout of the tablets until we have a better use policy, but I'm afraid we're not getting the answers that we need without 
conversation with the vendor. And why is it that we can't get answers to the questions we need from the vendor who's trying to sell us an expensive product? I mean, one would ordinarily think that we'd ask these questions about the product before we purchased it and get answers from someone who had some incentive to sell it to us. One would think. While we're still in the procurement process, we are working with procurement and whenever we've had a question for them, they do provide that to the vendor to get us a response back. But kind of, And they have scoped it out in their response, but what we're really looking for is to test it ourselves and to have our deputies who are working with jail phone calls already kind of put it through more robust testing so we know how it works. Right now we're relying on procurement to help us work with the vendor for them to tell us how it works but we would like to see it for ourselves. Yeah, let me say first thank you to everybody who responded to the list of uh, concerns I had at the last uh, meeting, um, and thank you for that effort. Uh, board members, I think, will know we, we only got the response back yesterday, uh, I think at 10, 10.30 in the morning, uh, but again, people were trying to respond to the things that I had specifically raised at the previous meeting, so I wanna say thank you for that. Where are we in terms of your timeline? I understand everybody wants this thing to go, and um, that being said, you know, part of the reason for having th this uh, policy in place is to force exactly these kinds of conversations uh, that surface what may be the legitimate competing interests of different parts of the organization or the public. So in this case, um, I, you know, as much as it may seem like a, uh, a wrench, um, I'm glad that we've heard from the uh, public defender, uh, but where are we in the process here in terms of timeline? And uh, I don't like to get jammed, as you know, by being told, well, you have to approve something without doing your work, uh, but where are we? Good afternoon, Teresa Thrillers for the Department of Procurement. <clears throat> In terms of our timeline, if we can finalize uh, this agreement uh, today, I think we would be prepared to get our phones up and running by February to March of 2020. Let me try asking the question <clears throat> a different way. If we can't finalize it today, cannot, how long is the bid good for? Um, the bid would be Good. I think one of the issues is going to be uh, disconnecting from the from the current vendor, which we originally came and we did an amendment, which would take us through, I believe, March, would take us through March 2020. So we have until then, and we would want some time in between in order for us to make the change. So ideally, this would be the right time to approve this and be able to move forward if we wanted to move forward by March 2020 and avoid another amendment. Yes, and I understand, and just to help you understand, I, I heard the word ideally, and um, welcome to the Board of Supervisors. Um, ideally is not always uh, possible or practicable, um, and we've got some important issues here from the Public Defender's Office. Um, what I'd like to suggest, colleagues, is that um, we consider, and I still wanna get to Mr. Hansen before we uh, do, but that we consider referring this issue to the Public Safety and Justice Committee um, where it might be heard at your next meeting uh, to see, see if we can't get some resolution on the concerns that have been raised by um, the public defender. The whole point of this exercise, as I say, is to sort this stuff out before we make the decision to spend public funds on surveillance technology that has either privacy or due process considerations. So while it may seem like it creates a less than an ideal timeline, as I said earlier, I actually think it's working uh, to force these difficult conversations. Before I go to Ms. Uh, Ellenberg, I do want to go to Mr. Hansen and let him come forward because uh, he has a card in on this item. Mr. Hansen? Okay. All right. Ms. Ellenberg. I, I would be glad to hear this issue uh, at our next Public Safety and Justice Committee meeting. I want to just make sure our, all of my colleagues are aware. Also that another piece that we're waiting for is that we have implemented uh, or we have agreed to a policy to um, underwrite the cost of jail phone calls. 
uh, by inmates, and that is also on hold until we have the new contract because we're not going to implement that with the current contract, which is probably running out. So just another incentive piece. There are lots of reasons to move this forward. Great. Can we get a screen on our, uh, excuse me, a voting panel on our screens, please? I'm going to move to uh, refer the item to public safety and justice and to report back at the first possible opportunity. Because ideally, we'd be able to move this along in a timely fashion consistent with the transition uh, timeline that has been described by staff. We have a motion by Submitian and a second by Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, all votes have been cast. We'll ask the clerk to please display the results. Thank you very much. Carries five to zero. Supervisor Ellenberg, it won't surprise you, but consistent with the Brown Act, we're going to find a way to share some additional thoughts from our office with your uh, committee uh, between now and the time of your meeting, and I'm saying that in part for my own staff who's here. Thank you very much. Now, that takes us then to item 30, which is the subsidized inmate phone calls. And Dr. Smith? Um, we have Tracy has to give you an update, but I think the uh, issue was just addressed by Supervisor Ellenberg. So, Tracy, why don't you give a little bit of information? Good afternoon, Supervisors. I'm Tracy Hess from the County Executive's Office of Budget Analysis. The report in front of you is in response to the August 27th request for a plan going forward to implement subsidized phone calls to the inmates in the jails. We are recommending an implementation of an 18-month pilot that includes seven 15-minute phone calls per week for each inmate, and we're recommending using the Inmate Welfare Fund to fund the cost of the phone calls for the pilot period and also to fund the cost of reprogramming the system. Um, based on our current jail population and the rates that are in the contract that was previously discussed, we're expecting the cost of the phone calls themselves to be about $1.5 million per year. Um, we don't at this time have an estimate of how much the reprogramming will cost. Um, if we decide to go forward and make the program permanent, we will need to find ongoing funding as the Inmate Welfare Fund will not have enough funding to cover ongoing expenses. Um, I do need to let you know that in order to use the Inmate Welfare Fund for this project, County Council has told us that we may need a board policy change. So if you approve this plan going forward, then we will have further discussions with them and possibly come back with an amendment to the board policy. If you approve our plan, then our next step would actually be negotiating with the vendor for reprogramming, and then at that time we'll have a better idea of what the cost for the reprogramming will be, and we'll be able to provide an implementation timeline. So with that, I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I see Supervisor Ellenberg's light is on. I'll go to her first. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, thank you. I needed to be corrected on two items. One, it sounds like this is separate from the legacy contract. We would need to wait for the legacy contract we, to be approved. Oh, we still do. Okay. Yes. So I, I was right on that piece. I also, though, however, jumped the gun and suggested that this policy had already been passed, and evidently we need to vote on that first. I took that to be a, sort of a good karma thing uh, that you were uh, trying to send our way. Thank Hopeful. you. Other comments or questions? Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. Um, I understand in the report the $2.5 million covered by the $3 million that we've got in the welfare fund, and I just heard you say, you answered one of my two questions, what is the estimated cost, ongoing annual cost? And I heard you say about one and a half million Correct. is your estimate. And I also heard you say that you don't anticipate the welfare fund having that much available to cover that each year, so we have to look for alternative source. What, what is the delta, just using estimates, of one and a half million a year in cost versus the estimates for um, unapplied IWF? monies. So currently there's approximately $3 million in the IWF. I got that. Um, as you understand, there is not ongoing revenue that's replenishing that fund at this time. Okay, that's zero because we've gone everything down to no cost to the inmates. I understand there may be a small revenue that's coming in there, but it's almost zero. Okay, so basically we'll be looking for one and a half million a year from an alternative source. That is correct. Okay, thank you very much. Other comments or questions? 
So the recommended action uh, looking to staff uh, is, uh, Dr. Smith, is to approve the plan from the administration relating to implementing subsidized inmate phone calls, but does that need to be contingent on I think Anything? we just approve it and uh, we'll come back to you with the details about the new policy. Ms. Ellenberg, does that sound right to you? It does. It will be. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. And, well, here's what I want to say. Um, uh, thank you to everybody who's pushed on this. Uh, f for me, this is a culmination, or at least the almost culmination, of seven years worth of conversation at our board. Um, and. Um, I, I think it's an indication, frankly, that our organization has made some progress in terms of how we think about a much larger set of issues around reentry, reform, and all of that. Um, uh, it's, uh, I, I'm sure it seems a small thing to uh, many folks, particularly folks on the outside who don't have somebody on the inside, uh, but um, I think it is, uh, more meaningful in many ways than might be readily apparent. Before we actually bring up a panel on this one to, uh, to vote, uh, I want to call on Ron Hansen, who has a card in on this item and does not appear to be passing on this one. So Mr. Hansen, come on up. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Ron Hansen. I'm affiliated with PACT, People Acting in Community Together. First, <clears throat> kudos to the administration and the board for taking this bold step forward. As many have pointed out in this and other fora, subsidizing detainee phone calls will enable stronger family ties, reduce the detainee's sense of isolation while they are in jail, and ultimately reduce recidivism. One note of caution, however, the Inmate Welfare Fund Committee has not met since March 2017, and in that meeting, the financial report revealed less than $1.5 million in its account with no income uh, anticipated from either the commissary or phone conversations, uh, phone commissions. I'm sure that interest alone has not doubled this balance in the intervening two and a half years. I just raise this because today's ledge file, as we just heard, reports that a $3 million balance is in the uh, inmate welfare fund, which would be used to subsidize the phone call costs. I would hate to see the phone call initiative under consideration derailed because of insufficient funds uh, in the Inmate Welfare Fund account. However, assuming that the uh, IWF balance is correct, we uh, at PACT applaud your initiative and urge the board approval of this plan from the administration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg, your mic's still on. I'd be happy to make a motion to approve Great. this program. I'd be happy to second it. We'll pull up the panel. Supervisor Umberg makes the motion. Uh, Supervisor Smitty, and that would be me, makes the second. We have um, two more members. One more member. Please vote on your screen. Now, all five votes have been cast, and so we'll ask the clerk to display the results and mention that the motion has been carried 5 0. Thank you again very much. All right, Madam Clerk, uh, I just want to check my own notes. Uh, item 31, this is still on consent, yes? No? Thank you. And is, uh, did we also pull item 33? Thanks. I thought uh, I was unsure there. All right, then that takes us to item 31, and this is the assessment of county programs relating to family finding and reunification. Mr. Herzig, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, President Smith and members of the board. Before you today, you have a report back on the assessment of county programs relating to family finding and reunification. Also attached to the ledge file is a matrix that shows current efforts by county departments around family finding and reunification. In addition, and as requested, the body of the ledge file contains information on the family finding program efforts in Los Angeles County. In addition, what's not included in the ledge file, what we just were able to obtain from LA County, is the cost annually of their program is about 1.5 million. This employs um, approximately 18 retired social workers on a part-time basis, um, and they serve approximately 200 kids and families per year. So we just received this information recently, and I wanted to update the board on that. Right. So if you have any questions, I'll take that now. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And I, um, I really want to thank you for the report. And just for my colleagues, part of the reason that I requested this is that work we're doing in the social services um, department is really 
um, focused on doing family findings so that we're not detaining children in the rake or in um, foster care situations when they could be fostered by their own family members. And what's really interesting about Los Angeles County is it dramatically dropped the number of children that they have um, that are in need of foster care. And so the idea was so interesting to me that one of the things I had asked reentry to start doing was to do the same thing, which is can we find um, families? And frankly, one of the... Um, some of the feedback we got from our reentry board members was really touching because they were saying that often they burn bridges, but having that bridge, having someone help build that bridge as people are coming out might be a way for us, for example, to not have to try to find housing for someone because they can go live with their family or, or getting support from their family. And the other thing I just want to say is I, I feel like from a public perspective, often we're talking about, oh, let's strengthen the family, let's strengthen the family but then we're intervening when we may not need to or we're intervening in a way that's not complementary to the family. So here's what I would like to do. I want to thank staff very much for the report. And what I'd like if, if, um, is to ask staff to come back in December with an analysis, analysis and an assessment of options for the board to consider relative to establishing family finding reunification across county departments where appropriate. And I think you've got a, a good list in front of us. And um, if I could, I'd like to ask for the screen and make that a motion. I need a second. And is there any discussion on the motion or feedback? Seeing none, all those in, oh. All those but Mike Wasserman? Oh, he's back. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Gary, for the research. And with all votes cast, the clerk will display the results and indicate that the motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. That takes, it to, takes us to item number 32. And I think this item remains on consent. Mm -hmm. Yes, Madam Clerk? So that takes us to item number 33, which was pulled back onto our regular agenda. Report on implementation and expansion of jail diversion programs. Who's going to present on that? Ms. Tullys, are you it? I met with my team right behind me. Okay. Would they like to come sit at the grown-up table with you, or uh, what they do you might. think? I might let them come sit All at right. the grown-up table. We just had a they, they, they're not rushing, Ms. Tullys, I'll tell you. <laughs> they're not. Okay. Come on up and introduce yourself so you get some face time. In all seriousness, thank you uh, for being here, and it is sometimes helpful for us to get a better sense of who's working on these various efforts. So welcome to our... So Tony Tully's Director of Behavioral Health. Margaret Ovalo, Division Director of Adult Older Adult Services. This will be your opportunity to learn how to use our tech system here. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, I'm Margaret Ovalo, Division Director for Adult Older Adult Services. Welcome and thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Gabby Olivares. I'm the Division Director of Justice Services. Thank you. So we have a brief PowerPoint if the board would like to see the PowerPoint. Can I recommend that you do that? Because you've done some amazing work and people ought to see where we're at. Go to it. I don't go to it. Is there staff that goes to it for fun and kick? I've never done it. Thank you. It was up there earlier. <laughs> Is that one working? Okay. But it's not. Oh, okay. I know it is. It's very nice weather. <laughs> Here we go. So this is a brief PowerPoint on our jail diversion services 
um, with some data to demonstrate what we've been doing. Here we go. Uh, our highlights, we wanted to highlight in this PowerPoint three different services. One is our STEPS program, which you saw in the earlier PowerPoint. But this is our, our drug, our substance use work that is inside custody, provides transition outside of custody, and connects people into services. It's been very effective, and I had mentioned this early, so, earlier, so we have about 1,000 referrals here. And of those 1,000, 930 clients were screened, and we had almost 800, 900 clients into treatment. Very proud of that. Uh, we also completed the criminal justice and mental health system assessment, and we, the, the consultants on that one um, provided a set of recommendations based on qualitative data and interviews with the public safety partners. In addition, they did a national search for us on our community assessment tools that we'll be using across the adult and older adult service. And I think also to mention that we learned a lot about uh, data requests here and have met with Miguel and all of the data meetings, uh, privacy meeting, and going forward, we'll be working with our vendors so that they can get access to the data that they need. That was not possible in this particular assessment. Um, the mobile crisis teams are up and running. At, at this point, we have, we have seen many, many people. We're open to the public. We've hired additional staff, and we're now training on-call staff to pick up evenings, nights, and weekends. So the clinical team has expanded, and we are being widely used not only by law enforcement, but by uh, the community members, most of the calls are about access to resources with a small number that require on-site mobile crisis. And we've done a lot of work, particularly with the San Jose PD, in many different crisis situations. This is our jail diversion system where we have been tracking our post-custody clients. And from a service delivery standpoint, we want people to be able to stay in treatment 30 days or longer. What you see with a lot of the people coming out of custody is they may see you once and they may disappear. So our emphasis has really been how do we get, uh, get them to stay into treatment and track that. And so what you're seeing from the beginning of our services in 10, the 1,066, each year we're seeing a pretty big um, number of people that we're able to keep into these community-based services and we're very Gabby and her team have done a really, really good job with that. Excuse and the, next, the interruption, Ms. Yes. Tully. Supervisor Chavez, a question at this point? So um, actually, it, it's a, it has a little bit to do with the next slide as well. But what, what is a, um, a realistic goal for us in terms of client engagement? And, and, and what's the, the timeline that you use to determine whether or not we've actually been able to engage the client? I think this is one of the first, this is one of the beginning um, and one of you can speak to it. Gabby, you might want to be brief on this, though. Um, we do look to see if we can keep people into services, if they show up for services. But and is then it beyond like, that, we is, do... Is it an extended period of time? Like, is 30 days considered engagement? I mean, I know it depends on a little bit of the length of the a program. Lot of, but what's the right... What's the, what's the metric that... It, I don't know if there's a common metric that's used. What is the metric we're using? You want to speak to that? We're using 30 days. That has been kind of the magic number. And I think um, what has really helped us is that we started engaging early on into jail. So all of our providers have now clearances to go into custody. So the engagement starts prior to actually releasing out of custody. Mm -hmm. So you're starting to see that the fruits of your labor already. Definitely, because we've been trending up the last couple of years. That's great. Thanks, Gabby. And this looks a little bit busy, but what we wanted to show is the just the um, continuum of care right now that we're doing with justice services. And we're, we're trying to call things justice services and not criminal justice services because that's stigmatizing to individuals who have a mental illness or substance use and have been inside the jail. So what this basically demonstrates is the number of programs that we have both diversion programs, programs that are provided specifically for people with mental health issues, and also the substance use issues. And what you see in terms of the level of de detail, 
um, is that when we, when we talk about slots, that means we're paying for X amount of slots. But on the bottom line, when you see the number of clients served, we're serving many, many people in these different programs. And the, we're seeing the numbers continue to increase in that. So we have the estimated length of service and the number of clients that we serve. This is for fis, uh, fiscal year 19. So, and then just to go back to that, that slide, um, so that what that means is these are, are these uh, client days or these are individual unduplicated clients across the spectrum, or across this bottom yep. list? Yes, they're unduplicated clients across the spectrum. And so um, the last line, if you could just, where it says annual client served, that is how many individuals we have annually served in that treatment modality. Got it. And so if somebody was in diversion treatment modality, they could they also be in the mental health modality or the substance use or no? They're yes, because we have a fluid continuum of care. So everything is based on a level of care need and what the individual's needs are, their treatment plans. So as you can see, they can travel up and down our continuum depending on what their service needs are at the time or what they're willing to disclose. Maybe they start in our diversion program, but they express that they do actually have some substance abuse um, needs so they can travel down to the continuum in our substance abuse program. So if we were to look at the annual number, you know, and if we had an equal sign at the at the end of the that annual client served, it would it would be what do you think? And and I'm really the reason I'm asking is I think the point you're raising about how co how many people have co-occurring issues or multiple issues. I'm really just trying to understand what's the the broad, what's the number of people we're serving irrespective of where they fall on the continuum? So it's, it's based on the level of care need. So like if you look at our intensive outpatient, annually we're serving 173 clients. So everything is respective to the level of care that they're in. Mm -hmm. So if you look at our full service partnership, annually we serve 579 clients in that level of care. Right, but but if you're saying that a, a person could be in, they could be in multiple, get, getting services under multiple columns. Yes. What I'm really just wanting to understand is, what's what is the actual total number of human beings that get served? Because it because it would make sense to me that some may be counted two or three times based on their needs. Yeah. So I'm really just, yeah, thank you. I'm really just looking for that unduplicated number. And if you don't know it, that's okay. I, I, I was just curious about what it is. I want to understand what the implications of this, that bottom line is. Why don't we give you, we'll send out a number. Okay, to great. Thank you. And this is for fiscal year 20 where we're doing uh, a lot of expansion. And so you can see the new programs, the Memorial Wright programs, which will come on very quickly and our forensic assertive community treatment team. And then you see expansion in our mental health world and in our substance use world. And if you look at the estimated number of clients served along the bottom, these are all brand new programs. These programs are based on the data that we've collected, looking at who's coming out of jail and what are the needs of that population. So these, this rec represents very significant service delivery expansion questions thank you and then we have a couple of other things going on with our jail diversion services one is our assembly bill 1810 this is the services for individuals that are deemed incompetent to stand trial there are two different levels of care there and we are currently working right now with our county council on the contract to finish the contract and bring it to the board and then we have the pre-arrest unit, working with pretrial services and reentry. We'll be providing clinicians in that particular program. And we're also working with the court on a SAMHSA grant. And that's our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Supervisor Chavez, would this be a good time for me to ask the clerk to bring a voting panel up on our screen? Yes, and I just wanted to um, make a, a couple of comments if I could. One is, this is an incredible amount of work that of services that you've stood up over the last few years, and I wanted to say thank you. And I also just wanted to say um, one thing that we might want to think about is 
how we share this with the jail, the reentry committee's um, jail diversion committee, because I think they they saw this at the beginning, and now getting a chance just to see where you brought it, I think would be really um, valuable. The only other thing I, I wanted to um, raise with my colleagues is that we have been relying on a on a partnership with a with the courts. And um, the courts are really thinking about how to duplicate Judge Manley right now, so that not everything's just going through Judge Manley's court, and you know that we have another um, whole court. And so, one thing that um, I just wanted to make sure I put on really on the the county execs' radar is that as they start to make changes in the way they provide services. Uh, you know, better understanding how what the implications are going to be for the services that are in place would be something I think worth us at some point, and this probably is Public Safety and Justi Justice Committee that needs to take a look at it. But I also think it'll have an impact on the reentry center as well, particularly where they're trying to divert people. So just wanted to put that on everybody's radar. Um, and then the other thing I, I wanted to just mention is that we are still... Um, there's still a lot of misunderstanding about um, why we're not putting people in locked facilities who are severely mentally ill. And I raise that only because I think at some point the, the full board needs to have a discussion about what, the, um, what programs are available and what programs are available for people who are really critically mentally ill and how we're supporting them because the, the more there's just going to there's a level of impatience with us that that I appreciate because I think everybody feels like they know how to resolve this and not everybody understands the implications of any single action we're taking but I do think it's worth the board revisiting this before we have another meeting with the city of San Jose or some other group um, so anyway I just wanted to put that on people's radars but I'm very um, appreciative of this and if it hasn't been moved I will move the report Motion by Chavez, second by Ellen oh, Berg. Susan, I, I have a question. And a question or a comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I want to echo um, my colleagues' appreciation for this tremendous uh, and critical work that has come so far. It's my understanding that the next step in creating the director of jail diversion that's referenced in the report is for ESA to bring the salary ordinance amendment to the board. Is, is that correct? Yes. Can at the we, next at the next board meeting. That apparently. was the next question. I'm glad that <laughs> we can expect to see that at the next um, board meeting. This really is a critical position to fill in order to coordinate these services more effectively. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I just want to follow up on your um, inquiry, and I know you asked for the information to come later. But um, what what are what is the total number of locked facility beds in this county for adults right now? Ballpark is it under fifty, over fifty? You mean outside the jail? Pardon me. Outside the jail. Yes, outside jail. We, we want to say it's about 150 beds, but I will I will give the board the exact number. Margaret manages all of that, so. Please. Yeah, that's that sounds a little higher than <clears throat> what I've been told by um, folks in our system, El Camino and Stanford, which basically total up to less than 100. But, and again, I'm referring to locked facilities, not um, step down or you know other facilities where, where there are beds. Um, and, and I'm very interested, and I just wanted to sort of second the inquiry that Supervisor Chavez is, is, is making um, regarding how that impacts our ability to, um, to do all the rest of this work. And, you know, I'm not, I don't think anybody wishes upon any other human being a, a locked facility for mental health reasons, um, but it, whether we wish it or not, sometimes for, for the safety of individuals, obviously it's necessary. Um, that said, um, I want to just say I appreciate this very, very much, this work, this diversion work, you know, given this is what we can do, short of actually building facilities and adding beds um, or turning our jails into full-time, full-on step-down facilities. Or mental health facilities so I appreciate this very much uh, I don't want my I didn't want my question to be interpreted as you know thanks a lot but what are you doing with locked facilities I just think that 
in a county of two million people, um, if people would be realistic, including law enforcement, um, municipal elected officials and others about what the limitations really are in terms of providing for folks who need, uh, at least on a temporary basis, 5150 or 5152, a log facility, um, I don't know where we put them. That's, I'm, I'm giving my interpretation of the conclusion, the answer to the question ahead of time. But I think it is really, really important to have that number and put it in juxtaposition to need, <clears throat> which would be something else you could bring back. I mean, on any given day, does, does that cut it? Um, so, thank you. So we could put together an off agenda for all of you. Margaret's got all the data. And we could also put together a flow chart that would show you what the new programs that we're putting in place. Those programs are designed <laughs> to also take people that are currently in locked facilities who are ready to be into the community, which would give us more capacity for other individuals that need to be in an involuntary setting. So right. we can we can show that to you. We're happy to do right. that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We have a motion to receive the report by Chavez, the second again is Supervisor Ellenberg. We'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen. And we'll ask the clerk to please display the results. And we'll announce that the carries 5-0. Thank you again to all involved. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, Madam Clerk, that takes us next to all the way to item 38, because other items uh, have been dispensed with in one form or fashion. Yes? All right. And uh, Keeley, I see you walking up to uh, present on this, yes? Yes, uh, Keeley, Director, Office of Supportive Housing. Happy to be back here this afternoon. Um, sorry, the uh, report uh, caused a little bit of confusion, uh, so let me try to uh, summarize. Uh, through this report, uh, we're, we're trying to state that the administration records, receives, and then records uh, repayments of loans by um, funding source and in sometimes by um, by program for example the housing bond is a funding source but of course we have the first-time home buyer program and our supportive housing loan program um, as those uh, funds are received uh, we intend to record that information and um, present to the board sort of a, a report on the entire portfolio but also prov provide to the board um, the opportunity to uh, direct how those funds are sort of redistributed or reallocated. Uh, a sort of, uh, and practically speaking, it, these, um, uh, uh, these choices, these recommendations would be sort of offered or managed by sort of uh, program or funding source. Um, a practical example is the community development block grant and home funds for which we sort of uh, capture program income and then uh, present to the board through the Housing Community at, um, um, and Development Committee and to the board uh, sort of each spring for reuse. I have a quick question. <laughs> We've got lots of different funds in lots of different projects. Some of those projects will generate proceeds. That's why we have the memo. Am I tracking you so far? Yes. Okay. My understanding was that if there were proceeds over here for this kind of a project, that the proceeds would then be used to fund like efforts for the same kinds of projects with the same kinds of benefits, and that if there were proceeds over here for a different kind of project, that the proceeds over here would be used to fund similar kinds of projects with similar kind of benefits. Meaning, if we had one over here that was for the sake of discussion, for very low income and or extremely low income people who were either homeless or at risk of being homeless, proceeds there would stay in the same category of project. But if there was one over here that was for workforce housing for the sake of discussion, first time home buyer, the proceeds there would stay in the same uh, program area for lack of a more technical term. Is that correct or is that wrong? Not really. Uh, I think we're saying to the board that uh, absent of any sort of regulatory requirements, we are providing the board, dis we would provide um, an opportunity for the, for the board to there sort of is. direct um, how those funds are reused. And are you providing that opportunity in the expectation that we will tell you that today, 
or when those proceeds arrive some point in the future? In the future. So, um, so I will just remind my colleagues that when we passed Measure A, this was actually an item I asked to have come back to the board because I do think we need to have this exact discussion. And what I would want to, here, here's the, the um, two issues that I would want to raise for my colleagues to think about. One is that of the $950 million bond, um, the money, much of the money that we would get paid back from loans would come from the pot that is the um, for sale um, housing product, the first time home buyer program. And so what I was really interested in us taking a look at is projecting out for the whole $950 million bond what the um, revenues may be from the bond, and frankly, not even the bond, it's other housing, it's other monies that we're investing in housing as well. Let the board have an opportunity to review all of those and then give feedback in real time. And, and here's the reason that I'm interested in doing that. The ELI pot of money, even though that's our largest pot of money, that um, pot of money to me feels like it has less of an opportunity to um, grow, and if that's the case, then the, the parts of the program that do grow, the question is, should all of that go back into workforce housing, or should it be divided up amongst the categories? I don't actually know what all, it, I haven't seen a, a chart that shows what all the sources are, and what we think the rates of return will be, and projecting that over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but that's really what I'm interested in getting back from the staff, so that we have a better opportunity to be making decisions that are rooted in a, in, a, in a set of policies that as a board we've had a chance to review. And so I think what you were saying to us here is this is what you're anticipating, this is what you all are, think you all are thinking about. Um, I guess what I would request is a further delineation of what we think those sources of funds will be over 5, 10, 15, 20 years with your best professional judgment about what we should do and that way we can give you feedback more, more specifically and have a more specific discussion with the board. Sue Rez Cortese, your light is on, sir. Yeah, I guess if we're not making that decision now, um, I don't have to be too uh, impassioned about it, probably, but um, this sentence in the report that starts on package, bottom of package, page 738, that says, for example, first time home buyers repaid one million, the board may direct that all one million, all of it, be used for a supportive housing development program, um, which would primarily increase the availability of support of an ELI housing. Um, I just want to say I'm vehemently against that. Um, the, the, the selling point for me of doing a first time home buyer program after looking at what they did in Napa and then arguing for that when we took up deliberation here um, in terms of what the expenditure plan would be for Measure A was that we can create a revolving fund with this particular fund um, that essentially not only could go on in perpetuity, but can grow. And we even had discussions at this board about potentially at times investing or augmenting that fund with other funds, um, if need be, um, if that be in the discretion of the board to take some other dollars that are incoming, uh, redevelopment tax increment or something like that, that comes in on a one-time basis, or the sale of property that we have that comes in on a one-time basis, and actually augment those dollars. I think it's a mis the second, my second reasoning besides, well, let me finish, let me finish that thought. Okay. The minute you take that million dollars and put it over to permanent supportive housing, it's, it's gone as far as it regenerating mm -hmm. itself. It, it can no longer regenerate revenue for the first time home buyers program or for the general fund or for permanent support of housing or anything else, it's, it's gone. So you've basically taken the corpus that was essentially the annuity for the program, you know, and started um, cannibalizing it. So that's my first objection. My second objection is a little more philosophical in that I'm sensing, and I felt this way, we'll get to it, I guess, a little bit later here uh, on item 45, but it seems as if our, our, our legislative positions, our um, our, our sort of our underlying undertone of ideology is that, you know, the entire continuum is served by putting every single thing we can into permanent supportive housing, and it's just not correct. Uh, we have people dying and freezing uh, over 
an extended period of time that it's going to take to build permanent supportive housing and a growing number of them, you know, in creeks and underpasses and so forth, um, with without dollars really of any significance to deal with the short-term problem or a bucket of dollars. Um, and part of the continuum, call it the missing missi missi middle or just the low income, 20% <laughs> below market, which we lost with redevelopment, um, is really not served much, um, you know, anywhere uh, by Measure A. And so I like Measure A. I supported Measure A. I co-chaired the campaign externally for Measure A. And, you know, we haven't fully checked off that box. But I think it would be good to say, you know, we put $700 million to ELI. What are we doing for the rest of the continuum? Um, if we just keep focusing on what we don't have, well, we, would, we wish we had $1.4 billion for ELI, not $700 million. Yes, but we have a whole bunch of other areas on the continuum that need to be funded, and this is one of them. This, this, uh, f you know, first-time homebuyer program, and it's actually one that, if you play your investments correctly, in other words, if you collect these loans, you shouldn't. We or you, future board, should never have to go back to the taxpayers again and say we need money for a first-time home buyer program. That's one thing, folks, you took care of it in 2016. The money's coming in, we're investing it out. It comes in with interest, we're investing it out. We don't need to ask you taxpayers for any more money. And I, I just think that's a good thing. So um, for whenever the decision does come, you know, if it's within my tenure on the board, um, I think I'm gonna stick to my guns on how I feel about that. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Allenberg. Thank you. Um, Su Supervisor Cortesi, I'm, I'm gonna respectfully disagree with, with a good chunk of that, um, although not all. Um, to me, the Measure A piece that deals with the first time home buyers is almost a bonus, and the, the core of county responsibility is, for, is to the very most vulnerable community members which in my mind translates to using every available dollar once we have um, completed our obligation that, that we promised in the, in the bond to do the first time homeowners home is that is precisely the opposite, that the income from that should be used as long as there is a need for ELI and VLI housing and permanent supportive housing. That should be the county's priority. When one day, God willing, there's not a need to build additional housing, then, then absolutely use it for other things. The missing middle to me is more the, we're not the only ones, the only entity in the, in the world um, responsible for housing. To, to me, the, the missing middle is better served by city partnerships, the, for the um, working and, and middle class who still qualify for tax subsidies, that's the housing I believe that cities uh, should be building. Where I do agree with you in, in part is that the, the focus on Measure A and the focus from the, the county has been on permanent supportive housing and yes to the exclusion of any kind of um, temporary interim housing, sanctioned encampments, any other pieces. Uh, and I can hear housing advocates in my head saying, build housing, build housing, that's the only way to truly address this. Um, but you're right that, that it certainly is a crisis to have people on the street and people with no place to be until that permanent supportive housing is built. The question is how much can the county do? Is this a place where we can better support community-based organizations and others who are working on that immediate, short-term transitioning housing. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's an opportunity that we have not yet maximized. But really, if we have a core function here too, it's function here, it is to ensure that nobody is completely unhoused in our in our county and and to me 
that's the population that I want us to focus on, not suggesting that the others are not important, but that other entities can address those needs. I have a slightly different point of view, but I want to go. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, the, I think if you ask yourself what the highest and best use of the funds is, different board members will have different reactions. Fair enough. Um, there's no reason for board members to recall, but when Measure A came to our board uh, and I supported it, um, I supported it with the uh, observation at the time, I would have been perfectly happy for the full 950 million to be used for um, ELI, VLI, folks who were homeless, but ultimately there was a decision made in crafting the measure that uh, in order to bring uh, everybody along on the effort, that some portion of the funds would be used for workforce and or um, first time home buyer funding. That was just a practical decision that was made at the time. Maybe it was policy, maybe it was politics. Um, nothing wrong with either one of those being a consideration. That's what you have to do to bring everybody together to pass a measure. It was an extraordinary accomplishment. So for me, the reason I said funds derived over here, stay over here, and funds derived stayed over here, that's not about a policy judgment on where the funds could best be spent. That's about keeping faith with the voters, about saying this chunk of dough is for this purpose, this chunk of dough is for that purpose. Forgive my PowerPoint presentation here, Mr. Lee. Um, this chunk of dough is for this purpose, and you know what? If we grow some money over here, then we're going to sort of stay intellectually honest and true to what we said this chunk of dough was for and use those funds over here. But if we generate money over here, we're going to stay intellectually honest and true to what we told the voters. This chunk of dough is for these purposes over here. So for me, it's more about sort of keeping faith with the original allocation of funds. I understand that somebody else could come along and say, that's all well and good, but legally we can move the funds to another purpose, and if we think that's the better place to put it, we should put it there. That's just not where I am. I'm in the, we said this money was for this, we said that money was for that, let's use that money for that, and let's use this money for this. Um, that's, and that's not about um, the issues that Supervisor Ellenberg raised, which are about, look, here's where I think we ought to spend the money. It's more about sort of, here's what we told the voters, here's how I, I interpreted that at the time, and how I would make that manifest years later if and when we have some resources to be having this wonderful debate about. So the good news before I go back to Supervisor Chavez is we're not going to have to answer that question today as I understand it. <laughs> all, you're ask, all you're asking for is that we receive a report today, yes? Yes. Supervisor Chavez, back to you. Thank you. And you just watched Key do this. <laughs> Um, you know, I, here's what I would like to recommend. I think one of the challenges with the discussion is really having it, having this discussion, understanding exactly what resources we're talking about and what we think will be available. And, um, and just to, to and, and really, I think if we can have that discussion in a more fulsome way, I think that's going to be really helpful in terms of how we make sure that from, a, from all of our perspectives that we, um, that we're able to approach and address a problem. The thing key that I would like to recommend when you bring something back to us is that the bond is one, um, you know, source of funds. We've also used boomerang funds for housing, the CDGB funds. I, I think one of the challenges that you and Consuelo have is you, you can see all these missing, I mean, I'm sorry, all these moving parts as you're working on every single deal. And we're really voting on very specific line item, are we going to fund this uh, uh, or that, and you're able to look at it in a more, um, more um, comprehensive way. So what I would just suggest is really making sure that we have some estimates, even if we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, I think that's going to be very important. And, and a point to that is that even when we looked at the um, 50 million for first time home buyers, what at the time that we, that we um, took this to the voters, we didn't have a, um, a loan program attached to it. We didn't know exactly what that program was going to look like. I think it's a fair point to raise as to whether or not we would continually have money uh, in any single um, uh, section of that and, and whether or not the money that 
some part of the money that we have for first-time home buyer payments can go back to first-time home buyer and some of it to ELI or VLI housing. I just don't know that, and so I think it's really hard for us to talk about resources that we don't understand. So I, the, what I'd like to do is move the report, but with the request that we do some projecting with all of our sources of funds so that we can have a discussion with the board sometime in the spring so we can just kind of get our arms and our minds around what the future offers, if that's a, that would be my motion. So we have a motion by Chavez uh, and a second by Supervisor Wasserman, who also would like to speak to the motion. Thank you. I, uh Feel sorry for you, Key. <laughs> I, um, you're, you're there, still a small staff, dealing with huge amounts of money and people asking for it and going through all that stuff, and you got five people up here saying, well, how about this, and how about that, and how about this? And you're staying very, very composed. So I'm, you're uh, very, very classy. Bless you. Um, for my understanding, it kind of ties in with Supervisor Chavez just said there at the ending, was, for instance, when I was explaining to people what this $950 million was, and part of it was the $50 million first-time homebuyers, they asked me, well, what happens when they, you know, the, they go to sell their home and the loan's paid off? You know what? I said the money goes back into the system to be re reloaned again. It wasn't us, you know, pass this bond measure, we loan out money, three or four years later they sell the house, they pay us back, we put it into the general fund. That wasn't my understanding of, of how things were either. And so I'm, from the opinions I've heard thus far, and again, they're just superficial because we don't know what we're talking about until we have details. Um, the idea of keeping the program going, regenerating, reinvesting back into it so we can keep on going. And I hope ultimately it's not $950 million, you know, this county puts towards ELI and VLI and everything else. But it's it's so you know billion and a half dollars what whatever it is I don't know what the cost of money will be the next time you have to do a tranche I don't know what the costs of buildings to build or to buy will be if another recession will come or the boom will continue all, all those things are out of our control but I just wanted to say thank you for what you do and making sure that the money that we're spending is being spent the way the ballot measure said it would be spent. And, and getting that out there, and we're helping. Um, the single most frustrating thing to me about all of this is providing housing for 5,000 people over four years, and 5,000 more people became homeless. So it's, it's, it, it's a never ending. It's Supervisor Ellenberg's comment. You know, it, it's, it's not gonna end. I'm hoping that, that we can get it down, um, a number more representative perhaps of our population compared to other places where it's X percent of our population and not several X's. So I look forward to your uh, reporting back with ideas and options for, the, for this board to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll ask all members to please vote on the screen. All votes have been cast. We'll ask the clerk to please display the results. We have a vote of four to one. And uh, that is uh, four in favor, one against. The no vote is from Supervisor Cortese. And uh, we'll look to Yuki and say uh, good luck making sense out of that, okay? okay. We'll uh, try and see if we can find a consensus when you come back with some data. Thank you. Next item. And Madam Clerk, thank you. That takes us all the way to item number 42. We have county goals for Environmental Stewardship for Protection of Streams and Riparian Corridors. And as staff takes their place, uh, item 42A is simply to receive the report, colleagues, and item 42B is to approve the addition of goal number 12 develop educational programs and volunteer service opportunities that promote local stewardship of streams and riparian corridors and develop programs of ecologically compatible recreational use of streams and riparian corridors. Uh, we are gonna ask the clerk to put the voting panel up on the screen and then to hand me the card from somebody who would like to speak to this item. If there is somebody, there is not. So then we're gonna turn to the staff and say, 
Uh, you have a favorable motion from Supervisor Ellenberg uh, and a second from Supervisor Chavez. What would you like to know to close the deal? Go to it. We'd like to know to close the deal. Hi, Susan Gilbert Miller, Director of Sustainability I have with me from Department of Parks and Recreation. Don Rutcher, Director of Parks and Recreation. And Vanessa Marcadeus, uh, Clean Water Program Manager with SEPA, Consumer right. and Environmental Protection. Thank you. A lot of talent there displayed for us. Supervisor Allenberg, comments or questions? Uh, comments, please. Um, this was a motion that I originally uh, brought a while ago. I want to first thank the different organizations, both inside the county, who worked so diligently on this report back. Uh, our Parks and Rec Department, led by Don Rocha, and our Consumer and Environmental Protection Agency, led by uh, Joe Zintak did an enormous amount of work in coordination to craft this detailed final report. Additionally, they collaborated with our partners at Valley Water and with Richard McMurtry and Friends of Stephen Creek's Trail. Uh, this truly, truly was a team effort to produce good public policy. So to all of those involved, thank you. Uh, as I said during my referral discussion in May, California has recognized for decades the importance of protecting streams and riparian corridors for public uses. And by the county taking the steps reflected in this report today, we will be able to provide education and recreational uses for our residents to more fully enjoy these natural resources, which in turn, of course, would aid our overall goals of protection and conservation. And I hope to have my colleagues' support today. Let, let's ask all five members to please vote on their screens. That has now been done. We'll ask the clerk to display the results. And we'll send uh, this off with a 5-0 vote in support. Thank you very much for Thank being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that takes us to item 45. I'll jump in on this. Okay, we do have four speakers on the item as well, but uh, go right ahead, uh, Dr. Smith. Yes, I was hopeful that the board would put this item over until the 24th, primarily because uh, I spoke with uh, the author of SB5, uh, Jim Bell, on Friday after the agenda had been posted and all the transmittal had been done. And uh, he gave me some insight into his bill and is thinking about the bill and I was hopeful to be able to modify the uh, transmittal and come back on the 24th. However, if the board uh, wants to move ahead on it, we're here to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, um, I think this item was originally brought to us by Supervisor Cortese, was it not? Right, uh, it's something to do with us yeah. discussing it today. Um, I think it's a it's a ledge file coming from the county executive side of things, but we've been certainly encouraging it along. Um, I, the timing, as I understand it, from uh, hearing from Senator Bell's staff, myself, and I know I did have a chance to talk to the county executive about this last week, um, is such that I feel like we need to take a position on this. Um, now, and I'm uh, prepared to move a support position. I do think dialogue should continue. There's obviously been some already, and County Executive was just talking about that. I believe County Council has participated either directly or indirectly in some past discussions, um, as obviously has our um, legislative manager. But um, there's, there's several, I mean, just kind of getting down to brass tacks, if you will, um, the, there's certainly details that can continue to be discussed here which might benefit the county more or, or less, depending on um, you know, whether there are any, any additional amendments. The bill has been amended a lot. Um, but you know, on package page 880, one of the most significant statements, I think, in the whole report and the whole analysis from county council is there is no direct fiscal impact to the county from this bill. Um, we have, if you look at the, at the back of the transmittal on, under support and opposition, um, not that I always agree with CSAC um, or the League of Cities, and I know this bill could be viewed as perhaps 
being leaning a little more towards cities than counties, but the county of Los Angeles, uh, and then a, a number of, of our partners um, in terms of uh, you know the affordable housing and, and the homelessness work that we were just talking about in the last item um, are behind the bill. So I, I'm all for seeing you know a continuing dialogue with basically you know the senator who represents this county major significant uh, legislator in our own delegation who's um, you know trying to you know to, to, to go through the remainder of the legislative process saying that he has his own home county's support on a bill that he's worked very very hard to uh, to, to um, try to meet us halfway on I guess is one way to put it in terms of amendments and obviously again I appreciate the county executive uh, reaching out to him, but I think the report back is there's a continuing willingness to to talk um, Jonathan Perez, I don't know if he's here today, but from Senator Bill's office approached me recently um, and Indicated that the, the the timing is such that waiting until the 24th um, could be detrimental uh, to uh, Senator Bill and the other authors in terms of trying to continue to to move this bill along um, I understand there's opponents too, um, and some of the opponents are are people who I listen to very carefully. Um, probably concerns about ERAF funds uh, being used and whether they'll be fully backfilled, as the bill says. I'm sure there's, um, you know, something for everyone to be concerned about here. The one thing I don't want to, again, I'm, I'm hoping to persuade us as a Board of Supervisors to the extent it's necessary is, is to not be so concerned about the fact that you know 50% of the, of, the, of the proceeds that would be identified um, the program funds for this bill would be used to construct affordable housing and, and not more not hundred percent or you know maybe the way this is really written it's almost as we're saying um, you know, it's it's too bad that parks, you know, transportation improvements and traffic mitigation um, can be paid for with the bill as well with these funds. And the, in real life, um, I think the problem of entitling housing, even housing that even permanent supportive housing, sort of the garden style apartment um, apartments that we're doing under the Measure A program require infrastructure they require off-site improvements they require on-site improvements sometimes municipalities are, are requiring um, park space to be to be dedicated or acquired so you know I I think there's there's we could debate all day long what whether there's a higher set of priorities that could be laid out in the bill um, but I do think there's something to be said for the fact that um, you know our senator former county supervisor on this board for 12 years authored a bill that is trying to pick up a great deal of need in an area right now infrastructure and housing where it's pretty hard to make a mistake and I, I do want to give credit uh, to the good folks in Portland I visited you know 15 years ago who were leading the nation in terms of transportation improvements and um, felt they were facing a crisis in terms of the need for transportation infrastructure and when asked what their philosophy was they said it's pretty hard to make a mistake right now in terms of, of funding investment in this particular area so if I thought the bill had something fatal in it for us or was going to cost us money or was going to significantly create issues or problems for us um, you know I suppose I wouldn't be able to give uh, Senator Bill and McGuire and the others the benefit of the doubt um, but I think they've taken a good stab at stepping forward and trying to address another piece of this housing crisis right now and I, I frankly having served on the cost of steering committee um, this the language in here is you know certainly not anywhere near as bold as as, as some of the efforts that came out of our own region you know, in terms of request, requesting uh, uh, this kind of work to be done. It's actually a little bit mild in that regard. So um, that's me. I'd like to move the item um, at some point, President Simidian, and see if we have three votes to 
uh, to take a support position, and, and if we don't, then um, we'll see where it goes from there. Sure. We're going to go ahead and put the voting panel up on our screen so that Supervisor Cortese can make the motion, and then there's a uh, Supervisor Cortese, if you want to lean forward and make that motion. I'm sorry. And then uh, there's a second from uh, Supervisor Chavez, and I've got a, another approach I'd like to recommend in a minute, but I want to hear from members of the public. Um, colleagues, before I come back to you all, could we go to members of the public? And I'm going to do something that I uh, never do, which is I'm going to uh, make a conscious decision to take one card and put it at the back of the four, and that's from Jonathan Perez, who is from Supervisor Bell's office, because I want to give you the last word after you've heard from speakers, and I also want you at the microphone, so if we have any questions about the legislation, you'll be there. So with that understanding, usually the clerk just hands them to me and I take them as they come. but. Uh, that means that uh, we go to uh, Oscar Castro, and then Alexander, and then Von Villaverde. And then that fourth and final card will be for Mr. Perez. Come on up. Good afternoon, President Smitty and members of the board. My name is Oscar Castro, policy associate with Silicon Valley at Home. Um, we write today, uh, we comment today on behalf of our membership in support of SB5, uh, which will establish affordable housing community investment program to provide additional funding for affordable housing at the local level. Between 2020 and 2029, SB5 is estimated to generate up to $3 billion for housing at the local level. After 2029, SB5 is estimated to raise $2 billion annually for up to 30 years when fully implemented. The revenues raised through SB5 are desperately needed as local governments struggle to identify and secure additional financing resources to develop housing in their jurisdictions. SB5 will assist local governments by providing alternative revenue streams, investment plans, finance with ERAF, property tax, and must use 50% of the revenue for the construction of affordable housing and further prioritize housing for extremely low and very low income households. We appreciate your leadership and your willingness to bring forward your solutions, our housing and affordability crisis, and we urge the board to support uh, SB5. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alexander, you were the next speaker. Not present. Von Villaverde, you are the next speaker. Good afternoon, President Samidian, members of the board. Again, my name is Von Villaverde, and I'm uh, coming from Working Partnerships USA. On behalf of Working Partnerships, I encourage the board to support SB5. We believe this bill not only offers a much needed tool to address California's housing affordability crisis, among other benefits, it has the potential to further the state's sustainability and economic development goals through supporting local efforts to promote infill and transit-oriented development and create family-sustaining jobs. The dissolution of California's redevelopment agencies left the resource gap that has yet to be adequately addressed. Here in Silicon Valley, redevelopment helped to build thousands of units of affordable housing, and now the loss of these resources has coincided with a housing crisis forcing far too many working families to make difficult decisions, whether to leave their communities, live in their vehicles, or cram into unhealthy, overcrowded housing situations. SB5 would provide much needed resources for workforce and affordable housing, uh, transit-oriented development, neighborhood revitalization, and other necessarily pub necessary public improvements. By requiring that 50% of funds be used to construct workforce and affordable housing, it places due emphasis on alleviating our state's housing crunch. SB5's urgency cannot be overstated. As our communities confront a housing affordability crisis and each day more and more working families struggle to make ends meet, the question becomes whether California can afford not to adopt this measure. We encourage, uh, the Sen uh, we encourage you to support SB5. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, Mr. Perez, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of Senator Jim Bell requesting the county consider supporting Senate Bill 5. SB 5 is an opportunity for the state to create partnerships with local governments in tackling our statewide housing crisis. Without impacting county or education dollars, SB 5 complements our investments in affordable housing, including local measure A and last November's propositions 1 and 2. Additional legislation is working to document a database of sites available for development. 
SB5 provides investments for the construction of affordable housing and community development around public transportation and infill development. The bill prioritizes affordable housing with depth of affordability at very low, low and moderate income families. The bill has a requirement that 50% of funds be allocated for housing at minimum and the most competitive applications for SB5 dollars will be those with 100% housing applications. SB5 benefits from the support of over 200 organizations and coalitions who want to see these partnerships go into effect. You have received letters from at least 22 of our local supporters, all urging for your support of this important affordable housing investment bill. These supporters include SVLG, First Community Housing, SPUR, Bill Wilson Center, Pico, California, South Bay Labor Council, SV at Home, and Siren, among others. We respectfully request your, bo your board vote for supporting Senate Bill 5. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we step away, Mr. Perez, my understanding is that CTA remains opposed, California Teachers Association, and that the California School Boards Association remains opposed unless amended. Is that the current state of affairs? I would have to check with the Capitol Office, but I believe there were some of those positions maintained. Thank you very much. Other comments or questions for Mr. Perez before he steps away from the microphone? Mr. Wasserman, and we understand that you're, you know, here on the fly and that you may not have answers to all the questions that we have today, but thank you for being here. And I would mention one last thing. I believe the deadline that was in reference was the legislative session deadline ending this Friday. Right. Thank I you. Thank you. A question for you, please. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Through the chair. Supervisor Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Um, when RDA came along and was ongoing, I was with the town of Los Gatos. The cities benefited. The counties really didn't. Then in Sacramento, they changed and they dissolved RDA. Um, the cities were hurt and the counties benefited kind of went back to what it was 25, 30 years ago. And the information I have about this particular item is the potential cost to the counties. I'm a county supervisor now. I'm not a city councilman or a mayor. And so my priority are, is the counties. And since RDA was dissolved and ERAF and all that, the money is now being funneled to the county, we've been using those for good purposes. This bill says we want to divert, change things a little bit, but on the first, the bottom paragraph on the first page of the staff report, it says requires the state general fund to backfill school entities. I'm a big proponent of the schools and very concerned about the effect this is going to have on schools for the associated loss of property tax revenues. And a lot of our income is based on property tax revenues. And right now, it's, the system's working right now for the county. It was a hard transition from discontinuing the RDA in my second or third year here, six or seven years ago, but we've worked through that in the sale of properties. And what's happening now is good for the counties. So I'm kind of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's number one. And number two, my concern is relying on the state in the future to backfill something. So I, I, I have concerns with that for those two reasons. And I understand you're not the senator and, and you're assigned for this. Um, but do you have any comments about those two concerns of mine? Sure, sure. Uh, so I do have some fact sheets handy as well. If those will be helpful. I can share those on the side if needed. But uh, I got Could good you? news. There is no impact to counties. I believe in the report itself from your county staff, it does verify that as well as there is no impact to education dollars. This isn't tax increment. It's not redevelopment as we've known it. It is a use of the structures from redevelopment agencies, but utilizing general fund dollars. And it's an immediate backfill that the legislative analyst office report from March, which uh, should have been shared with the board as well, but it validates that it's an immediate backfill that prevents any schools from having a financial impact. 
Okay, I look forward to hearing the comments from my fellow supervisors because information that I have from our staff administration is that there is the potential for financial loss to the county up to $50 million a year. And I have to get to the bottom of that. Ms. Perez, if you do have fact sheet, which I, I think I heard and I remember them well, uh, why don't you uh, simply hand uh, them to the clerk and we'll ask her to make sure that we get them to every member of the board as we deliberate on this topic. And um, Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, I don't have a question. Uh, just Perez, comments. thank you very much. Just take a seat. We'll call you back up again if we need you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. I, I really have spent a, a, a lot of time um, looking at this bill and, and talking with uh, probably a dozen um, experts in different areas. Business and labor both support this, which is an exciting and unusual thing. Um, and the housing community supports the bill. Um, and I'm certainly aware of and appreciative of Senator Bell's tremendous and successful advocacy for our county for many, many years. Uh, education community opposes this bill as uh, Senator, as sorry, <laughs> Supervisor Simidian um, mentioned CTA, CSBA and other education groups. So what I'm feeling is that we are pitting children against housing. And I will, I will always advocate on behalf of kids. And this bill does purport uh, to protect the ERAF funds and to backfill, but there's no absolute required mandate that they do so. Um, and of course, when, if, if the backfilling is done, it's potentially money coming away from dollars that could have been spent on county services and programs. California still is in the lower 50% of per pupil uh, funding. And w with all due respect to the many, many supporters um, whose, whose opinions I, I really value greatly, I can't, I can't support a measure that has even the potential to reduce funds that otherwise go uh, towards children's education. So that's where I'm standing on this today. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Um, a couple things that I just wanted to acknowledge. One is that, you know, I think you raise a good point, Susan, about, you know, business and labor, dogs and cats. That's, that's pretty fabulous. Um, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, there are, I, I think there are very few leaders in the state um, that have been guardians for um, both education and poor people and transportation as as Jim. And the reason I say that is is that when you look at the report that we have from the legislative analyst's office, on the third page of it, it, it gives a lot of outline about possible impacts. I mean, uh, not possible impacts, but directly talking about the schools, but the very last um, section of it says, under SB 5, the state would be required to rebench for e um, ERAF reductions authorized by the Affordable Housing and Community Development Investment Program. This requirement means the state effectively would be covering the cost of the program through additional general fund spending rather than a reduction in school funding. And, the, and, and I hear what you're saying because you want an expansion of school funding, which I, I don't disagree. But here's what our dilemma is, and this is what I worry about being at the county. When I was in the city of San Jose, the idea of anybody taking redevelopment dollars was so appalling to me because we were using it, I think, really wisely to build housing. But I didn't really fully understand the impacts to the county, and I didn't fully understand the impacts to the schools. But my fear is that there is a bursting need for local government to have resources to continue to solve local problems like construction. And that if we don't look for bills like this, that really looks to hold harmless counties and schools, that's really what Jim's trying to do here, then we're going to shut off um, a valve, frankly, for an opportunity for resources. And I don't want a redirection of our local property taxes. And so that's the reason that I'm um, supporting this bill, because really the other risk is every, everybody, everybody who's looking at the state as a pie has a risk of losing something. 
that all being said, I want to give as much flexibility at a local level for us to make decisions and, and our property taxes, at least in our county, you know, we're doing really good things. We're not only building housing, and this is the point I raised to everybody who wants to redirect our funding, but we're gonna be spending 350 million a year to keep people housed. And any redirection of our local dollars is gonna be devastating. But here's the problem. We're one of the only counties in the state that are doing this. So when you look at, you know, other, other counties sort of defending their general funds, they're spending much more of it on roads than we are. We're spending so much of our, our property tax on mental health services, school-linked services, all of that. Um, our flexible funding we are putting into services, not into um, road repair, which, frankly, I see a lot of other counties doing it. And you're on CSAC, so you know more than I do about what some of those priorities are. So in any case, I, I'm going to support this. I, I really um, appreciate, and I just want to say this to you, I really appreciate um, Jim trying to be flexible and a, and a statewide peacemaker in terms of how we share resources. So thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, um, I'm in a, uh, here's what I'm going to say. I, I appreciate the effort. I have been in uh, Senator Bell's shoes trying to get to yes uh, with a mix of uh, interested stakeholders. It's a difficult task. I applaud him for the effort and I applaud him for his commitment to um, the effort to find f funding for housing. That being said, I can't get to yes today. That being said, I don't want to rain on the parade. Uh, I don't want to, I certainly don't want to cast a no vote that would be misconstrued as a lack of support for housing or opposition to the bill, which is not a position I want our board to take. My office has been in touch with Supervisor Bell's office as well, and it's my understanding that this, that this, the, excuse me, Senator Bell's office uh, as well, and that it's my understanding Senator Bell's office, while they would obviously prefer a support position, would prefer a um, simply not taking a position at all to a neutral position uh, on the matter. At least that's the information we've got from, uh, from our conversations. Here's my take. Um, we're talking about redirecting education funds. That's why it's called ERAF, the Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund. Um, that is always a chancy proposition. Yes, the bill calls for uh, replenishing those funds, but that presumes that there will always be sufficient funds to replenish them, which I assume is what's made the folks at both the California Teachers Association and the California School Boards Association anxious. Our staff has a, highlighted a somewhat different concern that Supervisor Wasserman referenced, and that's the concern that by definition, if you take $200 million from one part of the budget and use it for uh, this new expenditure purpose, i.e. the backfill, then that's $200 million that's not available uh, for other programs and services that our county funds and supports. True enough. And here's the part that for me is particularly disconcerting over the longer term. If I read this right, Ms. Christian, please correct me if I'm wrong or turn to somebody else. I think we're looking at $200 million a year for five years and then up to $250 million in the subsequent five years. And I think that's the, the bill. I'm looking at Mr. Perez to see if he'll nod, even if he won't give me a, a smile as well, given where I'm going. So, you know, here's the question. We keep talking about that inevitable recession. What happens when that inevitable recession arrives? The answer is that the money that is currently committed to backfill the ERAF money may very well not be there. In fact, we may be looking at billions or tens of billions of dollars worth of cuts. That's an argument that, you know, I've heard from both colleagues and from staff over the years. I was in Sacramento when we had to cut $28 billion in a single year. And just stuff that we think of as near and dear and absolutely, absolutely essential gets hacked because it has to. And this $200 million, if it is already committed to ERAF, and if local jurisdictions have already been uh, accustomed to receiving their 200 billion, excuse me, two billion, 200 million a year, 250 million a year, if they, then if and when that hard time comes, that means that things that we hold near and dear here are gonna suddenly be lost. So I think rather than take an opposed position, which I definitely do not want to do, or even take a neutral position, I'd like to see if there is um, a substitute motion that one of my colleagues would like to offer to simply take no position on the item. And if we have three votes to take no position, we'll take no position. It will have been an interesting conversation, and uh, we'll see how it plays out in Sacramento without our weighing in. Is there such a motion? 
If not, then um, Supervisor, I'm sorry. Some, somebody just say out loud, I'd like to move a substitute motion, take no position, if somebody's willing to do that. Okay, I have a substitute motion from Ms. Ellenberg. Somebody take no position. A second from Supervisor Wasserman. Madam Clerk, if the motion passes, then we will simply say we take no position. If the motion fails, then we will go ahead and vote on the measure before us on the screen. All clear? Good. All those in favor of the substitute motion, which is to simply take no position, please say aye and raise your right hand. Aye. One, two, three. Those opposed, please say nay and raise your right hand or left hand as you choose. All right. No. Okay. By a vote of three to two, the substitute motion prevails, and we will simply take no position on the item. All of you who came to speak today, including Mr. Perez, thank you very much. And I can only speak for myself, but please do convey my thanks to Supervisor Bell, who um, is Senator Bell now, excuse me, um, who is uh, clearly trying to find a path uh, to a good result, even if we didn't feel we were comfortable enough to get there on a support position. Don't want that to be misunderstood. All right, thank you. Madam Clerk, what's left? 48. Item 48, in-car video recording system policy and agreement. Colleagues, I'm going to ask for the voting panel to be displayed because I'm going to tip my hand a little bit here and uh, tell you what my motion is right up front. And my motion is to refer this item to the Public Safety and Justice Committee. And um, uh, I'll see if I can get a second uh, to that effect uh, before, before proceeding. And if not, I'll proceed without the second. Can I get a second on that motion? Thank you. Um, happy to let staff present as much as it would like to present, but here's, here's the issue. Um, there are some significant facial recognition issues associated with the technology, notwithstanding the staff report and the, um, the policy. So the proposed dash cam policy, and I'm looking at uh, page one of four from April, but also packet page 1062, says the dash cam system shall not be integrated with facial recognition technology but then it goes on to say, nothing in this dash cam system surveillance use policy shall preclude the use of static images obtained from the dash cam video with facial recognition software in compliance with the Sheriff's Office surveillance use policy for facial recognition software. So there is the expectation that we're gonna take static images, use them with facial recognition software to identify folks. Please know I get what the law enforcement benefit of that is. You don't need to make the case with me, but it, it does raise some uh, significant issues, and um, I'm guessing that some of my colleagues, but not all, have been aware of the fact that within the last half dozen months to a year, we've had a series of high-profile stories about um, the imperfections of facial recognition technology, at least uh, thus far in its evolution, including the misidentification of members of Congress and our state legislature as matches with mugshots. Uh, the tendency, and I'm looking at Mr. Shapiro to correct me if I get my facts wrong, but the tendency for there to be a uh, bias with respect both to women and people of color in terms of mismatches or uh, false identifications. Uh, and then looking at the data retention issue, um, which is item number six, page two of four, packet page 1063, data downloaded onto a disk or an electronic storage device shall be maintained and retained in accordance with applicable state or federal evidentiary laws and sheriff's office policy. And I would just say, well, but the whole point is this is the policy, so it, I, we need to know there um, what, the, uh, what the plan is with respect to retention. And then jumping to item number eight, third party data sharing, the third bullet, page three of four, page, packet page 1064, talks about sharing shall be limited to 
other law enforcement agencies as part of a specific criminal or administrative investigation. And the reason I mention that is because understanding that that's what happens is that people share information. Even if we had some policies on the books and even if we were comfortable with the fact that our department here in the county was gonna be mindful of the imperfections of facial recognition software, um, there's no guarantee when we hand that information off to any other law enforcement agency in the country that they are mindful. I think you all get that the technology is imperfect and that a match isn't really a match. A match is the basis for further investigation. But I'm not sure that every other law enforcement agency in the country would be that cautionary in its approach. And the other thing I've learned from listening to you all over the years in law enforcement is every, inter and every interaction between a law enforcement official and a member of the public is a potentially risky interaction. So even if say, folks say, well, we'll do further investigation, we'll talk to people, we'll investigate, you know, as we saw tragically recently in Texas, you know, a single stop can suddenly turn deadly. So I wanna make sure that if we're gonna use this imperfect technology to get a good result, which I think is possible, that we have some policies and procedures in place um, that, um, carefully curtail its use and eliminate to the greatest degree possible the potential for misuse. So that's why I made the motion. Um, would anybody like to get a word in edgewise now uh, and offer comments uh, and or ask uh, further questions of us? I don't see any lights on up here. Nope, okay. I really do think this, I mean, uh, I'm guessing my colleagues know that the Board of Supervisors up in San Francisco took a, simply a flat out prohibition on facial recognition in a recent vote because of these civil liberties concerns uh, was uh, if not unanimous, a near unanimous vote, maybe eight to one, something like that. Uh, I'm not really sure where I think we'll end up on this or should. If I had an opinion that was clear at this point, I would certainly share it with you. I'm not reluctant about doing that as you know, but I do think we need to um, sort of track this one down a little bit more and that's why I made the motion. Can we ask all five members to please vote on the screen? So referral to public safety and justice. This is a, let Susan and Mike deal with it. Uh, referral is what this is, okay, thank you. And all five votes have been cast. We'll ask the clerk to display the results and indicate that the motion carries five to zero. Look forward to working with you. Thank you for being here today. Madam Clerk, where are we? We've completed the agenda. Thank you. The, my uh, notes indicate that we have no other items on today's agenda. Correct. Then without objection and hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much.